wind has died, so you might as well take the chance to get out, you know? Yep, it was supposed to be, and I'm glad to hear it is. I'll bet. I feel for you. Wait, wait. Hang on, I'm, 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 uh, I'm getting, I, I think I got it back. I'm sorry, man. I love you. Could everyone take their seats so we can get started, please? I'd like to call to order the meeting of Malibu City Council, adjourned from its regular time of 6.30. This is the October 28th, 2019 meeting. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Here. Mayor Fair? Here. You have a quorum. Graham Clifford, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. May we have a roll call vote for approval? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. 
Okay. <coughs> we'll, we will now have a staff update on disaster response and recovery. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm just gonna give you a brief update on some of the activities we've been engaged in the last two weeks as well as today. Um, or the last couple of weeks, as I'm sure you're aware of, we've had a number of public safety power shutoffs, uh, notifications from Edison, so we were doing our messaging and pre-deploying equipment to get it staged to be ready for that. We also were very busy monitoring local fires, the Tick Fire, Saddle Ridge Fire, Calabasas Fire, uh, and even paying attention to the fire up north, because as we know, as more fires burn, uh, you have, you know, resources are drawn down, so staying aware of that aspect of the whole uh, situation. Uh, we also drafted an EOC action plan so that we would be ready to go. Uh, we put city staff were uh, placed on call during <coughs> hours. Um, at this point, I'm going to have Jerry kind of fill you in because he was out in the field today monitoring the fires. Yeah, good afternoon, Council. Uh, yeah, on the Getty fire, we were not immediately notified of that incident, but when we did get notified early this morning, uh, we did start monitoring. It never did pose a direct threat to the city of Malibu, but of course it is an area of concern uh, and where it was located in relation to the winds um, that we've been experiencing. So the latest update from LA Fire Department on that is uh, 618 acres. Um, it's not really a dynamic incident anymore, um, but it is obviously still of concern as they continue to uh, work out hot spots and, and control that incident, uh, and especially uh, in regards to the projected winds that we're gonna have in the next few days. So um, there were over 100,000 structures in the affected area. Uh, eight structures were destroyed and five have been damaged. So while we were monitoring that, uh, the oak fire cropped up in Calabasas, so I was able to make it over there. Um, aggressive fire attack on that, uh, as well as uh, the good fortune of the super scoopers just having gotten released from the Getty incident, as well as immediately releasing LA County uh, aircraft helicopters from the Getty incident. They were able to make a quick attack on that and held that under 10 acres, so, so that was good. So we've just been monitoring all that, keeping an eye on it, and trying to provide uh, uh, up to the minute information to city staff so they could react accordingly. Any questions? Okay, so um, a lot of what we were doing was uh, collecting information, pushing it out to the community. Uh, we did one Everbridge call to the eastern end of Malibu, all the way to Malibu Canyon Road, just to get people on alert to the situation, start be prepared for potential evacuations. We also did six uh, alerts via our city website, emergency alert and traffic advisories, nine Nixel alerts, and five news flashes. We opened uh, the City Hall EOC at nine o'clock this morning, and then began coordinating with County Office of Emergency Management and have participated in a couple of conference calls with them to stay on top of uh, that situation. We also uh, were in contact with Los, uh, the Sheriff's Department and requested additional staffing there, so they staffed three extra squads at Lost Tail Sheriff Station. In uh, preparation for possible power outages and possible evacuations, we made sure to get the changeable message signs were pre-positioned on PCH, coordinating with CHP, LASD, LA County Fire, Caltrans, beaches and harbors, just trying to you know um, get everybody on board uh, so that we're all on the same page if we had to trigger some evacuations. Uh, we participated in some conference calls with uh, County Fire, they've had two of them today, in fact, one of them just ended. It was a quick one, not a lot of new information. Uh, we staged city vehicles with megaphones and um, our magnets, this is city emergency response, just having them ready to go from city hall if we had to send staff out to assist with evacuations. We also staged emergency generators to be used as signals in case we lost power. 
We also, in preparation for having to send messages for evacuations, we pre-drafted some evacuation uh, messages, so we can draft those as templates ready to go. We just put in the final details as it comes. And then we also collected data for those neighborhood populations for each of those, because we broke it up into four sections to kind of do a phased approach. And so uh, our planning staff put together data on the number of people so we'd have a general idea of how many people would be spilling onto PCH potentially. Uh, we uh, contacted Zuma Beach and confirmed that we could use the parking lot as a safe refuge area and a place for large animal staging. We staged our information boards. We have one at Bluffs Park and we have a couple in our city car range to deploy wherever we're gonna need it. Although we already have an agreement with Zuma to place one at the entrance to Zuma Beach if we need that, which would be probably more in the, the event of a, a power shut off on Western Malibu, because that's where most of our uh, PSPS uh, watches have been in Western Malibu. So we're ready to deploy out there. Um, and as you probably already know, we have a, a Verizon mobile cell tower staged here at City Hall, ready to de be deployed as well. The uh, area of concern really is Wednesday. Uh, they're very concerned about this wind event. Uh, they're using language as a record breaking wind speeds possibly. Um, so we are really gearing up for that. And actually a lot of today was focused around that because while we didn't think this fire was gonna make it to Malibu, when these winds come on Wednesday, it could reignite hot spots and get it going again and we can have other fires. But Wednesday's a big area of concern. We really need to encourage everybody who's uh, throughout Malibu to just be really vigilant, pay attention to the news, if you're uh, vulnerable with large animals or may have difficulty uh, evacuating, you may want to consider staying in a safer location through that wind event. We currently only have one circuit still on the watch list. That's the Galahad circuit down in Western Malibu, but that is very dynamic. That could change. So we are in constant contact with Edison and we'll alert people to that as it changes. Um, staff is ready to uh, respond. The EOC is still open. We're going to keep it ready to go through Wednesday, um, crossing our fingers, well, actually through Thursday, but Wednesday's the real critical day is what they're saying right now. Um, for everyone, in terms of power outages, remember, keep your gates open, park cars outside. Make sure if you have an electric garage door opener, consider leaving your garage door open so you don't have to worry about your car being stuck inside. Keep flashlights and batteries nearby, monitor the news, and sign up for city alerts, and keep your gas tank full of gas. If you haven't fueled up, I would do it soon. And again, as we always say, sign up for disaster notifications, malibucity.org slash alerts, or malibucity.org slash disaster notifications, and uh, also calling the city hotline anytime is another source of information. Thank you, Susan and Jerry. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'd like to give you a quick update as to where we are with the fire rebuild process. Currently, we have looked at four, 57 applications, and these are like-for-like -like rebuilds. Uh, these are folks either putting back what they had or making the home smaller. Uh, that tends to be a popular option. There's also been uh, 99 applications where folks are doing like for like and adding maybe up to 10% in terms of height or square footage. It doesn't necessarily mean that the house itself is getting bigger. And there has only been 12 applications so far submitted where someone is doing a major change uh, to the home. Uh, this could be either a relocation of the home on the site or an addition greater than 10%, and this could still be administrative, but in some cases, they are going to be applying for coastal development permits, which brings them in front of our planning commission. To date, we've approved 168 primary residences, 25 second units or accessory dwelling units, and an additional 93 accessory structures. Those could be sheds, uh, as well as uh, pools, or even uh, fencing uh, type structures or trellises. 
staff has continued to implement the fee waiver program as approved by the city council. To date, we've issued close to a total, or waived, I should say, close to $950,000 worth of fees. These are both the planning review fees and also the fees that would be charged during building and safety. And once, uh, just to, to reiterate, uh, we are waiving fees, though, for persons who were the owners at the time of the fire who occupied the home. Good evening, City Council. Um, build, as the building and safety uh, numbers for primary residents, we have approved 31, actually 32, I just approved one this morning. Um, and then we have 60 projects under uh, plan check review. That means they have corrections. And on this number, we are calling every applicant to offer an over-the-counter review for the architectural, structural, and grading portion of it in order to try to expedite it. We have 78 uh, that are preparing to submit to building and safety, but we still have those 300 pending submittals that we need to reach out to. So the next, step, the next steps uh, that we will be doing as a building and safety is communicating with each one of the homeowners assuring about the services that we're providing and letting them know that we're ready. Also, we wanna make sure that all the reconstruction guidelines and the policies and any code updates are clear to the public, but also to the design professionals. The next step also will be to partner with uh, local design professionals that are doing multiple projects. Uh, I will be meeting with them on one-on-one -on -one basis, going over the process, um, trying to facilitate uh, uh, responding or answering questions that they might have and make it clear. Um, out of the 60 projects that are under plan check, we also have received the first multifamily project, which includes 12 apartment units, which is the Malibu Gardens. And we have issued 36 um, repairs for single family residents. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to go back on the agenda. I apologize for skipping over the posting of the agenda. Kelsey, could you give us that, please? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 17th, 2019. Thank you. Moving ahead to communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the City Council has subject matter jurisdiction. I have speaker cards. Would the following people please come up close to the front so that we don't lose time in between speakers. The first is Ted Vale, followed by Scott Dietrich, followed by Annie Ellis, and then Nicole McGinley, Lance Simmons, and again, Scott Dietrich on 2B. Thank you. Hi, Ted Vale, a 45-year resident of Big Rock. Uh, I'm uh, wearing a shirt, no more fires. There will be more fires, but hopefully Malibu will be able to prevent them from burning out the other areas of Malibu that haven't already burned out. Uh, it, I, it noted to me that <clears throat> yesterday, a man flies into town from the Midwest, rents a car, and comes to our area and starts 13 fires. Uh, he uh, had a rental car, somebody saw him do it. He went to the LAX, he's now in jail. Uh, I hope we can do something to prevent uh, this from happening in the future. I'd like the council to take some position saying, maybe issuing hunting license against anybody who is caught uh, starting a fire in Malibu. Another thing I suggest is that uh, the next fire be named the Joe Edmonston, Edmonston fire because of his wonderful position regarding campgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Scott Dietrich, followed by Annie Ellis, Nicole McGinley. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Fair and Council. Um, several months ago, I came before the council and you approved sending then Mayor Wagner to uh, Sacramento uh, to speak 
uh, along with uh, California strategies to speak with Commissioner Insurance Commissioner Laura. I guess, as Reva has told me, the, the commissioner has some personal issues, but that doesn't really help us in the middle of fire season because the whole purpose of that meeting was to try to craft something where we could incentivize homeowners through their insurance, lower rates on their insurance, especially now that California Fair Plan is going to be raised to $3 million, but uh, to incentivize those to get the homeowner to have an inspection that uh, Jerry Vandermeulen will do free um, and, and to try to see if, if we can change the paradigm. We know that we can limit the houses that burn in these wildfires to between 50 and 85% of what's happening now. So that meeting you all approved. Um, I know I've spoken to Mayor ex-Mayor Wagner and he's willing to go. So let's send him and let's get a report from California Strategies to try to find out what they are doing in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Annie Ellis, followed by Nicole McGinley. Uh, our last speaker on item 2A is Craig Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do a brief statement. We wanted to, first of all, um, last Sunday we put on the Trankus Riders and Ropers Shrimp Show, which is a horse show for kids 12 and under that we started over 40 years ago. We just want to thank the um, Malibu Parks and Rec for, they gave us, uh, everything got burned out up there. We lost everything um, that TRR has gotten over the years. So um, like the PA system and everything, we really want to thank them for um, getting that together for us. But what we were shocked to see is that uh, the Malibu Park, um, uh, most of the personal properties up there, if you drive up there, have cleared their brush around their properties. Um, but all the properties surrounding the Malibu Equestrian Park that goes over the hill and butts up to Malibu High School is six to 10 feet tall of dry brush. I was shocked. I was like, it's over my head. All you can see is dry brush all around there. So um, I do know that the property is owned by the Santa Monica School District and leased by the city of Malibu. And um, whatever it says in the lease agreement, I would think that the city would take responsibility to clear that as soon as possible. Um, and lastly, maybe in the future, Malibu wants to um, do like all our um, our neighboring communities do, Agura, Westlake, uh, Thousand Oaks, they all hire the goats. Bring the goats out when it's all green and they will clear that brush for you like nobody's business. So let's get on that next year, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Annie. Next up is Nicole McGinley, followed by Craig Hill. Please be ready up front. Thank you. Hi, I just came. Um, I found out some unfortunate news about recycling that I wanted to share. Uh, I called Waste Management to verify this and found out that it is, in fact, happening. That anything that is being recycled that is in a plastic bag that is not clear will be thrown away. And so, unfortunately, those of us, and I just, you know, I'm a Point Doom resident, and everybody's got their recycling out, but those of us that collect recycling in kitchen bags, or even, they don't have them nowadays in Malibu, thankfully, but plastic bags of any sort that are not see-through, that will go straight to the trash. So I called um, Shay in the environmental department here, and I was really happy to hear of all the programs that she has coming up for 2020. But um, I felt with the holidays coming up, my hope is, is that as a city could get some sort of information out to the public about this. Um, when I asked waste management how they were informing people, they said that they're telling the cities and then it's the city's responsibility to get that information out. I know most of Malibu is very conscientious and wants to do the right thing with recycling and putting uh, materials in a reusable fashion, 
And unfortunately, uh, hearing this news, it just broke my heart because I know there's so many people that do that. Um, secondly, I came to you guys about a year and a half ago and hoping that we could start to uh, get some sort of program together for recycling of cardboard. And again, I had spoken with waste management about this and they said that it's up to the city to request brown bins for residents. And I just think that in today's day with how most people are shopping online and that so much is getting shipped, that it would be really helpful for Malibu to think about getting brown bins for the population or having bins here on city property, um, uh, you know, in town hall, somewhere where people can bring their cardboard recycling because right now it's not being dealt with in a way that it could be if it was in brown bins. So my appeal is just to number one, get information out about what's happening with recycling right now. And number two is just to hope further that mission of getting um, cardboard recycling in Malibu, um, in our residential bins. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Next up is Craig Hill, followed by Lance Simmons, and then Scott Dietrich. Good afternoon, council members. Two quick things about the Getty fire. One, I myself got two hours of sleep last night because of it, and I know a lot of people in, in eastern Malibu didn't sleep or were so frazzled that they didn't want to show up here tonight because they're just, it's too much. So I'm sort of surprised we're having the meeting, but I guess, you know, it is what it is. Secondly, just before I left, I saw some helicopter footage with some commentary on TV clearly showing that the fire was caused by a, a tree falling on Edison power lines. So we've seen that, you know, last week up at the the other side of the valley, and just thought you'd want a heads up on that one. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Lance Simmons, and then Scott Dietrich. Good evening, Mayor Council. Uh, I want to talk uh, briefly tonight about um, an action that the uh, Public Works Commission uh, took in our last meeting last week. Uh, as you all know, uh, Caltrans has proposed a pedestrian crosswalk uh, at Malibu Seafood. Um, they came in a public meeting here, presented it pitifully and inaccurately, and is now coming back. And they'll be here Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, and I just want to encourage everyone to please come to that meeting uh, to let them know how we feel about a crosswalk at the bottom of a hill, when in fact there is a viable alternative already there, and that's the underpass. So I offered a motion um, at the Public Works Commission meeting this week, <clears throat> which has three parts to it. First of all, it, um, it opposes the crosswalk. Second of all, it remarks that um, at a public safety commission meeting two months ago, I asked the Caltrans representatives there if the underpass was a viable alternative. And they answered in the affirmative. So I asked them again, and they answered in the affirmative. So the motion states <clears throat> that Caltrans believes that the underpass is a viable alternative. And then the third part of the motion is to accept the underpass as an alternative. So um, please uh, come and express yourselves on uh, Wednesday evening. And um, I, I think it's just really an ill-advised um, move to try to put that crosswalk at the bottom of that hill. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Scott Dietrich. Well, Lance made my uh, job really easy. The uh, Public Works Commission approved that motion with its three parts unanimous, unanimously to send on to council. So um, we do hope 
that we would have the full weight of the city behind that. There's many reasons not to have the crosswalk uh, right at Malibu Seafood, just across the highway. And one of the main ones is people are gonna be speeding down this hill and particularly in the winter in the afternoon, um, you've got the sun right in your face. They're not gonna see it. We already have this underground passage in existence and it's right by the Sarawan Nature Trail and we ought to make use of that. Um, the other thing I'm gonna comment is on the recycling. I thought when I put cardboard in my blue bin, it said recycling, I'm recycling it. And apparently that's not true. So I guess everybody else is doing the same thing. And for all this time, I guess I'm doing the wrong thing um, unknowingly. So um, we do need some you know, clarification on that. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any commission or committee updates? I believe those last two were your commission updates, Mayor. Thank you. Reva, do you have a city manager update? I do. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by uh, making sure that everybody knows the very sad news that our public safety commissioner, Andy Cohen, passed away last week. Um, my uh, heart and thoughts and prayers are with his family. He uh, passed away unexpectedly, and I think it's been an incredible shock, uh, not only to his family, but to the entire community. Um, he did so much for the city and public safety and was just a true gentleman and a very good-hearted man. And so I'm personally going to miss him, and um, I hope all of you take time to uh, reach out to his family. Um, we also have had some changes at the Lost Hill Sheriff Station in terms of staffing. I was expecting an update from Captain Matt Vanderhork uh, this afternoon. Unfortunately, with the Getty fire, uh, he is still um, attending to uh, that and so was unable to come and he will be here at the next meeting to give us an official update on those changes. I um, wanted to speak to a couple of the speakers. Um, Mr. Dietrich, I, I have been working with um, our lobbyist in Sacramento and all of the other people that I know that know the commissioner, uh, Ricardo Lara. Um, at this point, it looks like we may be able to get some of his staff down here before the end of the year. Um, given the number of fires uh, throughout the state, um, he has set a policy that he won't go back to a community that he's already been to in the past year. Uh, he was in our area in, um, I believe, January, March and April. And so uh, we're working to get some staff down here as well as representatives from the California Fair Plan. So um, I know that's a priority for the community to hear from the folks in Sacramento on insurance issues. And I am working every day to try and find a date for that. So stand by for more on that. Um, in terms of the brush clearance at Malibu Park, uh, city staff will certainly follow up if there's anything we can do to make sure that's done correctly. Um, and regarding the comments on goats, um, I agree it's a great idea. Unfortunately, in Malibu, we don't have any uh, city-owned open space where goats can be used for brush clearance, so that's why you don't see them uh, frequently here um, on city property because we don't have any that would uh, benefit from that. And we'll also follow up on the recycle questions. A couple upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow night here at City Hall at 6 o'clock, there's a community listening session. I encourage everybody to come and uh, talk about uh, the things that have happened over the past year. Um, on Wednesday at 6 o'clock, Caltrans will be holding a public meeting to discuss the crosswalk at PCH and Corral Canyon, um, and I encourage people to come and share their opinion uh, about why we are opposed to that uh, project as it's proposed. Um, on Saturday, November 2nd, from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m., there will be a rain barrel giveaway here at City Hall for Malibu residents. And then on November 9th, uh, next Saturday, which is the uh, day that the Woolsey fire hit the Malibu community, we'll be having a community gathering um, at Zuma Beach at Lot 8. Um, there'll be uh, some community speakers, live music, and giveaways for uh, Malibu residents. So I really hope I can see all of you there um, so we can all support each other and hopefully set off a, a better year um, for next year. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, moving on to council member reports. Uh, who would anyone like to go first? I'm happy to go first. Thank you. Uh, Andy Cohen was my public safety commissioner, and I was stunned and shocked when I heard the news about him. I did not know Andy before I appointed him to be a public safety commissioner, and he was recommended to me by Chris Frost, and I was incredibly impressed with what he brought to the, uh, his responsibility as a public safety commissioner. He did a lot of things um, in a very short period of time. He brought a lot of energy to it, enthusiasm. He put on the expo, and I know it probably cost him a little money out of his pocket. He's very uh, accomplished in his professional, in his personal and professional life, and he's an incredibly warm individual and engaging, and you can't help but really like him as soon as you meet him. And I think um, he used his personal charm to um, make a lot of things happen, and I am stunned that he's gone, and I really appreciate um, everything he did for the community, and I appreciate his family supporting him in all of that, because I know it's not easy for family members to have your loved ones go down to City Hall and give of their time, but Andy was a good, uh, very good man, and I missed his um, ceremony because I was uh, called away to the fire department, which is happening a lot these days, but I understand it went very well, and that it was very well attended. So Andy will be missed. Those are big shoes to fill. I will have to appoint someone to replace him, and I uh, will be considering that, um, but not right now. Um, there's been a lot of augmented staffing in the fire department. I'm bringing my other job to uh, my discussion right now. There, um, nobody's. I always say we're all prisoners of the fire department. Nobody's going home. Nobody's leaving anywhere um, because of the weather, and they're sparing no expense in making sure that everything is prepared. I was lucky to get here this evening, but I knew that the short-term rental thing was an important one, so I sold my soul to have another gentleman come and cover me for a few hours, but I'll be going back out probably for the rest of the week as soon as I get out of here. Um, very good messaging from the city on all of the updates and uh, regarding road blockages and, and uh, status updates on the various fires that have been happening. I appreciate that. If you haven't signed up for all those notices, you should. Uh, get them on your phone, get them on your text message, get them on email, do it. There's a lot of them going out. The city's doing a great job of pushing them out. Uh, Lance, I couldn't agree with you more about the crosswalk. I unfortunately won't be here on Wednesday because I'm sure we'll be back out there on some fire patrol doing something, but I hope that will be attended by everybody. There is an underground crosswalk at, at uh, Topanga, at Topanga Beach, you know, it goes uh, or over, over by where the real inn is, basically, and you can go under and go to the beach, and it works great, and I think it should be, this is the time that we have to really make the move, so I think, I appreciate you bringing that to everyone's attention, and I hope it'll be well attended, and I hope that our city manager will use her magic to convince those Caltrans guys to come around to our way of thinking. Um, recycling, cardboard, I, 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 it sounds like what you're saying is if you put it in a plastic bag that they're going to just, because they can't see what it is. So I, maybe the hot ticket is don't put it in a plastic bag when you put it in your bin. Is that it? I'm not sure. But if there's any clarifying stuff on the recycling, anybody's got any, that would be wonderful because that, that is important. It's important to everybody. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you. Skyler? Thank you, Karen. Um, I would uh, send my condolences to Andy Cohen's family. Um, we were really grateful to have him as a, a resource for the city on the Public Safety Commission, and what he did to the expo earlier in the year was really a special thing and really helpful for a lot of our residents. Um, I attended a CPA meeting on a conference call here from City Hall last week about uh, procuring power out into the future, and that's looking positive, although there are some changes at the, the CPUC level that were of some concern. Um, it sounds like some of that stuff's getting worked out. It affects Edison and anyone that, that buys and sells power in the U.S. I mean, in California. Um, also attended the L.A. County uh, meeting on the draft report uh, from the Woolsey fire with Mikey, Karen, and Jefferson, and Riva, um, and Yolanda, and a couple of their, uh, Susan, and a few other staff members. I, was, I thought it would have been a little bit more well attended than it was. It was held over in Agura, and... Um, Grateful for that. I think there's a lot that the, the county and all the resources, the city and everyone can learn from that. And uh, 
do better in the future. I was grateful that today the fire department got a had a real quick response uh, to what went on at the Academy Access near the 101. And hopefully we don't have to deal with that later this week uh, when it gets extremely windy. Um, those are my comments for now. Thank you. Jefferson. Thank you, Karen. Uh, on Thursday morning, I attended the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting where uh, Suzanne Good from California State Parks uh, announced her retirement from DPR. And for those, you know, a few of you were uh, happy about that. Um, I signed the card that said thank you for your service because for 25 years she did a great job. Um, the discussion once again came up on the Malibu Lagoon and the geomorphology uh, reports that we're seeking here at the city. The council did vote to uh, select a vendor and the city manager's office selected a vendor and it seems to be very appropriate that we move forward and try and secure funding so I put that out there to that we would do a shared funding process to work on the Malibu Lagoon to the great applause of many of the surfers that use Third Point. I did attend the uh, the um, event yesterday for Andy Cohen and a real community member and it would be hard to replace him, Rick, so good luck on that. And that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Mikey, can you hear us? Are you ready for your report? Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you speak louder? Okay. Yes, I will speak louder. Sorry, I'm on an ancient phone, and I just want to apologize to everyone for being away. This was a uh, many months planned work trip, and there's just no way I could miss it, so I apologize to everyone for that. Um, His family and friends. Uh, We've lost you. We need you to speak louder. You cannot hear me, huh? Okay, I am trying. Um, is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so my, my big condolences to Andy's friends and family. That's a difficult one. I, too, attended the League of Cities event. Um, I thought it was very valuable with uh, Karen and Rick. And it's interesting to see that the other cities I talked to there pretty much have the exact same issues we do, short-term rentals, homelessness, housing, and wildfire. So we are not alone. Um, I was also part of a great event at the Big Heart Ranch where we, a bunch of us got together and helped them rebuild many things that were destroyed in the fire. A great organization. I was very impressed with uh, the people I met and what I learned there. Also attended uh, with Karen a uh, meeting of all the local uh, clergy uh, at the Lost Hill Station. I thought that was a, a very valuable uh, time spent seeing how the uh, sheriff is, sheriff's department liaisons are trying to embrace all the various um, religions in the area, the clergy and the rest, and I thought that was really well done. Um, along with uh, most of the council also attended the county Woolsey draft report. And, um, yeah, you could feel some fatigue there from everybody. It's been a long time and a long, a long haul. And lastly, I attended the Johnny Strange movie. It was incredibly powerful at City Hall. Um, my hats off to... Everyone involved in that production, um, particularly Eamon and John and uh, Veronica, and uh, I, it was so powerful. I haven't actually even reached out to them yet to thank them because it was really, it was really, it was, it was very moving. And uh, and Riva, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I just want to say that I believe uh, pesticide issue is coming back to council on November 12th, and those are my comments. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pearson, it's actually coming back on December 9th. You know, I knew I had the 12 and the 9 mixed up, so thank you for correcting that. You're on welcome. December 9th, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, my comments. Ted Vale, thank you uh, for reminding us what can happen with wildfires, uh, yes, and camping in Esha. 
I would think if today wasn't a wake-up call about that, I don't know what would be. I'm not saying that today's fire was started by anybody camping, but we see, we've seen today, again, how quickly it can spread. And uh, I'm with you 100%. I don't agree with the idea of having ca open camping in the Santa Monica Mountains here. Um, activities. Uh, I want to thank the staff for all the communications today. There have been a lot of moving parts uh, with the Getty fire, with the fire that started over at the 101 in Las Virginis, and uh, the possible preemptive power shutoff. So um, thanks to everybody for pushing the messages out. And that, that, that obviously the week is going to be challenging coming up, too. Um, the last two weeks, I went to our Las Virginis Malibu COG meeting. I met with my public safety commissioner, Doug Stewart. Uh, I also attended the League of Cities conference in Long Beach, which was the 16th, 17th, and 18th. And as Mikey said, um, good news, bad news, all the cities in California share most of the same challenges. And we're looking for solutions and at times commiserating. Um, while we were there, we got the news that our public safety vice, uh, commission vice chair, Andy Cohen had passed away unexpectedly. And that was a complete shock. Um, we also got the completely unexpected news that our sheriff's lieutenant had been reassigned, Jennifer C2, if you haven't heard that. Um, so we have new challenges to deal with, especially uh, being right smack in the middle of fire season. Uh, Mikey and I uh, went to Pepperdine and did an interview with uh, three students there who work in both print and broadcast journalism. I too attended the uh, clergy advisory council at Lost Hills. I want to thank uh, Brian Laspada, who's a Malibu resident, and uh, Phil Reeves, they're both LASD chaplains. And the attendance was broad-based. Uh, there were people there from dozens of congregations throughout uh, the area that Lost Hills serves. Um, it was my extreme honor to chair or to uh, MC for the second year, the Optimist Club Youth Achievement Awards. And we had some great questions from the kids when they came back to City Hall. Uh, they wanted to know about how our council is elected. We were also asked if we could put in a zoo and if we have three branches of government. Um, yes, I was also here and uh, it was my honor to introduce the uh, documentary about Johnny Strange made by our local community members. Veronica Brady, who produced it, and um, Eamon Harrington and John Watkin, who directed it. And I also want to thank the Strange family for sharing that story with us all. Um, I, too, attended the supervisor's Woolsey After Action draft report presentation on Saturday. That was at Agora High School. Uh, that was a four hour event from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with uh, an extensive uh, visual presentation of the report and then um, a lot of public comments. I want to thank everybody who was able to be there. Uh, and who spoke during public comments. And if you'd like to get out your pen, I'm gonna give you some information to read the draft report and or comment on it. You can go to lacounty.gov slash recovery slash report. And comments on that draft are being accepted by the county through November 8th. So right now is your opportunity. It's about a 200 page report I'm working my way through it right now. I highly recommend it for anybody uh, who wants to see what the county thinks right now and comment on it. Uh, I also uh, attended Andy Cohen's celebration of life, and obviously he leaves a huge void for many people in many areas. Okay, and that's it for my report.
Mayor, could I uh, take a moment? I just uh, got an update from the fire department on the red flag warning for this week. I'd just like to read it, if that would be okay. Um, so the fire department sent us the following information. An extreme red flag warning will be in, in effect in the Santa Monica Mountains from 11 p.m. on Tuesday until 6 p.m. on Thursday, October 31st. Um, I've actually never heard them say extreme, so I think this is something we need to be very conscious of. The peak of the wind event is expected to be Wednesday when damaging wind gusts between 50 and 70 miles an hour will be likely for the wind prone areas of Los Angeles and Ventura counties with isolated gusts to 80 miles per hour in the mountains. The Santa Ana wind event will likely be the strongest we have seen so far this season. And so the fire department um, has augmented staffing throughout this area. Um, once again, just please make sure that you've signed up for city alerts. If you haven't and you are not uh, tech savvy, you can always call the city's hotline at 310-456-9982. And that hotline is updated regularly with emergency information. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have some items pulled from the consent calendar. Item 3A1, 3B5. Uh, Mayor, can I make a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling items 3A1 and 3B5? Yes, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we need to take a roll call vote. Councilmember Peek? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we will begin the hearing for the items pulled from the consent calendar. Do we have a staff report? So, to, so good evening, Council. This is a second reading for um, adoption of Ordinance Number Four Fifty One. It's it's our soft water um, ban ordinance, and basically, essentially, what this is is um, within the Civic Center Phase One uh, water treatment facility area, the ban for soft water systems will be in place. And what what's as important about this is that. Um, the wastewater treatment facility is really sensitive on how it treats all the wastewater and salts that we have in our system really have a really havoc. Um, it, they're really tough to treat and make sure that we're meeting our, our water quality um, standards that we have to get with the, with the regional board. So having these salts in there will really cause us a lot of problems. It also um, it produces a, a not a very good standard of uh, recycled water. So this ban is in place to make sure our water quality after we treat this um, is meets our requirements with the state water board and also to produce a high quality um, recycled water. Thank you, Rob. Okay, public speakers. I'm sorry, does this say Culligan Water? Culligan Water followed by Derek, I'm sorry, Saldansky. Okay. Arden, is it Garver? Thank you. Colin. Hedrick, Mark Wakefield, thank you. Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, <clears throat> others can talk about the number of soft water customers that my company has in Malibu, and it's rather significant. And my intent here tonight was not to talk about that, but to ask you to pull it from your consent agenda tonight which I think maybe you just did, but I'm not sure if that happened or not. So let me go ahead and tell you what I wanted to talk about. Yes, that's what happened. There is information, including what we just heard tonight, 
about what you are doing and the purposes of it. You're not out of compliance with the regional board, <clears throat> nor will you be out of compliance with the regional board. You are doing this, according to your city engineer that we met with about three weeks ago, to meet the requirements of the contractor who is doing your sewage treatment plant. The fact is that you're doing it for a five acre parcel is pretty significant, except when you peel the onion back and you find that ultimately a one year later, you can require the removal of automatic water softeners throughout the entire region. That doesn't make sense. What does make sense is that to meet a better effluent from your sewage treatment plant, you can't give away your effluent now. We were told that the largest buyer of effluent won't take your effluent free. So in order to satisfy your contractor, you are in effect selling out homeowners because the sewage treatment plant will be no different after it's built until you start taking away water softeners from people who purchased them ethically, legally over the last years. Not very transparent. City representing other softener uh, suggestions, and they have been printed that they say there are all kinds of different no salt alternatives. That's factually incorrect. There is a NSF ANSI standard that defines what a water softener is, and anything else might be scale reduction or otherwise considered a gizmo, something that is sold that there's no third party validation that it does. Only a water softener will be providing soft water. You have, you have, you, you, you have not allowed transparency in what you, what, what you're doing. Your, your city engineer met with us, very graceful, it was wonderful. But he said, we're moving on <clears throat> and we have no interest in hearing any of your input. None, zero. We worked with the city of Buellton. We worked with the city or the, the uh, water district of Moulton de Gell, and we were able to reach accommodations that were satisfactory to them. Santa Clarita removed 7,000 water you. softeners to avoid what they are now facing, which is lawsuits, and they didn't meet their standards. We Thank ask you. you to remove it. Thank you. Next, Derek, I apologize, Sol. Saldansky. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. I'll give you a short and sweet. Um, I'm the territory manager for uh, Culligan here in, in Malibu and have helped hundreds and hundreds of people set up their homes to treat their water so they can have a good quality water in their home to prevent it from damaging whatever it may be. Um, so I just, I mean, if we remove these water softening systems, there really isn't a, another method like you had touched on that's going to be able to remove that scale buildup from the water itself that damages these these houses. Uh, so really, I just wanted to um, just say that uh, I'm in favor of keeping the water softening systems. That's all. Thank you. Arden Garver. Hello. Um, I'm kind of in the same process where over the last two years, we've installed just over 200 water softeners in the area for people that can turn around and provide themselves with a better way of water coming into the home. The water district is able to turn around and give you what the EPA says is within the limits, but some people want to turn around and have better water for their homes and they should have that right to do so. Um, we also have 60, 200, 627 service calls that were ran in the last year and a half out in the area of people that have equipment that are out here. And we also have 2000 water softeners in our system that we're currently servicing over a certain period of time. Um, by turning around and taking away the water softeners, you're taking away a better quality of life and taking away a person's right to choose. And if they want to turn around and have soft water, better drinking water, or anything else that goes along with it. That's what I have to say. Thank you. And we have Colin Hedrick. Hi there. <clears throat> um, so I just want to give you guys a little perspective uh, from our standpoint. Uh, on any given week, we receive between 10 and 15 uh, calls for soft water solutions. Um, that's quite a few 
residents that are looking specifically for soft water. Um, <clears throat> regarding alternatives out there, uh, having been in the field myself, there are no alternatives out there that truly soften water. Uh, most Malibu residents uh, actually prefer to buy systems rather than to rent them. So if you switch to some sort of alternative, you're looking more towards a rental base rather than a purchase base. Um, and quite frankly, most of our customers are aware of what soft water does for their appliances, for their home, and how it protects them. Thank you. Thank you. The final speaker on this item is Mark Wakefield. So my name is Mark Wakefield. I'm with uh, a company called Water Techniques, a uh, 40-year veteran of water. And um, I'm here to state the case that I think you've been totally misinformed by your contractor in uh, making you believe that the net effect of the reduction of salinity will have on the banning from the banning of, of water softeners. And I state the case of uh, what Mr. Layton started to bring up uh, the study that was done on the Santa Clarita Water District, where um, they basically told the residents that if they didn't remove their water softeners, that they were going to have to build a $300 million water treatment plant and their water bills were going to quadruple. And uh, then uh, State Senator George Runner um, actually was instrumental in pushing it through and the ban was enforced. Not only did they do that, but they had a buyback program where they buy, bought all the water softeners back from the homeowners. And after that, then Senator Runner issued a scathing memo to the Castaic Water District uh, stating that they had basically bait and switched their residents and that, in his words, it didn't do a damn thing. And they are now building that water treatment plan anyway. So the net effect of this is not going to be, have any impact. And I, I would encourage you to, to reconsider this until you know all the facts and figures and data that our industry can provide you, which I don't think that you have right now. You're relying on the opinion of a contractor who says that it could present a problem. He uses the word could several times, and it's simply not, not true. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rob, is there uh, currently at this time is the uh, s the wastewater treatment system seeing any negative effects from these types of systems in the area? What well, we are seeing higher levels of um, total dissolved solids and salts that are in there. Uh, um, yes, it's. Our, our system is very unique than other agencies. Uh, we have to be very cautious of um, the salt levels that we put in there. And, and let me just kind of bring up this, this conversation about our salt level has, is not just from our plant operator, but it's from our original designers. They put in great effort to make sure our, our collection system is watertight. We're not getting any groundwater levels or, or um, that, that has high salt levels coming in because our treatment process is very, very particular. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort and um, it could have a lot of effect on our, our wastewater treatment, our effluent when we treat it. And so um, if we get higher levels of salt, we can have some problems operating the plant from um, and, and, and meeting those standards. Um, at this time, do we know how many water softeners are in the phase one, phase two, or phase three area approximately? So right now we're, we're connected to phase one, which is probably 40 to 45 um, parcels that are connected. Um, of those, I, I don't have the data to say which ones have soft waters or not, but um, they're all commercial properties, so I would think some have soft water, some, some may not. Um, but this problem may eventually go on to phase two where we have over 400 properties, which are all, they're all residential properties. Okay, thank you. So let's say you yank out the water softeners in phase one. 
during that period, we'll be able to do some sort of data gathering to see, hey, that really worked, and boy, oh boy, those contractors who set this plan up were right, and I'm glad we did it, or like these gentlemen are saying, hey, that didn't make any difference at all, it was totally unnecessary, so maybe we'll reconsider for phase two, or is there any plan to, you know, analyze that? Yes, that's that's a probably a good plan. We'll, we'll be doing that anyway, and, and we'll be looking at the um, water composition before and after, especially after we get done with this ordinance. We'll, we'll be able to see what the effect is and, and see if it really gone, if it's the salinity level has really gone down. So this addresses the properties in phase one only. For right now, yes. And it has a, does it have a provision for expanding that out um, to more than phase one in this ordinance? Just to explain, Council, um, Rob DeBow is uh, stepping in tonight for Andrew Sheldon, who's been the lead on this. Andrew actually is at home because he lives in the evacuation um, area for the Getty Fire. So uh, just give us a moment uh, while we figure no it out. Thank Take you. Take your time, Rob. It sounds like one of the complaints of these uh, water professionals was that uh, Phase one today, tomorrow, the rest of Malibu, and I just want to clarify that so it, it, what it is. It, it, it is just in the Civic Center water treatment facility um, area. It's not the whole city. It's just for those properties that connected to the Civic Center uh, facility. So it's it's not specifying phase one. It's just anybody who is planning to be hooked into that system. That's what it, that's what it looks like. So it could mean up to all those 400 properties. I think that may, maybe what we would want to look at, and I don't know, Rob, how this would be communicated to, uh, <coughs> to Andrew and the staff and how best to address it, would be to take some time period or something and say, okay, well, we're not going to allow these systems to be hooked up for a year or two years, and then you can revisit it, and if there is no net effect, then you can reallow the systems. Um, I don't know how best to check that. I'm not a water professional by any means. So, so one thing that we have, we have some time in our hands. Phase two won't be up and running or properties won't be connected until November 2024. So we have now until November 2024 to really look at the data to see where we're at. So maybe we go ahead and, and pass this ban and ask something to come back to council maybe in two years. Um, would be what my suggestion is, um, and that, oh, go ahead. Jefferson. Uh, thank you, appreciate that, Karen. Uh, Rob, I know you're not into the, 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 uh, the deep well of this uh, legislation. However, to my understanding, I don't think we've had a hard time finding vendors to purchase our Title 22 treated water. So I'm kind of looking at the future when we have the cemetery on the hill and some of the uh, distribution of Title 22, as one of the speakers had mentioned, that uh, we're having to inject all this, but I understand we have a market for our Title 22 once we're on going and we seek those market revenues out. Is, is that something that's fair to say? That's correct. Thanks, both of you. I appreciate it. I, I knew we had a place for the Title 22 and that it's an, it will be in demand very shortly. Thank you. Mikey, do you have uh, any comments on this? Uh, no, I have no different comments than have been made. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do so we have a motion? I would make a motion to at this time go ahead with the ban and then for, uh, yeah, for the, the, the properties that are in the phase one area. And that if we come back, it's 2019, let's come back in 2021. Um, or, you know, let's go. 2020 let's go 2020 beginning of 2022 and you know report back and if there's no net effect on those systems not being or not having water softeners in phase one of the prohibition area that we would allow them um, to be in, you know, installed or reinstalled and then the people in phase two and phase three could keep it. 
that, that's to uh, waive second reading and then to adopt the ordinance per the uh, staff's recommendation with the additional um, direction to staff. Yeah, that it would come back in tw the beginning of 2022 and be reevaluated. Meaning that the properties in phase one actually do a ban and then reevaluate the results of that in two years. Yes, Kelsey, that's correct. Was there a second for that motion? Second. Uh, sec okay, we need to do a roll call vote. Councilmember Peak? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. The next item that's been pulled is item 3B5 which is uh, to initiate amendments to the local coastal program and Malibu Municipal Code to foster fire resistant landscapes. We have one public speaker, Craig Hill. Good evening, council members. Um, Jessica Clevenger has been working on this ordinance, so she's here to help answer any questions. Did you want any kind of a staff report or just to hear the public comment and then we'll respond? Please, let's have a staff report, thank you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, members of the, the council. Earlier this month, I believe it was October 14th, staff brought an item to Zeracy's Zoning Ordinance and Code Enforcement Subcommittee, and it addresses amendments to MMC Chapter 9.22, the Landscaping Ordinance, and Title 17. Some of the amendments include possibly uh, restricting or banning certain types of vegetation that are highly flammable. In addition to creating a five-foot uh, defensible space around structures where highly flammable material would be restricted. As it does involve changes to Title 17, the next, um, the next step for this ordinance would be bringing it to the Planning Commission. At this time, I would just clarify that um, the discussion at Zoracis was to present the concepts for the ordinance and now before you tonight is an, a resolution to actually initiate the amendments to the zoning code. Okay, thank you. Okay, now our public speaker, Craig Hill. Thank you, Council. That was sort of half my question answered. Um, the Zeracy's meeting was really good. There were a lot of good ideas. Some, some smart people in the room came up with some good things. None of that is mentioned in the staff report. So maybe it's just a pr procedural clarification, but I, I just want to make sure that the content that came out of that meeting actually is moved along, comes forward, and comes to the Planning Commission. Because um, let's not leave it behind. Thank you. OK, thank you. I, I believe that that's what the uh, direction is here, is to prepare that to go to the uh, Planning Commission. So I'm going to make a motion to pass item 3B5. And I'll second it, Skylar, if I can make one comment prior to adoption. Um, we did have extensive commenting and detailed information provided to us. You were there, and uh, it, as Craig said, it was a terrific meeting. Uh, it was very educational. I, I think we really do need to bring the depth of those that data and those reports to the Planning Commission because it really reflected a great deal of work on the staff's part as well as the speakers. Yes, that will um, absolutely happen. This is um, simply the, a matter of officially kind of kicking it off or initiating the amendment um, before staff spend any more time on it. So um, that's what's before you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I'm ready to vote. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We need to do a roll call vote. Councilmember Peak? Yes. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion. Okay. Our next item 5A short term rental. Do we have a staff report? Do you want to take a break? Yep. 
Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, a little over a year ago, on September 26, uh, 2018, staff presented a short-term rental ordinance for council consideration and adoption. The first reading of the ordinance was the culmination of years of discussion by the City Council, Zeraces, and the Planning Commission on how to address and regulate short-term rentals. The ordinance was drafted to address all of the criteria and specific instructions Council provided at the July 8, 2018 Council meeting. At that September 26th meeting, Council directed staff to return with four main points of information. One, uh, financial analysis of the implications and potential impacts of a ban on short-term rentals. Um, potential impacts of the ban on short-term rentals, not impacts of the ban on short-term rentals, just to be clear. Um, two, potential options and procedures for banning short-term rentals. Three, information on the local coastal plan amendment process, should, that, uh, should it be determined that that is necessary. Four approaches uh, other coastal cities have taken to regulate short-term rentals and the associated litigation in those cities. As we all unfortunately know, a little over a month after Council provided these instructions to staff, the Woolsey fire occurred um, and caused the preparation of this item to be delayed as attention and focus shifted to fire recovery. Staff is here tonight to provide information on, on all the topics requested for council consideration on September 26, 2018, which I just mentioned, and to receive direction regarding a short-term rental ordinance. We will go through the requested items one by one, beginning with the requested financial analysis. The city issued an RFP for financial consulting services in March 2019, and in June 2019, the city entered into an agreement with Raftelis Financial Consultants. Since that time, they have conducted a thorough analysis of the city's finances and developed a financial model. This customized financial model uses historical and current financial data to allow the city to analyze various financial scenarios and will be a valuable tool for the council to evaluate financial and policy decisions moving forward. Using the model, the city can create a 10-year forecast that reflects the financial impacts from a short-term rental ban and the financial impacts of the Woolsey Fire and the associated re rebuilding efforts, including unreimbursed expenses from the past and potential winter rain events. On October 3rd, 2019, the Administration and Finance Subcommittee received a presentation from the consultants that summarized the results of the financial modeling, um, highlighting the financial strain of the Woolsey Fire and the impact of a full short-term rental ban, as well as what the financial impact would be with a 50% loss of short-term rental um, tax revenue. The subcommittee requested the presentation to council to be updated uh, to consider the financial impact of a 25% ban rather than just 50%, um, which ha has been included in the presentation you'll, you're about to hear, and to include discussion of potential expenditure reductions that could offset loss of revenue from a partial ban or a full ban on short-term rentals. Staff has identified a list of potential short-term and long-term expenditure reductions, which is provided on page six of the staff report for council's consideration, as well as potential options for increasing revenue. Um, I'll now turn it over to uh, Ralph Dallas to give um, the updated presentation um, on the financial impact of a potential short-term rental ban based on the model that his team developed. Um, after which Planning Director Bonnie Blue will discuss options and procedures for regulating and banning short-term rentals um, and what the um, local coastal plan amendment process is like. Thank you for the introduction. Madam Mayor, City Council, staff and public, I'd like to present our presentation associated with the financial condition associated with the City of Malibu, um, with the fire, and then with the short-term rental. Um, during my presentation, if there's any questions or comments that you may have, um, please do interrupt me. I definitely wanna make sure we understand all the information. There's a lot of information that we'll be covering today. And excuse me, I have a little bit of a head cold. <clears throat> so um, today we're gonna to talk about the current situation, the financial model, the functionality of the model. We have done a lot of analysis in that area. Look at the assumptions associated with the Wilsley Fire, short-term rental, 
um, the status quo as we define and what that means, and then the scenarios associated with the different short-term rentals. As mentioned, we did look at different scenarios, a 25%, a 50%, and a full band. And then the key takeaways associated with this. So the starting point is, the good news is that you are in a very strong financial position. Um, staff, your guidance has um, brought the city into a good place. Um, so that's the good news. Um, unfortunately, the bad news, as you know, is that you went through a fire, a significant fire that did reduce revenues and had significant costs. These costs um, occurred and are occurring in the future, and there's a response associated with those costs. What we've been asked, um, Raf tell us, is to look at the cost associated with a short-term rental. In order to do that, what we've developed is a financial model that's in Excel. Staff has a copy of the model. We've trained staff on the model, it's non-proprietary, that can look at different scenarios, financial impacts associated with how much does the fire cost us, and then what are the potential costs associated with different scenarios associated with a short-term ban. So how do we do that analysis? We do that with a couple of process. First, we obtain critical data. We get all the information that we want. We identify what those are. One, is, for instance, is your budget, the historical property tax. Second, we review, analyze that data. Um, we work with staff um, on looking at that data. Of course, the two most important things is the current and past budget. Also, we look at um, level of services that are, we're expecting in the future, specifically with safety. Um, then we develop forecasts based on those. We ask, so what's a reasonable forecast associated with property tax, with budget increase, again, public safety. These are the key drivers, as you can see in what I'm talking about. We validate those um, assumptions with city staff. We've actually had a workshop with staff, all day workshop, where we went through those. We developed the model based on that. Um, we have that validation, we present the results. So the model um, takes into account the impacts of the Wilsley Fire, it does look at different scenarios associated with a short-term rental. Um, the model has flexible where we can look at dashboards, functionalities, and we can do different scenarios. What are the key drivers associated with the model? So the model takes into account all the different sources of revenues that the city takes into. And we model that. We don't just assume certain things. We actually look at, well, what do we think is the, based on our crystal ball, what do we think the future of property tax is with TOT, with interest earning based on end fund balance? Second, we look at expenditures. We ask ourselves, what are the future expenditures we see at all the different levels of the department? What was the cost of the fire? How did that fire affect the different levels, um, with specifically with permitting, staffing, storm response because of the consequence of the fire, and then disaster-related CIP? Other things that we take into account is the cost associated with the short-term rental. One of the challenges with a short-term rental will be there will be additional, additional costs associated with um, increased registration. If we do different scenarios associated with a short-term rental, we take that into account. There will be increased uh, penalties with short-term rentals. We take that into account. And there will be also increased costs for the city to impose those short-term rentals with code enforcement. Now, one of the th comments that we did receive when we met with the um, committee, the administration and finance committee, was is this um, people asked about secondary, I call them secondary effect, or some people call them trickle down effect. This is a second order of magnitude. And these are the things that, well, if we ban this, then this will cause this, and it will cause that. And these things are very hard to quantify and to understand. So, you know, the possible impact of sales tax from short term rental the possible impact of property value from short-term rentals, these are unknowns. We didn't address those. Um, I don't think, you know, it, it's too many uncertainties, too much of a crystal ball of chaos to really understand that impact. So we focused on the things that we actually do know. So our assumptions, we believe, are informed, reasonable, and conservative. We do look at the revenues associated with property tax, we take into account the historical capa, um, consumer price index trends. We look at expenditures that we know that's going to occur from the capital improvement plans that the city has adopted. And we take those all into account. In addition, we take into account your reserve targets. You have two basic policies associated. One's a policy, which is 50% um, of your operating budget. The second one is a city council goal, which is 65%. Um, these are great goals to have because they help with maintaining conservatism and um, help with prone with disasters. And these goals have helped you 
where you are right now. By having these goals, you weather through the storm. So that's great that you have those in place. So one of the things that we need to do is define what is the status quo? What do we think is a reasonable scenario in the future? So the first thing we asked ourselves is property tax. And what do we think is a reasonable growth rate? I'm going to show you in the next slide the historical growth of property tax. And you've been, we've been blessed um, in Malibu that it's been growing by 5.7% from 2012 to 2019. So we use that number. That actually is a conservative number. Historically, it's actually increased even more than that. Fees, we say that it's increased by the consumer price index. Now, the fire, the, the Woolsey fire, um, affected both the operating expenditures, and we say that's going to go through 2023. There will be also additional flood and debris mitigation that we anticipate that will occur through 26. Now, the good news is that FEMA will be reversing us, but they're not going to pay for the whole cost. That's the bad news. So we expect some reimbursement to start um, in fiscal year 21. The status quo is no short-term rental ban. Um, we do take into account the debt service increase that was due to the purchase of the vacant land in 2008. And we also take into account the increase in level of service associated with public safety um, that's um, associated with the new st fire station, uh, um, sheriff station, excuse me, in 2023. So property tax, as I mentioned, has significantly increased in the city of Malibu. And over the last, you know, from 2003 to 2020, it's increased by over 7% a year. It even increased during the recession. So the question is, is you know, this is sort of a challenge here because if we assume 7.5%, that's a very, op it almost seems a little bit too optimistic. It's historically what's occurred. So that's why we use 5.7. We feel like that's a little bit more conservative number, but that is the number we're using for the forecast. And this is one of the sort of the challenges and one of the key takeaways of the study is, is that we do need to look at the property tax increase over the next few years and make sure we're on target with that. That will have a big influence with the city's financial plan. So now I want to show you the um, end results of the status quo. The bars are the expenditures and what we're forecasting out with increased costs associated with the Woolsey fire, storm, debris, a cost associated with level of increase of service for public safety. The line is the revenues that we're generating from all different sources of revenues. This is again, as I mentioned, it's the status quo. So we have the short-term rental income coming in. Um, basically, when the line intersects the bars, that means we're drawing down on our fund balance. When the line is above the bars, that means we're generating above that, we're refurbishing or we're, we're putting more money in the bank. Now, this is the ending balance. So what I show you here is that historically, as you can see in 2018, we were very healthy. The city did purchase some land in 2008, so you see a reduction there. But then you see the reduction further that's associated with the Woolsey fire. The other thing you'll notice is this teal color there. That's the money that we'll eventually get back from FEMA. So we're taking that into account. Um, and then the reimbursement will be full by 2025. So there is a, a signif there is a drop there. So we weathered that storm, so that's the good news. But it has had a financial cost in the sense of our ending balance. Next, what I want to show you is the goal that we want to achieve. As I mentioned, the city council goal is to achieve the 65%. Um, the policy is 50%. And the line is what we are as a percent of operating. And as you can see, we don't achieve that goal. We get to around roughly 30%. Now, just as a caveat, other cities you know, with, that we work with, with, with fund balance, you know, 30% is still a healthy amount, but it is challenging in the sense of, you know, the next disaster and those are things that may occur, but it's, it's a good position. That, so one of the th takeaways is, is the key observation is, is that we do need to look at the property tax. That is the high level of degree of unknown here. You know, if, if it's more than 5.7, that historically it has been, then we'll be well off. If it's lower than 5.7, then we will have some challenges. Um, reimbursements of costs associated with the Woolly Fire, it, the unfunded part is um, $13.4 million, which is taken into account in the status quo. 
that's due to the flood uh, debris removement. Um, in addition, we had the, uh, the purchase of the vacant land that occurred right before the fire, and we also are expecting more in costs associated with general safety, public safety. So now I'd like to um, get more into the details of the fire and the costs associated with it. So the fire, we are assuming that the property tax will recover over three years. We are taking into account capital costs associated with FEMA reimbursement and non-reimbursement costs. And I'm going to go into the next slide more details about that. We take into account the fire rebuilding costs, increased costs associated with consultants, storm response costs. And then we're also assuming a like-to-like -like permit. The, one of the challenges is we really don't know how many people are going to change their house. So if they do change their house, then you will see more additional revenue. So that's an optimistic, that's a good thing. Again, we want to uh, um, err on the degree of conservatism in this study. So that's why we did that. So now the cost associated with the fire. What we've done is, is we've looked at the different capital costs associated with the fire, whether it's from general fund not reimbursement, from those that are reimbursed from FEMA, and then the operating costs associated with it. And this is over from fiscal year 19 to 2025. That's going to be total $23.4 million. FEMA, now, uh, the good news is that it will reimburse us $10 million. But that means the general fund will need to use 13, approximately $13.4 million so that we need to draw down. And that's why in that graph that I show you of the percent of the budget, of the operating budget, that's why we go down to 30%. Now, um, so we've talked about the cost of the Wolseley Fire, the financial future we see. Now we want to add in the short-term rental. And this is a financial analysis of that. So what we've done is, is as requested by um, the committee, we're looking at a 25% and a 50% reduction. Um, that will start in fiscal year 21. Um, we will also look at a full reduction that will occur too. So these are the three scenarios. All these scenarios take into account the short-term registration, uh, take into account potential impact of short-term registration, enforcement, and the cost of additional code enforcement staff. So based on working with staff, these, uh, what we've first done is identify how much actually short-term rental income you do generate on an annual basis. Uh, basically, it's right around $2.7 million. So over the 10 years, it's $27.6 million. So we're looking at over a 10-year period. Um, so that's how much you're generating from short-term rent. That's the 27.6. So if we do a 25% ban, that would reduce it to 22.4. We do a 50% ban, that'll be 15.8. Now, if you notice, if you do some simple math, you'll ask yourself, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. 15% of 27, that should be 13.4. So we're taking into account also some additional income that's occurring from registration fees. So it, we are actually being very precise in our analysis. We're looking at these different scenarios taking into account the cost of registration fees. We also take into account some code enforcement. That's sort of a bit more challenging, but we do our best to try to take that into account. And then what we have is the net impact associated with that, where the 25% uh, ban will be um, $6.5 million. That's the net effect over the 10 years. Then um, $13.1 million, and then $30, um, $30 million. So the next graph shows the different scenarios associated with the short-term ban scenarios. And what we're showing you are the different lines um, with it. The green line is the current status quo that we have. The light blue line or teal is the 25% reduction. And as you can see, the 25% reduction gives us where our fund balance is 20%. The next band is the 50%, which is the light purple. And that is problematic, as you can see, because by, 20, by fiscal year 30, we're close to 0%, so that will be significantly challenged. And then a full ban, of course, will have a significant financial impact. Um, of course, in any of these scenarios, um, if the city council decides to do these, then some kind of cost reduction will need to occur in order to do that, or some kind of revenue generation. So the T Takeaway is the city needs to be careful to monitor and forecast property revenues. As I mentioned, that's the big unknown, the property tax. Historically, um, you've done excellent there. We've been blessed there. Um, the question is what will happen in the future. Any partial or short-term ban could have significant impact to the cities. Um, 
the, fi the city's already strained by the vacant land purchase and the Wolseley fire, and then the winter storms associated with that and the fire rebound. The city should consider um, to minimize the non-reimbursement one-time Wolseley costs. Um, that's right now estimated to be $13.4 million to fiscal year 25. Um, we should also consider limiting uh, level of surface hazmat until the impact of the fully of Wolseley fire is fully determined. Um, and that may mean to defer, unfortunately, um, general fund CIP projects. With that said, um, is there any questions I can answer at this time? Anyone? Oh. I, I think not. Thank you. We're hearing from public speakers now. I'll save my questions for afterwards. I'll be able to speak with you afterwards. Yeah, I I have a few more comments um, regarding the staff report, and then we'll uh, turn it back over to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, in September, let's see, we covered that. Um, so I'm going to talk about the um, process of, of putting a ban in place and the Coastal Commission staff perspective in the local coastal program amendment process. Um, the staff report mentioned two cities as examples where um, major limits have been placed on short-term rentals. Um, one is San Francisco, which only allows permanent residents to rent units as short-term rentals, and Santa Monica, where only home sharing is allowed. Um, that's where re um, the resident remains on site with the guests. Both these cities have registration and tax requirements. Um, so those are some different options compared to what the city staff presented to the council in, back in September. And considering whether to enact a ban in Malibu, it's important to note that where the city has taken actions that may be considered to legitimize short-term rentals, it may be more difficult to enact a ban Examples of actions are the collection of transient occupancy tax, or TOT, establishing the registration program for TOT, and then agreements with short-term rental platforms, um, which Malibu has these things. From a procedure standpoint, to enact a ban, the city would need to complete a number of steps. Um, an ordinance uh, banning short-term rentals would need to be drafted and um, the council would need to set a date for short-term rentals to cease as part of that drafting process. Um, public hearings would need to be conducted and then the ordinance would need to be adopted. Um, notice would need to be provided to all short-term rental operators. Um, additional code enforcement staff would need to be hired um, to help with enforcement of the ban and then a, a monitoring program with host compliance would need to be created to help monitor um, enforcement of the ban. Due to the nature of vacation rental booking, staff would recommend um, incorporating a six month amortization type of period um, after the ordinance is adopted before it actually goes into effect. In conjunction with the ordinance to ban short-term rentals, a, um, the ban would also need to be processed with a local coastal program amendment. In general, when uses of property are changed by an ordinance, an LCP amendment would be required. The city attorney advises that to enact a ban or certain significant changes to the short -term rent, our current short-term rental use, an LCP amendment would be needed. Certain ordinances regulating existing use, creating procedures and limiting impacts would not need an LCP. Um, amendment, um, such as the ordinance that we discussed back in September of 2018. At that time, um, we did not see the need for an LCP amendment. Um, on the other hand, Coastal Commission staff believes that all regulations limiting or banning short-term rentals um, would constitute a change in use and therefore would require an LCP amendment. Coastal staff um, expressed support for Malibu's uh, draft amendment back or ordinance back in uh, September of 2018 but they have stated that in general, they would oppose a ban on short-term rentals because they feel it's um, inconsistent with the Coastal Act. Um, in looking at short-term rental regulations, coastal staff looks at visitor accommodations and other issues within a city in order to determine what kind of limits on short-term rentals would be consistent with the Coastal Act. There are a great variety among cities. For example, Santa Monica has around 41 hotels and over 4,200 um, hotel rooms 
whereas Malibu has about six hotels and an RV park, so that's about 130 rooms and 175 RV or campsites. So it's hard to say um, one approach might work in one city um, and also in another city if those types of circumstances are so different. Um, in terms of a procedure for an LCP amendment for a complete ban, the city would need to um, adopt the resolution to initiate the LCP amendment. So far, we've only um, adopted an initiation for the zoning ordinance, which we've, we've done uh, last year. We need to draft the LCP amendment, um, review the amendment with Zeresis, and then together with the ordinance, um, present that to the Planning Commission and then present it to City Council for adoption and ultimately submit the LCP amendment to the Coastal Commission for certification. So that's, that's a little overview of um, what's involved with enacting a ban and um, the LCP amendment process. And then um, the city attorney is gonna speak about the other information you asked about other cities and litigation. Thank you, Bonnie. Trevor? Sure, council members, uh, a couple of things just to touch on. One of the most important points that we're gonna be dealing with here is whether an LCP amendment is gonna be needed. And that's gonna depend on what type of ordinance you put forward, if any ordinance. And there are two important cases out there right now that are that are working their way through the courts dealing with this issue. The first one is out of Del Mar. And in that case, the city proposed an LCP amendment that would have allowed short-term rentals, but only for a maximum of 28 per year and with a seven-day minimum rental. And the Coastal Commission said, uh, no, that's not good enough. You need the minimum will have to be three days and you have to allow 100 days per year. And Del Mar disagreed with that, they sued over this issue and that's working its way through the courts. We don't have a resolution about it at this point, but that's working its way through. Another um, case that's working through the courts is in Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara, they don't allow short-term rentals on their books, but as a practice over, over a um, significant period of time, they were allowing short-term rentals with a business license and they were allowing most zones unless there were a number of complaints about these. So, they did allow it as an interpretation of their code. And then uh, a couple of years ago, they decided that actually it's not allowed under their code and they decided to increase their enforcement efforts significantly and go after these, these uh, short-term rentals and saying it's not an allowed use under the code. And they were sued by an individual there and um, that individual was successful at the trial court level. And they, the court found that that was actually needed to go through an LCP amendment because it was a change of use because of how that um, code had been interpreted over um, a period of time. That case is being appealed. It's still in the works, so we don't have firm resolution on that issue. As Bonnie discussed, sort of the things that are looked at uh, by the Coastal Commission and the courts in this situation is whether you're changing from your current use to your current practice of what's going on. The farther you depart from what's happening there, the greater the obligation to have an LCP amendment is gonna come into play. Um, other issues that they're gonna deal with besides this, uh, whether you need an LCP amendment or not, that's unresolved at this point in time, um, are dealing with the, the basically the obligations that you may put onto a, to some of these booking platforms such as, Air, such as Airbnb or HomeAway. One um, city that you, most people here are probably familiar with is Santa Monica. In Santa Monica, they only allow home sharing under their ordinance. And that means their, their definition of home sharing is having somebody, basically you, it's your permanent residence and that you're there and somebody else comes and stays with you. And they also put a number of obligations onto the, uh, the booking agencies and those in the, uh, that includes collecting and remitting TOT and then also uh, disclosing listing information and booking information as required by a subpoena. They're a charter city and they had a subpoena process they would use to get information from the uh, booking agencies about individual properties. Also, uh, the way it works for them is that if they're gonna process any transactions, the only ones that they're allowed to process are ones for basically registered home sharing listings. They have a list of these and the the platform's only allowed to, to uh, process and collect a fee if the, if the listing that they're processing is on the safe list of an approved registered location. So that was challenged by, um, in the courts. And it was challenged by um, 
an individual, uh, Rosenblatt versus City of Santa Monica, and there's also a challenge by Home Away. So there are separate lawsuits, and there are three main issues that were resolved coming out of it. One was a dormant commer cl commerce clause uh, challenge, basically saying that this was an unfair discrimination against interstate commerce, and it was found to not be such a violation. The other um, case was dealing with the Communications Decency Act, and what that act is, it came out of the early days of the internet, and it says you can't hold an internet company liable for things that are posted on websites. So if someone puts um, disparaging remarks on there, you can't go and sue Facebook or Craigslist for allowing those things to be posted online. It's an important tenet that uh, the internet companies have held on to, and so actually they have been working to put this into some of our trade agreements um, as a basis of protecting their, the way that they do business. And what the court found on that issue was that, it is that Santa Monica's ordinance did not violate the Communications Decency Act, and it said basically because it wasn't restricting what could be posted, it just said they couldn't process and collect a fee unless it was on an approved list. And by reaching into that city and getting money from basically doing that transaction, they could prohibit that, but they couldn't prohibit the actual listing on the website. And the other challenge was a First Amendment challenge, and it was decided this was not regulating, this was not speech, and because of that, uh, the ordinance was held on that basis as well. It was not challenged, uh, there's not been a ruling on whether it violates, whether it needs an LCP or a CDP, since Santa Monica does not have a local Im implementation plan adopted, whether it needs a CDP for that. But since Santa Monica, the courts have determined that they have kept a ban in place since at least 1988. Um, it could be, it's likely that it would be seen as um, their home sharing ordinance would be codifying what they already were allowing previously, not a change of use um, in the coastal zone. And if anything, it would be allowing ex some extra home sharing. And as Bonnie mentioned, home sharing and short-term rentals have been seen by the Coastal Commission as an access issue, providing access to the coast. It would have been allowing more access. The city is allowed to adopt items that are um, more supportive of the coastal life policies um, outside of an LCP. So if there are further questions about those cases, but those are some of the, the I guess, highlights of the current litigation that we have out there right now. Is, and if we have an ordinance or what you propose, we'll provide further analysis about what would need to be done or any issues we could be running into. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. Uh, could I ask for a brief clarification on yeah. one thing from sure. Trevor? Trevor, could you uh, maybe explain what the IMLA is and the uh, CSAC? And then that was the supporting agencies, which are attorneys and uh, counties which codified much of what was done in Santa Monica, used in the case in Santa Monica, and um, subject to your expressions from Christie, that it was successful. And if you could also um, just give us a little clarity on that and the quasi-nature that the um, home rental firms called the Coastal Commissions Act and, and holding us, us forward on an LCP. I, I know it's tough, but it's in there, and if you could clarify it, then I don't have to, because I'd rather hear it from you. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the, the clarification you're looking for, but um, the the Municipal Lawyers Association, uh, I think your firms are uh, part of it, and the, the other one is the California one, and those all those collective attorneys firms made an opinion, and that was also followed through on the ruling in Santa Monica. It was supported by a great many. Uh, Communities lawyers, and it was the the CSAC, and that's the county one, and there are 450 members of that. And then um, also the last thing, if I'll, maybe I'll wait till later when we get deeper into it, was the the nature of which the home away firms um, predicated their presence and their um, opposition to any ban or any restrictions. Uh, using the Coastal Commission as a quasi-effective, uh, in a quasi-effective nature. So what I'm trying to say is they're going to challenge that. And if they're saying it in their drafts, um, I think it's pages 11 through 15, maybe you could, when you get a moment, we'll come back to you and you could give us an opinion of that because that weighs heavily on their future. Okay, I think you're referring to the, the briefs that were submitted in that case in support of the, of the city's decision. 
That's correct. Those briefs were important, I believe, because they were all, all the briefs that were presented were adopted and utilized in the, in the defense of Santa Monica. Yeah, I mean, the, the history there was, um, was originally there was a prohibition in Santa Monica about even advertising on there, and they're trying to hold the, the home away and Airbnb uh, liable for uh, criminal citations for just publishing the advertising. They ended up moving off of that, and then they switched to this new system where they would, instead of punishing them for advertisement, uh, they were moving to just requiring them to only process transactions um, that were on the approved list in that situation. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm going to come back and okay. ask, and then we'll get in a little deeper. And I'm sorry, Mayor, I just I thought that was important. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have over two hours of public comments at three minutes per speaker, uh, or in some cases you have additional minutes from other people here. May I suggest we take a brief recess, uh, not more than 10 minutes, and we'll come back and begin with public comments. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, again, we have over two hours of public comments, so let's not lose time in between speakers. I'll call up five at a time, and if you can, maybe come sit in the front row so that we can move through, the, through these. Our first speaker is Rosemary Sampson, followed by Diana Klein, followed by Antoinette Berger, followed by, I'm sorry, Is it some, I don't know what the first name is, last name Gulliston? Okay, thank you. Begin. My name is Rosemary Sampson, and I'm a resident of Cottontail Lane in Western Malibu. Honorable council members, yesterday I emailed you a link to the Economic Policy Institute's report entitled The Econ Economic Costs and Benefits of Airbnb, written, and it was updated January of uh, this year, written by the economic uh, macroeconomist Josh Bivens about the costs and benefits of Airbnb. It included six pages of research notes and end notes and references. Please read this report in its entirety before making any decisions regarding short-term rental. Financial benefits our zoning changes. The summary of the report, which is this report here, says analysis shows that the cost of Airbnb expansion to renters and local jurisdictions likely exceed the benefits to travelers and property owners. It says, thus there is no reason policymakers should reverse long-standing regulatory decisions simply to accommodate the rise of a single company or companies. So therefore, they do not suggest that Airbnb is a plethora for all the things that might happen. I had other notes here, but since I've again been reminded of what was in the financial report there and about the Coastal Commission and a few other things, what I really don't understand, and most of the people that I know don't understand, is why when you have a zoning law, which we know are enforceable by past history, lots of it, why do we have to even or have an ordinance about shard term rentals because you have turned a private home into a commercial entity in a residential zoned area. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I just want to announce that as public comments have begun, we will be taking no more speaker slips on this item. Okay, our next speaker is Diana Klein, followed by Antoinette Berger, followed by, I, I, I'm so sorry, Ernie Gulliston? Thank you. Um, and then Sue Peck. Thank you. I was going to start uh, speaking, by the way. Hello, council members. Thank you for letting me talk every time you have this issue. But I was really surprised to hear the report that this gentleman gave that the city has a chance to make $17 million over 10 years in this endeavor. And I'm thinking, I'm a businesswoman. I've owned a business 25 years in Malibu. All of you know, I think I'm a pretty sharp cookie, and I wouldn't throw away $17 million. This is the third time I've spoken about this issue. At what point does the city council understand that the majority of the community, I believe, wants and needs the opportunity to help their neighbors earn money and stay in Malibu when their houses have burned down and the hotels are four and six hundred dollars per night. Most of the Airbnbs are under three hundred dollars per night. I personally helped three of my friends' families where their homes burned down to the ground to find Airbnb properties to move into in Malibu because they didn't want to leave Malibu. At this point, why don't you just leave well enough alone? Let the people that do Airbnb continue it. Let the city continue making great profits on those rentals and if a certain house, one certain house or 10 certain houses causes any problem, 
they should either be greatly fined, huge fines like $5,000 a night or whatever, and not be able to continue renting that property. Those types of regulations could easily be implemented. Believe me, if people are going to incur a big fine, they will ensure that their Airbnb tenant follows every rule that you guys make. That would be an ideal situation. Fine any landlord that causes any problem with their neighbor or their community. Those fines would be more than enough to pay any person who implements the rules or needs to implement the rules. My daughter used Airbnb before the fire. It was additional to her income so she could continue living in Malibu with the prices that were here. Well, in the fire, she had two homes and three of her guest houses, which was her main source of income, burn. And eventually, she's trying to rebuild. And it got a construction loan. It's not going to be enough to pay the loan without additional income from Airbnb. So please consider the people that have and need that income to rebuild the properties that they had burned. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Antoinette Berger. Then Ms. Gulliston, Sue Peck, and then Martha Fling. Good evening. Um, I do Airbnb, and I have never had any complaints since 1989 when I first moved here. And I live next to a big celebrity, world known, world renowned, never one complaint because I go with Airbnb that tells the people they have to be quiet, they have to be clean. I mean, it's amazing. And I'm against these party houses. That's what you guys have to really be firm about. These big firms in New York and back east, they come in here, they buy mansions, and they have these wild parties. I wouldn't want to live next to anything like that. I wouldn't want crazy people next door to me making noise, disturbing the neighbors. Anyway, I get mostly Pepperdine parents they're respectful, they're quiet, they invite me over to Pepperdine, which is wonderful, for grandfather's, grandmother's day. And uh, five of the people that I've had, five of my customers have purchased property in Malibu. That's better than just going to the local store and just buying a Coke or a dinner. I mean, that's something else. Ah. Anyway, all I wanna say is, make the right decisions, weed out the people that are bad, find them two times, two warnings, that's it. They screw up, get rid of them. No more rentals like that that disturbs the neighbors. You want all the neighbors to get along. I wanna get along with everybody here. And I want the people I have to have respect for everybody, and they do, because I screen them, Airbnb screens them. There's Home Away, Flip Key, uh, the other, Companies, they don't tell them anything. So the people come here and party, they think they could raise hell in Malibu. Well, that's not the case. Stick with Airbnb and get rid of the rest of them. And the party house is out. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gulliston, could, could you pronounce your name for us? Emine Gudistan. Thank you. Amy, more easy, baby. Dear Mayor, dear City Council Member, ladies and gentlemen, I, have, uh, I am Emine Guristan one more time. I have been living in Malibu for a long time, almost 25 years, big rock. Due to, uh, due to financial limitation, there has not been much invested into the community. Malibu is not enough green to stop moving hills and visually there is eyesore everywhere. Since we have so many dead and dry vegetation, brush, we are very susceptible to fire. Many, many years, still no main, uh, no main sewage line and system. I have to use still septic tanks. Short story, we need Airbnb tax money to make life better in Malibu. Thank you so much, have a good night. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Sue Peck, I see five minutes. Let's make sure. Randy Turtle, are you here? 
And Doug Carroll, are you here? Okay, thank you, Sue, five minutes. Okay. Mayor and honorable city council members, my name is Sue Peck, and I've lived in Malibu as a full-time resident since the late 60s. I attended the recent subcommittee meeting to consider the financial impact of banning short-term rentals and provided a brief statement. I provided testimony to the Planning Commission and the City Council about my short-term rental program and why it works and is a win-win situation for my long-term tenants, our visitors, short-term, and our city. I understand the concerns raised about party houses and entire apartment buildings used as makeshift hotels. I'm opposed to these types of abuses and I support the city's efforts to put a stop to it. That said, I believe that the complete ban of short-term rentals in single family and multifamily units ignores the benefits of a properly run short-term rental program. My short-term rentals are carefully selected. The tenants are properly vetted. We have a written contract. The rules are both explained and enforced. There's no noise, there's no parties, and our tenants are courteous. We provide on-site gated parking and have staff available to handle any issue that arises 24 hours a day. The buildings where I maintain a small percentage of short-term rentals are all located in an area currently zoned for either multifamily or commercial. Accordingly, the neighborhood character is unaffected. There's a real benefit from short-term rentals to my long-term tenants, too. The rental fees from the short-term stays help pay for building maintenance and other expenses that would otherwise result in higher rents to long-term tenants. And as we saw from the financial analysis presented this evening from there's a definite benefit to the city from short-term rentals in the transient occupancy tax previously we supported the concept of allowing a limited number of rental units per multifamily building as part of the short-term rental ordinance with a minority of multifamily units offered for short-term rentals, Malibu's community character remains the same. I support the permit application requirements in the draft ordinance that owners will need to comply with to get a short-term rental permit. I continue to believe that short-term rentals result in benefits to multifamily buildings and are an asset to the city. I have successfully paired long and short-term rentals in multifamily buildings year round. I have a long and successful track record without any complaints over a decade in Malibu. I asked the city to allow owners of multifamily multiple buildings to allow short-term rentals but limit the number per building and I urge the city to adopt an ordinance allowing this type of responsible short-term rentals to continue and possibly even consider the physical location of buildings with regard to currently multifamily and commercially zoned properties. I appreciate your time and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna read the next several names and if you could come to the front, Martha Fling, Jill Van Vibrock, 
Kyle Wolf, Ted Vale, and I believe this is Kim Jin. Thank you. Hello, I'm Martha Fling. As you know, I've lived here all my life, um, so I know a thing or two about community character. I support short-term rentals. I do not support corporations coming in, running a Barbie house, as was the recent one on Airbnb. But when you think about the fact that the income that we are now getting from short-term rentals is so significant, and we're just focusing just on the results, on the, the financial impact of the Woolsey fire. When you think about the fire this morning, I was getting texts from and calls from the East Coast of everybody thinking that was imminently coming to Malibu. It could happen. We could have another Woolsey fire tonight, tomorrow, next week. And so there's a tremendous uh, fiscal impact that we're going to experience from that. And it would be really reckless of the city to disregard this type of income that we're now getting from the short-term rentals. I think that you really need to address the bad actors. I think you should definitely make it so that corporations cannot come in and just do this to a community. I think perhaps there are some neighborhoods, Malibu Road, that can't sustain a short-term rental. Um, but basically, you know who the bad actors are. But by and large, it's been really a boon to this community. And when you think about it, I mean, I've had people come in, and their families, and I vet them, and there are contracts, and there are consequences if somebody doesn't behave. They get booted off, at least with Airbnb. They are blocked from the system. You can have them blocked because of bad behavior. But honestly, my neighbors all have Airbnbs. Many of them do. And it's never bothered me, and I don't think I've bothered them. So I think that you have the ability to put in a permitting process. You can make some income from that. Set rules and regulations. Fine the bad actors significantly and then boot them off. And I don't understand why we're still arguing about this. But honestly, the income that we get from short-term rentals, given the hazards that we're facing now with these increased fires, they're happening more and more, they're more intense, we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a procedural question about this speaker slip I just received. Uh, uh, yes, Mayor, so that speaker was for public comments not on the agenda, which was item 2A. He thought the meeting started at 6.30, so the council can make a decision if you wanna hear his testimony on items not on the agenda. Council, we have one speaker slip. I have no problem if we want to hear it now. Others? Jefferson? I'm fine with it, too. Mikey? Okay. Je Rick? Yeah, but at the end of all the people on this item. Okay, at the end of this item, we will hear this speaker on item 2A. Are, are we okay with that? I am. We, yeah, well, we hear it after the decision is made on this item, so we can do it before the final two items. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your patience, Joe DeMore. Okay, uh, Jill Van Vibrock. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Kyle Wolf, Ted Vale, Kim Jin. Van Zebrook, thank you. Honorable Mayor and distinguished council members, my name is Jill Van Zebrook. I've been in the community association management industry for over 30 years with experience in homeowner association management and legislative affairs in the state of California. I've been working with the homeowners association in the city of Oxnard. And for the last four months, I have been working with city council and economic and housing development committees and uh, planning commission and the city attorneys. That is um, where the Greenfield matter took place um, with uh, Mandalay Shores. And the city of Oxnard is in the throes of putting together their own STR ordinance right now. And their ordinance had absolutely um, no language in there protecting multifamily residential property lines like homeowners associations. I am the general manager for the Zuma Bay Villas, a community of 90 condominiums overlooking Zuma Beach. And I'm here to applaud the council and staff 
for having the forethought and insight to provide language that protects multifamily condominium developments when it comes to city STR regulations and these permits. Because I can tell you from firsthand experience that that is not the case in many coastal communities. So I was very happy to read the ordinance and I'm here to make sure that you're not going to waver from that contrary to what um, Ms. Peck's position may be with regard to multifamily buildings. The Zuma Bay Villa members and their board ask me to stand before you to make sure that the current ordinance as it pertains to homeowners associations that are referenced in section 17.55.10 item I and multifamily units in section 17.5530 not be amended or changed in any way to allow STRs in communities whose development is not conducive to this type of use and would adversely affect the quality of life of the residents living there. Their homeowners association dues goes for roads and infrastructure, all those costs that are paid through their assessments and are not a burden to the city. Their gated communities, their, their quiet communities, and we would ask that you not make any changes to the ordinance and keep it the way it is and thank you for protecting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Wolf, followed by Ted Vale followed by Kim Jin, followed by John Mazza. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Kyle Wolf. Um, I'm representing a few families here that have lived in Malibu for combined over 200 years. Um, a lot of the meetings were to become a city were in one of my client's homes. Um, I can tell you they all agree that we should not ban short-term rentals. Um, as And a couple of my friends are business owners. And they say since the fires, they wouldn't be able to keep their doors open without the short-term rentals. We would lose a couple businesses here um, that have been here for many, many years. Um, and let's see. so I just want to let you guys know that, yeah, the people that, that live here for a long time, are they are for it. So, thank you. Thank you. Ted Vale, Kim Jin, John Mazza. John Stiegler. Ted Vale, 45-year resident and a member of the board of the Big Rock Mesa Property Owners Association. Just wanted to say that we support regulating and limiting short-term rentals. Uh, the city doesn't get much respect, and the citizens don't get much respect from the 16 million or whatever it is people who come by. We don't get much respect from the sheriff's office either. Uh, Hans Letts just, uh, just uh, posted this, LA County Sheriff's uh, officials failed to notify Malibu City officials about the Sepulveda Pass fire as it broke out in the middle of the night. They learned about it from a reporter's call two hours after it started burning, and they didn't notify Malibu about closing PCH. We pay these people, they have to do better, or we fire them. Uh, and also respect, I'm tired of the traffic, uh, people, uh, racing down the coast highway to get to the valley to watch Fox News and passing me by. Uh, rehab houses, uh, promises uh, got bankrupt and they left Malibu, they left Big Rock. However, Cliffside burned down, so what did they do? They, come to, they came to Malibu and they are in the promises houses in Big Rock. Uh, now short-term rentals. Um, I've, I've uh, had a short-term rental down in San Diego, birthday party. And uh, uh, there was a manager on the premises. We had to check in with him to get the key. We had to check out, and that worked fine. Uh, I think that you absolutely need to have uh, either the owner or a full-time manager at, on the property uh, if you're going to have short-term rentals. You've got to stop these parties. Uh, I saw an ad for Malibu Barbie. I had a nice pink house. Uh, come to Malibu and, and play like Malibu Barbie. Got to stop this. So thank you. And well, one other comment. Uh, you uh, expect $10 million from FEMA to uh, pay you back for the uh, Woolsey fire. Well, the Trump administration has not paid El Paso half a million dollars for the security they had to put up for that. Don't count on getting anything from FEMA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is 
sorry, I'm reading from the signature at the bottom, Kim Jin, John Mazza, John Stiegler, and then Mark Maniscalco. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Kyo Jin. I have been very happy resident of Great City of Malibu, and I've been the promoter of Malibu without getting any pay from anybody. Malibu is a great place. I have lived here 26 years, and I want to thank the City Council for conducting this hearing to see what your citizens are saying. I'm delighted that I'm here. I serve on the LA County Commission on Older Adults, former vice president of that. In fact, this coming Thursday, I'll be going to Sacramento to attend the, the uh, CSL, Citizens Seniors Legislature Assembly Member. I've just been elected as House Assembly Member, and I will be speaking on behalf of senior citizens of, of LA County before so that we can make recommendation to state legislature as well as federal legislature. I served for the Father Bush administration in VA because I want to thank United States of America for what they've done to Korea. As you can see, I'm from Korea, but I'm a proud American citizen. There, I, it was my responsibility to teach total quality management, meaning you satisfy your customer first time and every time, and you do the right things first time and every time. 1992, President Bush gave out 14 federal uh, awards for service to the community. Out of that, we received four. Secretary Duinsky used to call me Dr. Jin. After that, he called me Dr. TQM. I believe what you're doing is trying to satisfy customer of Malibu. That's what makes America uh, Malibu great city. I have been operating Airbnb for the last six years. To this date, I haven't had, had one complaint from anybody because I believe in satisfying my customer. My neighbor is my customer. I never allow any party. For they, if they come ask me, they say they're gonna have a birthday party. How many people gonna come? How many car gonna come? What time to what time you gonna have a party? And what is your budget? When I mention budget, they back out. Because if they're gonna disturb my neighbor, I'm not gonna host them. That's why I believe if one is doing the job, then I don't think you should penalize them. What was that? Thank you. Oh, that was my time. Yes. Okay, I hope one final comment. While you might have some problem. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, public comments are limited to three minutes. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is John Mazza. If you could all come up to the front and be ready, followed by John Stiegler, Mark Maniscalco, yeah. Andy Gombiner, Gombiner, Richard Lawrence. You ready? Uh, this is very hard to do in three minutes. You know, it's very complicated. I've sent you a series of emails that try to give you some information to make this simpler. But first I want to read Council Policy 15. The, the general welfare of the city's residents shall always be considered as primary to any special interest or any individual or group or individuals. The people count. Now we're losing our residents. We burned out 20% of them. Airbnbs are growing at 40% a year. Now, one of the prior speakers says, oh, gee, our businesses want Airbnbs. No, they want permanent residents to shop all year round, not seasonal residents for, to keep them to, to survive. Now, um, what's happened with Airbnbs? It's lowered our school population. We're down, down to eight-man football. We're down, down to mid 500 people in the high school, 360 in elementary school. We we're going to lose our schools, okay? And it's not all Airbnb, but a lot of it is. Our housing stock is disappearing because the people who got burned out could not find a place to rent. Uh, 
our neighborhoods are being disrupted. Now, some people say I'm a great, great tenant, but gee, we have people coming here to tell you hey, they're horrible tenants, some people. Uh, and we need to do something. Now, obviously, a group of a lot of us want to ban it, but we want to make it happen, and we want to make it happen now. So we're willing to accept uh, compromises like, like Santa Monica has, where Sue Peck can be taken care of, 20% of her apartment can be taken care of, even though the city attorney says they are not allowed outside of the residential zone, for sure. Now, we have a, a Santa Monica has passed an ordinance. Our city attorney wrote a brief for this California League of Cities in favor, justifying every issue in that ordinance, and won. Okay? It's a reasonable ordinance. It has enforcement. Now, you're talking about this financial report. I don't know what they want to college, but you don't take the CPI and count it in Malibu as to how things grow. Now, um, we, so we, what we need to do is pass this quickly, get it, get it enforced before next, December, next summer, and we also need to realize that we aren't poor. We're a rich city. We're not going to run out of money. We went 20 years without Airbnbs, and we didn't lose our balance. Now, the reason we don't have money in this study is we aren't collecting our TOT taxes. I sent you references to how we're not collecting. We've, Airbnb alone said they collected $40 million in 2017. Where's our $4.6 million? Thank Collect you. it, and you'll have the money. Thank you. Next up, John Stiegler, just one moment, followed by Mark Manis. Calco, Andy Gombiner, Richard Lawrence, followed by Carol Hahn. If you could all come up and be ready to speak. Thank you. Council members, um, I thought it would be a good place to start would be at the beginning. And what brought us all here were complaints, nuisance complaints from the residents. So I, um, I went onto the city website and I looked up the uh, short-term rental, and that they, have a, they have two numbers listed. One is to, to lodge a nuisance complaint. One is a daytime number, and one is an after-hours number. So last night I called the after-hours number, and the lady answered the phone right away. She was uh, experienced. She, she had worked for the city uh, as experience, and had a conversation uh, with her. I told her that I'm coming here tonight, and that I wanted to get a, get a feel from what, uh, what, what happens when somebody makes a complaint. She says, well, we, I take the information and then I send it on to code enforcement. I said, well, okay, well, I'm just curious, since, since, since uh, after the fire, year to date, you know, have you had a lot of complaints? And she says, you know, I have not had, you know, there, there have not been a lot of complaints. And, uh, you know, I mentioned to her I'm on Cliffside and she said, yeah, no, absolutely nothing on Cliffside or Burview. And so that, that was, we, we had a little conversation, uh, and then that ended. So then this morning I spoke, I called the during business number, and the gentleman answered the phone, and uh, very knowledgeable, had the same kind of conversation, and uh, he mentioned that, uh, again, uh, that in the, in the Point Doom area, very little, com no complaints, that he mentioned that there were two, uh, two homes that were having problems, whereas at Broad Beach, and the other one is uh, Rambla Pacifica. We talked a little bit about that, and he said, you know, he said, you know, just some people just don't want to follow the rules. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And, um, and uh, so I, uh, then, then I called up uh, uh, the, the, the previous uh, lead, uh, Malibu lead from the Sheriff's Department. He no longer is our lead, but I wanted to get his, his feeling on it. And he says, you know, John, uh, in all those years that I that I uh, responded to uh, problems with parties, he says, you know, I, the problem is, is that it was very ambiguous to be able to, to issue a citation. Uh, there's a lot of dis issues there with sound levels and, and the, the, the people would then be quiet and they'd come back and all this back and forth. And he, then he said, you know, once once we did did make a vial, uh, a, a, a citation, he said, don't quote me on this, but the fees were too low. The, the, the fines for these violations weren't enough to, um, uh, to, to outweigh the revenue that was being produced. So uh, I wanted to, you know, I think that, 
it's important to see. Now, now if I, I mentioned I called the city a week ago and I, I said, by the way, could you bring that information so council could look at where are we? We had so much, so many, so much dis discussion about this over the last uh, a year, two years. You know, has there been an impact just by us talking about it that the people that are doing short term rental have they changed their ways? Okay. Um, next, next thought is non resident. Um, I think that the non-resident needs to be re, re, uh, re, um, redefined. I think there's many, many families here that, that thank God their parents had the foresight to buy in Malibu and th they've inherited these homes. They're part of the fabric of Malibu. They keep these homes by being able to do short-term rental to, so the family can have use of the home. And I think that uh, the uh, th these 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 families don't reside in the homes. They have no violations. They handle it well. They've done it for years, and they should not. They should be able to rent that uh, year round. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, Mark Maniscalco, Andy what? Gombiner, Richard Lawrence, Carol Hahn, Larry Stuffy. My name is Mark Maniscalco, and I own a four-unit building on Malibu Road. <clears throat> I used to rent an apartment on Malibu Road years ago, so I understand the arguments on both sides. As an owner, you understand how much money it takes to keep up an oceanfront apartment building, how vacancies can get you in trouble, good tenants and bad tenants, and how much property taxes can slow you down. This is something I could never understand as a renter. I run my building in a very unique way. One of my units serves as my primary residence. One unit is rented out on a yearly basis to a local Malibu business owner and the other two are yours used as short-term rentals. I've been doing this for just over three years and I've never had one problem, one party, or one neighborhood complaint. In fact, I actually had more neighborhood complaints with my previous long-term tenants, which is the reason why I switched to short-term rentals. I closely watch who rents my units, how many people are on site, and I have a property manager that checks people in and out. I would like to touch on a few other points other than the obvious financial impact of TOT taxes listed in the outside third-party report. No one seems to bring up how much extra revenue is brought into the city besides TOT taxes with short-term rentals. This is something an outside firm cannot estimate, as they said. Only someone who operates a short-term rental can understand. Each of my guests come from affluent families and spend $700 or more at Ralph's, $500 or more at local restaurants, and hire local yoga and massage therapists at $150 an hour. Hardly any guests ever cook, and they always go out to eat in Malibu for two to three meals a day. This revenue comes in with tourists and is continual. I leave a booklet of coupons and advertisements to local Malibu businesses inside each unit to support local commerce. I see a massage table or private yoga instructors at my building almost every other day during the summer and winter. I have a local cleaning woman that lives in Malibu who cleans my units five to 10 times a week, depending on rentals. Without short-term rentals, none of this business or jobs would ever exist. We live in a city where burger joints go out of business in less than a year. Restaurants close early, Uber Eats and DoorDash always time out because we have no drivers, and we don't have enough population to keep a movie theater open. We need these tourists to keep the people to keep up the slack and keep the Malibu economy going. During the Woosley fires last year, short-term rentals were an instrumental part to the local Malibu residents affected by the fires so they could stay near their homes near the tragedy. For three months after the fires, I had multiple residents stay at my property while they were waiting for their property to be livable again. This was an amazing alternative to a hotel in the valley since the Malibu hotels could never support the demand of a natural disaster, nor would any insurance company pay their absorbent rates. All of these fire victims were extremely grateful for Malibu short-term rentals, and I signed a long-term lease with one of them. There is no logical explanation to ban short-term rentals in Malibu. Many of the super hosts like myself are dedicated to their buildings and properties. If you look at photos from multifamily buildings 10 years ago, they were all in disrepair and needed lots of work. Since we are so reliant on five-star reviews, every multifamily building on Malibu Road has seen some type of facelift or upgrade. We have a safe system in place that benefits everyone. There should be laws in place for those who violate the noise, excess amounts of people, or illegally built units. You should treat these violators with simple rules when, when someone who starts building without a permit. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Next up, Andy Gombiner, Richard Lawrence, Carol Hahn, Larry Steppe, Joanne Gary has five minutes. Good evening. I strongly oppose any type of ban on short-term rentals in Malibu. I've owned my multifamily property on Malibu Road for over 30 years and lived in it until I needed to move for family reasons. I have a property manager who lives nearby to ensure that my property and visitors are closely monitored. I permit no more than two people per bedroom. I do not allow parties or events, 
and only confirmed guests are allowed at the property. In the three years I have rented out my apartments on a short-term basis, I have not received a single complaint from any of my neighbors. While a ban on STRs would have a terrible financial impact on me and my family, the effect on the city's finances would be a disaster. The projections prepared by Raptalis show a ban, even a partial ban, will over time completely deplete the city's general fund. And this does not even take into consideration the loss of tax revenue generated by STR guests who currently spend plenty of money in the Malibu businesses. Imagine the dire consequences of a natural disaster coupled with a depleted general fund. Additionally, the city's significant borrowing costs would, uh, would uh, rise with the downgraded credit rating it would receive due to depleted reserves, thus further exacerbating the city's financial problems. While there are clearly a few property owners who do not respect their neighbors, we should not overreact with a ban of any kind. On October 18, 2019, I spoke to the city's senior code enforcement officer, Doug Clevenger, who fields complaints related to SDRs. He stated the following. He received approximately five complaints over the last 12 months related to SDRs. Only a very small number of unpermitted special events or parties are related to SDRs. And within all of Malibu, there are two houses that receive repeated complaints of excessive cars on the street and or noise. I also spoke last Friday with Deputy Bonelli at the Lost Hills Sheriff Station, who confirmed that it's really only a few houses that are responsible for the majority of STR complaints. So why is the city considering to punish us all because of a few bad apples. In addition, placing a limit on the number of SDRs per multifamily property is fine within reason, but simply picking an arbitrary percentage as a one-size-fits-all limitation would have differing impacts depending on the size of the building. For instance, placing a 25% limit on STRs would allow a 40-unit building to have 10 STRs, while a three-unit building wouldn't be allowed any. This would be an unfair, unintended consequence. I urge the council to oppose any type of ban on STRs and to direct staff to dra draft an ordinance that will preserve our city's strong finances while not placing financial burdens on property owners who manage their, who properly manage their short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Richard Lawrence, then Carol Hahn, Larry Steppe, Joanne Gary, and Graham Clifford. Hello, I'm Richard Lawrence, the president of the Malibu Township Council, and I've got one basic uh, problem with the idea of short-term rentals. They're illegal. That when you commercialize private property, you're breaking the law. And that's important to me. I mean, you want to rent places? Rent them for a month or more. That's legal. The Santa Monica, uh, regulations seem to be a good idea. And I know somebody in Santa Monica who even before those regulations got nailed by the uh, city government because they were renting uh, in a four-plex uh, unit, one of their units, and uh, the neighbors just complained. It, it wasn't a big deal, but they got fined a substantial amount of money. The enforcement that nobody's talked about is non-existent, unless all of you are going to go out and, uh, you know, drop in on short-term rentals and whatever. It just doesn't, doesn't add up to me. The other thing that really doesn't add up to me as a business owner for 43 years is to deal with anybody who is not accountable on an audit. That Airbnb gives you all kinds of money. Last year we were told it was 1.4 million. Now it's 2.7 million. What is it? None of you can tell me what it is because, and I'm not angry by the way, but I, I, it does bother me considerably. Uh, I'm in the middle of a, a something now that involved an audit, and uh, fortunately I had the right to do it and to see who, uh, you know, who who is correct on it. But I was under the idea, the notion, excuse me, that there's a ban on short-term rentals that the law does not say you can commercialize a home or whatever uh, to do a number of things that we're not talking about, which we won't talk about because they're just illegal. Well, so is this. So not to uh, beat this into the ground too much, um, we're for rentals if rentals are appropriate. 
I've only lived, I'm a newcomer to Malibu, only 17 years. And uh, we did live back here in 2000, uh, excuse me, in 1970, we lived here for two years. And uh, the place has really been built up and changed. Is that my time? No. Uh, in any case, love the city, uh, love living here. We'll live here hopefully till I'm not living. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next is Carol Hahn, Larry Stuppy, Joanne Gary, Graham Clifford, Ann Payne. Hello, Mayor and Council members. My name is Carol Hahn. I live on Latigo Shore Drive, and I have written all of you in the past about short-term short rentals and various other things. With all the facts and figures and money, graphs and charts being thrown, thrown around, um, I have a personal story about Airbnbs, which are not good. Um, I don't like short-term rentals, but I do think the city has to balance it out. I think limiting it and um, enforcing it and policing the, um, the problems is the idea. However, my human story is that on our road, we, I had a wonderful neighbor who lived in Malibu for 25 plus years. She was a Dolphin Award winner and helped us with our fire prevention program and was living in a um, attached house which had a parties all the time, large groups of people. And um, she was losing sleep and got sick and was forced out. She no longer lives here in Malibu. And that is very sad. She was a wonderful person who is no longer living in this city. Um, in Los Angeles County, as you know, in Southern California, the housing stock is um, low. The demand is high and the supply is low and a lot of Airbnbs and short-term rentals are pulling that stock from the area. Um, and that's, that's a big problem. That's what I don't like. Uh, be that as it may, I think that some of the um, previous speakers here do have a point. I think that there should be some short-term rem rentals in Malibu, but limited and enforced very strictly. The other comment I have to make is that um, to Bonnie Blue's comment earlier, where she had a statistic of the low number of hotels and um, you know places um, to stay in Malibu, I would have to say that PCH is now a hotel with all the campers along, uh, parked up and down PCH every night. It's a free parking spot for people. So it's a hotel now as I drive up and down and can't see the beach anymore. Also, one of my neighbors told me that some of these campers are now renting out their campers at, as short-term rentals. So someone has to look into that. I kid you not. But thank you very much. I hope you'll do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Larry Steppe, then Joanne Gary, Graham Clifford, Ann Payne, Scott Dietrich. Thank you for the ability to talk again this year. Larry Steppe, I've been out here for 65 years. My mom originally owned it with her family. She passed away in 1998. And because I have five brothers and sisters, and now there's 25 owners of the property, we don't allow anybody to live there full time. We do rent it out for the purpose of paying our taxes, doing our maintenance, our repairs, paying our TOTs, and all sorts of other required uh, costs. Your main problem is not banning short-term rentals. It's the lack of enforcement of your current laws. If your current laws are enforced, then you wouldn't have this big of a problem right now. That is the main issue. Even if fines for the fi continued violations of your current laws would solve the problem. We do have a manager in Malibu who's present and signs people in and out of our short-term rentals. She maintains the rentals and is always available during them. One thing I will ask is that 
if you do pass a ban, that we be granted a grandfather clause in there because we do not live at the property, although we do maintain it, because without the short-term rentals, we could not afford the taxes and everything else on our property that has been willed to us by our parents. This hearing is being heard as far away as Wisconsin. And I got one text message tonight, and it's talked about the short-term rentals, and I quote, beneficial for them to keep the rentals. It generates lots of money for the city, unquote. So thank you for listening. I know I have more time, but don't do something bad because of a few bad apples. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joanne Gary, who has five minutes as long as uh, the other people are here. Joey Goodman, could you raise your hand? Joey, I don't see him, okay. Um, Jeff Follert. Is here. Okay, so Joanne, four minutes. Good evening. I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me, emails, documents, and I'm tired of hearing uh, the sob stories about how people can't afford to live here at the expense of me and my neighbors. My basic complaint is that the city of Malibu and uh, Miss Bonnie Blue, who used the word legitimized, has legitimized short-term rentals. And our problem up in, uh, up, I'm, I'm so nervous because I'm really upset, Rambla Vista is a company that owns the property next door to me. We are about 25 feet away from this property. It is rented almost every night. There are parties on the weekend. No rules are observed. Joey's comment I'm going to read to you. He's one of my neighbors. The effects of the commercial enterprise in our residential zone has had an extremely negative impact on quality of life and neighborhood character. At present, we find ourselves without recourse. We have, as the three of us have contacted Clevenger at least 30 times, so that five times is inaccurate. We are in dire need of some form of control and or enforcement of short-term rentals and those that violate their own supposed rules. At this point, we reside next to an ill-managed commercial hotel. It has never been occupied by its owners and has strictly been used as revenue stream for Madison Group investors. And my fear, and we have all these rebuilds and uh, properties that are being bought, my fear is that there are going to be many of you living next door to hotels because there are no rules that the city has come up with to protect you. And I have a video to show you of three incidents in my neighborhood, and there were many more videos caught on rain. Okay, I'm not sure the order because wonderful Adam Moline, Molina did this for me, but um, I'll explain as I go along. Okay, this one is gonna show you the traffic and the cars parked on our narrow street on both sides. And there is restrictive parking to one side of the street. See the canyon in the back? These parties occur there are cigarette butts all over the street. That's what I tried to show you there, but I didn't. Okay, this happened uh, a week ago Saturday, a big party at the house next door to me, and somebody needs help. A drug overdose, I don't know. An ambulance, a paramedic, two fire trucks, and two sheriff vehicles. Wow, somebody has a, had a bad trip tonight arrived. Okay. And, and this is the this is my property. I'm going to just stop it and explain. And uh, I'm babysitting my grandchild and on on a Saturday morning a gentleman comes out of the rental and starts urinating in my plants next to my driveway. A woman shouts to him, 
oh no, go over there, went in the other side and urinated in my plumeria plant. Wonderful. Okay, so, and you, and you could see this, my neighbor caught it on ring. Is, Is that, that four, four minutes? minutes? How could okay. that be four minutes? Thank you. Okay, well, you get the idea. We are not protected. Our next speaker is Graham Clifford, followed by Ann Payne, Scott Dietrich, Judy Villablanca. Good evening, Mayor Karen, council members, and staff. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I hope you're not going to make a decision tonight based solely on financial considerations. Right now, we are under temporary financial stress due to Wolvesy, but it is a short-term difficulty, not something to, le to um, base long-term decisions on. <clears throat> financial difficulties can be overcome by astute budgeting, which Reva does extremely well, or borrowing. Um, our, our, our community is worth borrowing for if necessary. If in your household budget, if you need money for remodeling, you remove other expenditures to make way for, for it. I'm sure the city has many programs which could be put on hold, rec recreational programs, for instance. And um, <clears throat> Only essential programs should be funded at this time. That's a way to make up for the money that we're going to lose from um, Airbnb or whoever it happens to be. I would like to also suggest that when evaluating speaker slips on this item that you take into account Malibu residents versus non-Malibu residents. Obviously, the opinions of people who live here are more relevant to, the, to uh, your decision. Uh, this problem, as you all know, is not restricted to Southern California, it, but it is a growing national and international issue. I've just come back from Europe, and many European cities and towns are also dealing with it. Everyone operating an STR is doing so for one reason only, to make money, not to enhance or improve their neighborhoods or their communities. Um, what... What the city staff and council members do need to do is reread our mission statement, our constitution, and do everything possible to adhere to its intent. Money comes and goes, neighborhoods do not. Once they are destroyed, city infrastructure goes along with, it, with them. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Could we please hold our applause? Thank you. Ann Payne. Scott Dietrich, Judy Villablanca, Don Tollefson. Thank you, City of Malibu, for recognizing Andy Cohen's passing. I want you to know that yesterday, as the teacher, I was the kindergarten teacher for his three children. I had a wonderful meeting with each of them, and they're here. To, they're they're doing very well, and that's the result of a community. And the uh, middle son, Kevin, will be driving the Woody on the Woody Parade. So I think that's good news. We got into cityhood versus county because we wanted local control. And I know it, you know your job is local control. The consultants who came and talked about finance at the finance meeting two weeks ago on a 1 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon when not too many people could come, um, those people talked a little bit about the history, but they never mentioned that Roy Crummer's name, he had a hotel concept, a boutique hotel concept up on the Bluffs Park. Now we have, what, four or five mansions. We didn't do it. Could have been a moneymaker if we're in the money-making business. Jerry Weintraub wanted a really magnificent hotel where you could have weddings, bar mitzvahs, and so forth. Now we're going to have a cemetery. We missed that boat. Let's go into the hotel business in the commercial zones. Let's help some of our residents turn something into a place where people can actually be, and you don't have to have all those rules and regulations. The word hotel is terrific. It has luxury tax. 
it has bed tax and a lot of other taxes, and we seem to like taxes. Okay, the meeting on short-term rental for, as a fundraiser for our city was very, I thought, very hard to absorb. It is not our damage control for fires. We have properties here, good properties. Let's use the properties we have and regulate them. The difference tonight, what I've heard, is the discussion between residential and commercial. I live in a residence. I live in a residential neighborhood. I've lived in another one in Malibu as well. It is not the place for commercial gain. And I'm going to be checking my title insurance policy because I have somebody in my family who knows a lot about insurance and I, I think everybody here, all of my neighbors should be checking these title insurances and looking at what is defined as commercial and residential. And we need to be cognizant of this because I don't want to see us get into lawsuits. Further, I'd like to you to I'd like to reiterate Thank you. short term people do not support school systems. Thank you. Next is Scott Dietrich, who has four minutes as long as your other person is here, Leah Johnson. Leah, that's Thank you. Leah. Thank you, Mayor and Council. If this is really about taxes and money, why don't we just pass an ordinance that says that everything within a half mile of the ocean has to be short-term rentals? We'll make millions. But of course, the whole report on cost and taxes, it doesn't deal with the real cost. The real cost is what's happening to our neighborhoods, what's happening to our schools. Who's going to be there to put out the fire next door when you evacuate? Somebody was going to stay. Mikey stayed. Rick's son stayed. Jefferson stayed. I don't know about Karen and Skyler. I don't know if you were here or not. So I'm not, I don't, nothing against, you know. But people stay. If you're in a short-term rental, you're not going to stay. You're not going to be part of the community. Now, I've done both short-term rental between long-term tenants, and the people were real nice. And as some of the folks have said, they manage it well, so you don't have a problem. But that still doesn't deal with what's going on with our city and our neighborhood and our schools not having enough kids. So we need to have a wise, thought-out, limited short-term rental because Coastal is going to make us do it anyways. As far as enforcement goes, we need to have enforcement officers there at night on the weekend because that's when a lot of this bad stuff's going to happen and they're going to be paid for by the short-term rentals. I've sent y'all an email and outline what I thought would make sense for a short-term rental. First of all, call it what you will, the owner and or manager has to be on site. That's, that's critical, because they're not going to let bad stuff happen. Um, you don't want to have trailers, yurts, tents, that or motorhomes that they're renting out. You can only have one per property. Um, and one of the suggestions has been, okay, you have to have a permit to advertise. You have to have a permit to go on to Airbnb. And I'm suspicious that when Airbnb just hands us a check, that, well, this is what you get. Well, what about all those other 249 short-term rental organizations Maybe they don't send us the money. So maybe we're not getting all the money we should. And oh, is in terms of uh, multiple um, apartment buildings, we've got to limit that. Limit it to 10% or 20% of the units. 
um, you know, we, we've got to take back our city. And if we don't do this now, it's going to get away from us. Thank you. Next is Judy Villablanca, followed by Don Tollefson, followed by Lucille Keller, and then Craig Hill. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to echo many of the good things that I just heard Scott say. But I would like to urge the council to take action to restrict and regulate short-term rentals. To me, the real issue is not budgetary. It's not what's legal. It's not really even the noisy parties and people that break the rules. The real issue is what is the value of having neighborhoods, places where people actually live, where people know each other, where they help each other, where they care about the issues that affect our local community and where they maintain the character of our city, which is one of the main reasons that my family moved here. I think the Woolsey fire, it may have given us a deficit, but it also made it very crystal clear that neighbors need to know who lives next door and to help each other during major emergencies that we are gonna to continue to have, they're expected here. An absent owner may not even keep their house prepared for fire and might burn down the house next door because you know they don't do the things they need to do. They're not gonna be involved. And short-term occupants are not gonna participate in either protecting or building our community since they're transient. Um, and during an emergency, they might even elicit a lot more 911 calls, which I, was a huge issue during Woolsey, that people were answering all these 911 calls and couldn't put out fires in homes. I mean, if you don't know where you are and you don't know where to go and you don't know how to exit, you're just likely to cause more trouble on some of our roads that are narrow and you don't, you know, you don't know how to get out. You could be blocking the first responders coming in. I think equally as important is that we don't have sufficient rental housing for long-term people, people who work here in Malibu, like teachers, for example, who can't afford to buy a home, and those displaced by the Woolsey fire. I've heard many people say that those people were helped by short-term rentals. Well, if we had more long-term rentals, you know, many of those people would have rented for six months or a year. Nobody's house is getting rebuilt in three nights. So they need long-term rentals, um, and I would agree too. It's gonna decrease our school population because you don't have families living here, and then we're not gonna have the programs we want for our local kids because we don't have enough to run either academic programs or after-school programs. I think residents who need extra income, you can still rent your house long-term. Um, I would support short-term rentals of a primary home if the owner's present, they can rent a room, they can rent their guest house. That's a, a very different option, but you have a person living in the home. And it, I think that Santa Monica's uh, rental ordinance sounds like it's been successfully litigated. It could be implemented here, obviously, with some, uh, some changes for our city. But if we need to adjust our budget, it shouldn't be done by destroying our neighborhoods. Um, unregulated short-term rentals really have a major negative impact on our quality of life, and please don't let that happen. Thank you. Next, Don Tollefson, Lucille Keller, Craig Hill, Michael Lusted. Don Tollefson, I've owned my property since 1987. It's been a vacation rental for the past 12 years. I've never had a single complaint. Um, I, it's not hard to run a vacation rental and not have complaints. You, you just have to, to do it. And I've heard a few people up here say the same thing, that they, they haven't had complaints. If you were to have a reduction, my question is, how would you reduce it to 25% or 50% rather than uh, just to eliminate it? And that's, that's uh, something I'm curious about. I think you need to think about maybe considering something like quasi-commercial overlay zones like Pacific Coast Highway, uh, where my property is. I've got restaurants on both sides of me in near proximity across the street, both directions, it's commercial. Uh, my, my property is single family residence duplexes, but it feels pretty commercial right in there. So that's something to think about. And if you are going to do a reduction, I think it's very important. I, I heard staff say something about a six-month moratorium or something like that. You should have a gradual reduction rather than just, boom, it's over, because that, uh, it's just going to kill everybody, because it's a big setup uh, to do a vacation rental, you know, to get the furniture and the TVs and all that. And then all of a sudden, you're out of business, and then there's a bunch of vacation rentals that are now long-term rentals coming on the... Uh, uh, the market. In terms of the Coastal Commission, I think it's a real important uh, issue that you do uh, work closely with the Coastal Commission because um, I have about three vacationers on average that stay about a week. And 
I have about 40 weeks a year I'm rented. That's 120 people. And I think there's something like 500 or more vacation rentals. So when you do the numbers, that's 60,000 vacationers that come to Malibu. And it sounds like a lot, but it doesn't really matter whether they're vacationers or long-term renters. It's a body for a body. Um, and if you uh, all of a sudden say no vacation uh, rentals, then all of a sudden these thousands of people have no place to stay, at least in Malibu. And you say, well, we're not going to be elitist, but if you don't have any place for them to stay, which Malibu doesn't have much in terms of uh, housing, temporary housing, I think that the numbers are you know, a few thousand. Uh, that's something to think about. That's it? That's it. Okay. Oh, I see. You have 23 seconds. Okay. Well, the obvious thing is that uh, these vacationers, they, uh, they flood, they flood the, uh, the local economy. I mean, they go out and they, they spend a lot more money than, than long-term um, tenants, and that's not necessarily good, but it's certainly not bad. Malibu can use the income, and I think it's very important. Thank you. Okay. Lucille Keller, Craig Hill, Michael Lustig, Annie Ellis. Lucille has five minutes as long as Judy Pace is here, and Drew Ann Jacobson. Okay, thank you. I'm Lucille Keller. I have a two-parter tonight. First, uh, I'm representing my uh, Property Owners Association, La Chusa Highlands Property Owners Association. Our members are property owners in the Luchusa Highlands area of West Malibu. Our board of directors has voted to oppose short-term rentals in residential areas of Malibu. We understand that the city council voted to ban SDRs in residential zones. We support that motion. We are particularly concerned with investment corporations buying up properties only for the purpose of using them for short-term rentals. This has already started happening in our neighborhood. We're very concerned with the safety and noise issues involved in having a transient population in our midst who have no interest in the community and in particular are probably unaware of the area's vulnerability to fire. The city's primary concern should be the safety and well-being of its residents. Now I will shift to representing Walton myself. State code requires land use in Malibu to, Malibu to be consistent with the general plan, the Malibu Local Coastal Plan, and implementation program. Hotel, motel, and bed and breakfast use is shown on the LIP's chart permitted land uses as allowed only in commercial CV1 and 2 zones, not on residential property. They didn't forget that use, it's given it's, a, it's given a zoning and it's given sites. We agree with the Planning Commission. Short-term rentals are prohibited on residentially zoned property. We support the City Council's vote to ban short-term rentals in residential zones. You have a ban in place. It's been there for 25 years. STRs are banned in the, by the general plan language and the vote of both bodies. Now let's enforce it. Last year, staff said SDRs have been allowed on residential land because their interpretation is that because long-term rental is allowed, so is short-term. The uses are very different and incompatible. Long-term rental is residential use. Short-term rental is temporary, transient, commercial use. The general plan and LIP already provide a land use category and sites for short-term rentals, the commercial visitor serving zone sites now in use. Because the LIP allocates b, &B use to a specific land use zone, neither the staff nor the council can interpret allowing b, &B use in residential zones without going through an LIP amendment. Finances should not drive this decision the Malibu up for sale, guys. Whether we get the 
FEMA, what FEMA owes us or not, it, we probably will eventually we might have to hold the fire to their feet. We oppose short-term rental in any residential loan, but zone, but are especially concerned with the properties owned by corporations. If this continues, our community will become a commercial resort controlled by large corporations. You won't have any neighborhoods. You've heard from residents regarding the negative impact on them. Neighbors are replaced with steady steam of renters. Last year's fire demonstrates how important our neighbors are to our well-being. As was mentioned, you think a vacationer is going to fight and save your house in a fire? Mm -mm. The security and fire risks are much greater when there's a stream of transient tenants staying a short time who have no interest in the community. They have different interests than long-term tenants who have the same concerns as homeowners and are residents of our community, whose well-being is at the same risk as homeowners. Communities throughout the world have had bad experiences with SDRs. Let's learn from them and avoid the use altogether. There is no way to protect neighboring properties from this type of use without a responsible homeowner on site. Zoning is intended to protect properties from incompatible use. Let's use the tools at hand to avoid similar experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Craig Hill, you have four minutes as long as Chris Frost is here. And then Michael Lustig, then Annie Ellis, then Dick Gutman. Thank you. Uh, Lucille knows what she's talking about. I've been here 50 years, most of, the, most of the 50 years. The general plan is essentially our city's constitution. My memo shows how STRs violate it in multiple ways. Briefly here, they're expressly not residential as defined by the Supreme Court in the Moore decision. The court clarified that single family residential zones must be comprised of families or non-transient groups that live closely like families. SDRs are clearly not permissible uh, under the city's single family residential districts. But now we have a preemptive Ninth Circuit case upholding the Santa Monica Home Share Ordinance, which finds they are legal if they remain owner occupied. Which makes sense. If someone non transient lives there, you still have a neighbor in the neighborhood. As for revenues, whoa. Neither Raftelis nor the staff report have given what you what you need to make a decision. They look only at a small part of the picture to create an artificial doomsday scenario. They didn't put a figure on the negative impacts to neighbors' property values, how STRs will reduce tax revenues. It didn't include the increased revenue if bootleg STRs were enforced, including unadvertised realtor direct STRs. They didn't mention revenues coming soon, including three planned hotels in commercial districts, any two of which would get the annual TOT back up around two and a half million within a few years. And meanwhile, the full payments on the 30 acres don't kick in for a few years. So even if there would be a small shortfall for a short time, you'd want to ask, what are the residents' priorities? Where would they or we, where would we want the city to save a few bucks? But the report says nothing about that. Worse, nothing is considered if they couldn't put a dollar sign on it. They admitted it. So I can illustrate that, the limitations of it, by having you visualize a word cloud, if you know what that is. In the whole report, the words financial, revenue, and the dollar sign appear an average of 60 times each. Words that never appear in the report include traffic, entertainment, drunk, party, as in party house, stranger, worry, anger, agitation, theft, 911, rehab, vulgar, Faustian bargain. Words that you might use in discussing corporate penetration into our neighborhoods might be stealth, vampire, zombies, ghost town. None of those words appear. Nor do peace, quiet, privacy, secure, sleep, friends, friendly, public interest, vision, human, humanity, life, liberty, happiness, living, alive, lifestyle, quality of life. None of those appear in the report, but financial revenue and the dollar sign average 60 mentions each. So my recommendations, the Santa Monica home share model is the legally supportable compromise. For easier enforcement, include the Laguna Beach requirement of a license to advertise. Dismantle the preferential deal with Airbnb, treat all platforms equally. Impose two or three night minimum, prohibit events, parties, and commercial use during guest use, including no film permits. 
loosen the corporation's toehold now while you still can. Otherwise, their vision involves buying up as many houses in the city as possible, especially after the next big recession, and someday making Malibu one big distributed resort hotel. Let's keep neighbors in our neighborhoods. You know those old bumper stickers? Malibu, a way of life? We don't need one that says Malibu, a way of transient occupancy. Thank you. Next, Michael Lustig, you have eight minutes as long as, may I see a show of hands? Beatty Nielsen, thank you. Cassandra Clausen, thank you. Sharon Borowski, thank you. Lance Simmons, thank you. Louis Spirito, thank you. And Jim Palmer, thank you. Okay, eight minutes. All right. I'm Madam Mayor. Wait, what's going on over here? Anybody got it? I hear them. Madam Mayor, Council, I'm addressing you today as a board member of the Malibu Road Association on behalf of our 200 homes and registered voters. We are asking you to direct staff to adopt our petition that is comprised of SDR regulations from other cities that have been proven to work. The, peti the petition unites more than 1,000 registered voters with the Township Council, Las Tunas, Sycamore Canyon, Latigo Shores, and others. I'm also compelled to speak to speak up for the residents that don't care and aren't here because they don't have an STR next to them yet. And you know it's serious. I mean, I do this for fun and because it's the right thing to do, but you know it's serious when Sharon Borofsky and John Mazza are on the same side of something. <laughs> Airbnb and the other platform's business models depend upon two things, a willful denial of existing law and avoiding regulation at all costs by any tactic. Airbnb's strategy to prevent regulation is to overwhelm us with clickbait, misinformation, to create circular arguments in the public comment. The discourse is overrun with endless complaints of nuisance and party houses, pitted against the branded emotive stories of the good on-site mom and pops who are actually home sharing and it's actually benign. There are some individuals here who are conflicted by the revenue. And that's why we have the deeply flawed Raftelis report promoting STRs as the sole solution to fill a future budget gap. Let's not be naive. Some people still think Airbnb is a friend and a partner who should be allowed to write the rules the way they want to be regulated, which is not to be regulated at all. That's why we're four years into this conversation. What's at stake is a big pile of money for Airbnb and the general fund, but it comes at the expense of the quality of life and the cost of living of the majority of residents who do not partake in letting, uh, short-term letting their homes. Reports like the Raftelli's one are not uncommon around the STR debate, but if you lend credence to it, or actually believe we're dependent on STR revenue, then it's already too late. Airbnb's strategy has made a mockery of this process. They've delayed regulation, hindered enforcement, and undermined the rule of law. Airbnb has a long history of misleading cities into legislation that they know will fail, and breaking their agreements also with cities to collect the tax, share data, and aid in compliance enforcement. All you have to do is look at the letter they sent to Los Angeles last week. And that was an ordinance that took four and a half years to get in partnership with them. There's no profit for me in this fight. It's simply a matter of the greater good versus corporations doing egregious things. I have several friends who, who are hosts who also see what I see. In all honesty, I can tell you there are many people in this room tonight who know that primary residence without a host on site is not a regulation and that limiting the number of days is impossible to enforce. We know this because Airbnb told us at one of their coaching clinics. Not to worry, unhosted residents and day limits are two of the biggest loopholes that create compliance boondoggles. Airbnb's prank isn't funny anymore. 
So don't fall for it. Our petition, which I sent you, makes it simple. It's based on empirical truth. That means you can look it up. It's based on adjudications from the Ninth Circuit Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Boston Settlement, common sense, and the ability to learn from the mistakes of others. So if you can't learn from the failures of other cities, maybe we can learn from the success. The Santa Monica Council got it right with the primary residence definition, the hosting requirements, and platform accountability. The Santa Monica rules have been upheld three times by the Ninth Circuit Court. It does not trigger safe harbor under the CDA. It does not impinge upon the First or Fourth Amendment rights of users, and it has withstood the challenge of a class action suit brought by hosts. I'm asking you, how many cities have you talked to about their experience? I've met with or spoken to 21, and another 40 cities have used the ordinance study and drafting tool that I made for you last year to focus their thinking on how to regulate. But here at home, it was rejected in favor of language sent to us by Airbnb. There's six additional items in this petition, including a very generous concession to the Coastal Commission and to the owners of multifamily buildings. At this point, every person in this room knows that the sheriff can't cite for code violations. So we ought to be done with that. The willful denial of the law will continue and you will be challenged to enforce. The petition creates a budget for two dedicated compliance officers to be trained and to be on call 24 seven to enforce it. And I've been fighting the enforcement battle in Denver for a year because we were shut down for 13 months. This petition uses the mission vision statement and policy 15 as guidance just as you should. Adoption of it puts the interests of residents in the primary position ahead of special interests while protecting the on-site mom and pops who are also residents. It cures the nuisances and it stops outside investors and others from commercializing our residential neighborhoods. There's no such thing as perfect, but this prescription places you at the convergence of what is right and legal today. It also puts you at the forefront of standardizing language that will help other cities tackle the problem too. You are a good council, and as a coalition of HOAs and voting residents, we have faith in you but we've had enough of Airbnb's games and we demand action now. Failure, failure to regulate will bring about over tourism and nobody wants that. What we know for sure without any doubt is that the consequence of allowing the city to become dependent upon the TOT to make ends meet will gift Airbnb with an outsized influence in every important, city, every important decision the city makes in the future and that's way too big of a risk for any of us to swallow. So what we're asking you is to direct staff tonight to adopt the petition and bring it back as an ordinance and let's get something on the books as soon as possible. So we can allow for a grace period without forcing residents to endure another season of misery next summer. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, next is Annie Ellis, Dick Gutman, John Payne, Ken Ehrlich. Hi. Hi. Um, you know, so much good stuff's been said already. You guys will try not to repeat stuff. I didn't have time to write a great letter like that. Um, but, um, you know, my parents bought out here over 60 years ago. Um, yes, I am over 60 years old, um, but, um, you know, I've always thought that um, a hotel or anything you rent out is a commercial property, like has been said here today so many times. My parents' little place, they had to, they have on the bluff between Broad Beach and El Matador State Beach, and um, in the late 70s, they had to um, split up their lot and sell the house and one uh, one lawn and build onto the guest house, but they kept the beach lot also. Um, and it's a little street goes down, four houses on each side down to their bluff, and then you turn and you go down to three houses down below. That's 14 houses. 
there are six full-time residents. They're all over the age of 80. Most of them are closer to 90, like my mother. I'm there taking care of her now. Um, you know, they worked hard their whole lives. Um, they, they bought out here. Actually, I remember my parents voted for cityhood, had something to do with A, not wanting the, the county had big plans to put a sewer system all the way out here from town. Once you do a sewer system, you get lots of buildings. You can build whatever you want. So um, when my mom's heard of even, you know, Pepperdine, we sat on our horses watching them bulldoze those beautiful mountains. And, and every single big area gets their own septic or sewer system. So um, my mom had a fit when she heard any sewer was going in in Malibu. But um, what I'm just going to say is on our on our street, there's one guy now. He bought um, someone that lived there. They built the house, and um, they passed away, and Claire McCarty was her name, good friend of mine, and they had to sell the house. And this couple has split up. They have two sons in college, and they come out once in a while to use their parents' house. They have a guest house. That's what they rent out. They're renting it out. We saw the ad they put on, and that's what's upsetting most of us on that street where there's a map with a circle around it. They advertise that there's lots of um, uh, celebrities there, and you can only use one parking spot in their driveway, but unlimited street parking in front of everybody else's house. Uh, we went down a couple weeks ago to our beach that mom pays property tax on, and they had like 30 friends over. It looked like Zuma Beach. Um, they right away are doing campfires on the beach. I'm nonstop having to stop that. Um, and it's it's just, you know, my parents long time worked for quality of life, peace and quiet in a beautiful area. Thank you. Not for a hotel next door. Thanks. Next is Dick Gutman, John Payne, Ken Ehrlich, Bruce. Skype. Thank you. Dick Gutman, are you here? No. Okay. John Payne? Left. Ken Ehrlich. Okay. Would the others please come forward so we don't lose time? Bruce Guype, Fred Gaines, Steve Uring, Nicholas Hale. Madam Mayor, Ken Ehrlich on behalf of the Sotira Trust and other uh, property owners in Malibu Colony. We, we, I have, my clients have a very unique problem, I think unique and significant in relation to what's been talk, talked about tonight where you have specific instances where short-term rentals come in a coastal, uh, relatively wealthy neighborhood solely to view the owner of the house next door or solely to see the prominent person next door. So we have a, a surgical problem which is, in my estimation, solved completely and I can't be more articulate than Mr. Lustig and Mr. Hill, because if you completely bar it in limited areas, you don't run afoul of the Coastal Commission. You don't get in problems with the LCP, which are the Coastal Commission is solely talking about visitor serving low income accommodations, not the issues on coastal residential single family residences in this city. So the whole issue of multifamily, not our interest, candidly. So. You, you carve that out. The whole revenue stream, I can't imagine there are a whole host of homes in coastal Malibu that are doing short-term rentals for weekends solely for the purpose and problem that I'm describing. So I doubt that the, re the remedy has a fiscal issue either. So the Santa Monica model, perfect for our clients in a, re in a single family residence. As long as you have the owner present, it controls what happens. We're completely for that. If you want to do a ban on in a surgical stripe of the city and the coastal residences, and, the, then, and you pick them as long as you include the colony, my clients are fine as well. But all I'm saying is I can't be more articulate than Mr. Lustig and Mr. Hill, and it's about time the city acted in some way. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next, Bruce Guype. Not here. Okay. Fred Gaines, Steve Uring, Nicholas Hale, Lloyd Ahern, BJ Pike. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Honorable 
council members. My name is Fred Gaines. Uh, in addition to the financial report that you received, I want to point you to another financial report that came out last week, and that was from the state, California State Auditor's Office. Uh, this was a report that went through and ranked all 400 and uh, plus cities in California on a series of fiscal uh, points. And Malibu, of course, did well on many of the points, but the two areas where Malibu was identified for elevated risk, and you can, it, this report, it was in the LA Times talked about how Compton or some of the other towns had some serious problems, but if you go, if you Google California State Auditor ranking, you'll get, and you can go straight to Malibu and it'll go through, or any other city, and it'll go through the, the items. The two items that were, uh, that Malibu was at elevated risk, one was revenue, because of flat revenue and probably a downturn in revenue due to the uh, to the fires and debt, um, having taken on uh, debt. So not only do you have issues uh, in the report that were there, but these are uh, concerns. Uh, and it adds, and it, I think that to some extent that the, the review that you had was somewhat simplistic because there are multiple factors involved, including the fact that if you start to have declining revenue and uh, and your revenue to debt ratio goes up. You, your rating goes down, and your interest rate goes up on the debt. So there's there's multiple factors to this that I want you to consider as well as the straight, we're going to give up this revenue, and that leads us in a, in a certain direction. Number two, one of the advantages of having had hours and hours of testimony and hearings over what's now become a long period of time is that I do think the city can start to focus in on what is okay and what is not okay. I think that there's been enough talk that when uh, the, the gentleman who came up and gave a wonderful presentation with the petition and talks about there, there are clearly good uses of short-term rental. You have good actors in the city. Sue Peck's name has been mentioned. Um, and you know that they're not causing problems and they've been active for 10 years and they're providing a, a service and then there's bad actors. And so I ask you not to look at it just, of course, in terms of a ban or not a ban, but in terms of looking at strategically uh, what an appropriate compromise uh, is. Um, and finally, one thing that is somewhat taken a backseat in this discussion, one speaker did mention it earlier, is planning. You can do good planning. There are areas where this use would be appropriate and other areas where it would not. So one of Sue Peck's buildings, if you have, a, if you have a, a broomstick in your hand, you can touch the Malibu Beach Inn. She's, her short-term rental room abuts a hotel. That may very well be an area where by zoning you would allow a certain amount of of rental. You're already allowing transient occupancy. Those are my points. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. you listening. Steve Uring, Nicholas Hale, Lloyd Ahern, BJ Pike, Dan Sislo. Could you all please come forward? Thank you, Council Members. Uh, I'd like to thank Fred. I, I remember when Fred, when uh, short term rentals came before the Calabasas City Council, I think Fred's comment on paraphrasing was something like, let's not do the same stupid thing that Malibu's doing, okay? Uh, so I appreciate his comments up here. You guys have heard all this. I mean, planning commissions voted against short-term rentals. Well, you've been through this I don't know how many times. Uh, so I, I can't tell you anything you haven't already heard. I want to leave you with just two statements. And, and in a prior life, I dealt with, I was part of an, growing an internet business. So it's no surprise that these internet businesses that are starting up uh, can you create a bunch of adverse impacts? And the conduct of those businesses needs to be reconciled with community values. And that is where the government steps in, and that's what we're asking you to do. Government regulation of short-term rent vacation rentals promotes community value of maintaining zones for residential life. And that's what, that's what I think the people who live in the, in the city are asking you to do. The second thing is no Coastal Act policy complies short-term rental uses in residential zones. The California Supreme Court long ago concluded that the Coastal Act does not preempt local zoning regulations. And I wish I had written those things. I didn't. Your city, Christy Hogan, that was part of her amicus brief in terms of supporting the Santa Monica regulation. And she's right. So I encourage you, as the other speakers have done, Santa Monica has got a regulation. It's done. It's been adjudicated. It's something we can implement quickly. And I encourage you to adopt that. Let's get this thing done so we can all move forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Next is Nicholas Hale. Not here. Lloyd Ahern, B.J. Pike, Dan Sislo, Rodrigo Iglesias. Please come forward. Thank you. Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, my name is Lloyd Ahern. I'm the president of the uh, Los Tunis Homeowners Association. And tonight when they're making a presentation of the finances, they forgot to have somebody in there. It's part, of part of life is quality of life. We got to have money and we got to have quality of life. So I think we have to, you know, a lot of people are focused on that. Um, I, Michael Luskin stole my joke with Sharon. Uh, I, this is the tribal city of all times. I'm one of the guys in one of the tribes and everybody who knows what tribe they're in. But I'm with the tribe of John Mazza, Steve Uring, and Richard Lawrence tonight. I think this is so simple and so unifying for people that actually live in this town and have to deal on, a, for instance, I live on the Tunis Beach, which has a real parking problem. That woman that got up and showed the, the video with her street full of people and the guy urinating on, out on the thing. On our beach, it, it's unbelievable what happens with there's no the parking problems are huge because there's a there's a, a, a weekend guest and they got all kinds of friends they park on the highway they run across the street they park in front of your driveway they do everything and I explained one time to a guy you know um, you know you just can't do this and he was drunk and he explained to me that he had a right and I said you know what the right you have you got this right right here because I'm not you know and I'll tell you. I'm too old to give this right. So what we need in this thing that we're doing with that Santa Monica has, real important. Two, thank you, Skylar. I, I love your smile. <laughs> <laughs> we need enforcement, 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 enforcement. This will work with enforcement. I know there's a compromise in here. And Reba, I love you for having us in a financial position that you've got us in, that we can have this argument and still survive. And we're going to do great. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Next, E.J. Pike, Dan Sislo, Rodrigo Iglesias, Norm Haney. Thank you, Mayor Fair and Council members. Um, my name is B.J. Pike, and I feel that Malibu is a very unique city. Sometimes I don't want you to think about what they do in other cities and follow their model. They didn't have the fire, the Woolsey fire like we had, and they didn't have the winds afterwards that blew down our sign. They didn't have the mud. We had to put up a lot of sandbags and also clean out our culverts. It took a lot of money to do this. Um, they bought the property, my grandparents, in 1948. That means that's over 71 years ago. I was one years old. And I'm very proud of being a Malibu um, member of this community. We have five generations now. And I hope you consider um, the grandfathering in people like us who have a beautiful piece of property and we upkeep it. We upkeep it for our short-term rentals. We. One of our renters just told us last week, we had some fog and crystals in our front window. And right now, for $6,000, we're fixing two windows. We take really good care of our property. We could not do that without the short-term rental income. And because we live in Malibu, we're considering fixing our landscaping for fire. We have, um, land, we have landscaping full of ice plant. We were so spared during that fire. We did catch a little a couple of embers on our railing. We got that fixed right away. We have um, um, a lot of concerns about how much money we spend to take care of our property. But we also have a property manager. She lives a few miles away, can get there within five or 10 minutes. She, everybody around us has her phone number. We've never had any complaints. They are told to call if there's a problem. 
Um, we even take care of our beach. I mean, we're down there all the time, the family. So please consider um, grandfathering us in since we have um, a property manager and we do love being here. It's not for profit, it's for taking care of our property. Thank you. Okay, Dan Sislow, Rodrigo Iglesias, Norm Haney, Lynn Norton, Charles Stiegler. Mayor, council members, uh, thank you very much for the time. I just wanna say that uh, I am Dan Sislow. I'm also president of the Winding Way, a homeowners association with Murphy Way. And uh, I have a personal story. Uh, the cul-de-sac next to me was sold to somebody who lives in Sweden. And it seems like every weekend there is another party. It, sometimes it's a loud party, sometimes it's not a loud party, sometimes there's open drugs everywhere, sometimes there's prostitutes there. We just never know. But the problem is, the I can't even call the homeowner because he's in Sweden somewhere. And so there is a profit here, and what's going on is that people are taking our residential housing stock, chopping it up and selling it in little pieces to people who will pay more for it. And so there's a lot of money here. The city is making a lot of money on it. There's a lot of people here that are making a lot of money on it. I don't blame them for trying to make a lot of money. But it's kind of crazy that th this is residential zoned areas, which are now converted into commercial hotels. How did that happen? How did this get away from us? I mean, are we gonna chop it up further and maybe uh, rent out homes by the hour? Maybe we'll call them instead of SDRs, we'll call them STDs. But it's, it's crazy to think what's going on here. So I would just say that, you know, we fought too hard. I've been here for over 30 years. We fought too hard uh, to try to create this Malibu, this environment that was special, to throw it all away to some big corporation that wants to chop up our time, our residences. And this is a bigger problem. It's happening throughout the United States. So will Malibu be different? Will we stop it? I think we can. I think the, the Santa Monica ordinance works great because uh, one, it's already passed mustard, the Ninth Circuit passed, it says it's good, and we don't have to fight that fight again. But more importantly, I think, is that um, it requires people to be there. So I think people are not gonna rent out their house to some crazy party situation if they're gonna be living there. I think that if there is a wild party going on, they can step in and shut it down. If there is something going wrong, a neighbor can go to the neighbor and say, hey, you know what's going on over here? I mean, we are a great neighborhood. We are a great community. Let's keep that. If we turn this into just one commercial enterprise, it, it, it would be a, a catastrophe. And by the way, with regards to the money aspects, just increase the rate. And there's been no showing that if we switch to the the uh, Santa Monica version that we're gonna lose all of these people staying. They just will be managed a lot better. So pass an ordinance, do it right away, pass the Santa Monica ordinance, and if a year from now we're broke and we need the money, or a year from now we need to totally eliminate this problem, we can do that, but just do something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Rodrigo Iglesias, Norm Haney, Lynn Norton, Charles Stiegler, Marianne Riggins, Ryan Embry, and that's it. Thank you, uh, Mayor Ferrer and council members. My name is Rodrigo Iglesias. I'm a local uh, realtor, and uh, I support short-term rentals. Uh, I help manage one, and if they're done properly, if specifically they're not uh, people are required to stay two or more days. Uh, those parties are uh, not happening because of the fires are closed, transactions are done down uh, almost 50%. This short-term rentals give the ability for people to come visit the city. I have turned short-term rentals into uh, lookers and then uh, sales. Uh, so it allows, since the city does not have the proper uh, ability to host people for more than one day, and that's the problem, the one day parties, but people that come and enjoy Malibu get an opportunity to become new citizens of the city, 
And so uh, it is important that uh, the facilities are available. Also, when uh, people come and stay at a, at a rental that I manage, they have a great experience and they're able to tell other people and that's reflected in the uh, closely uh, held uh, reviews that people put on their on the website. So good management is good for the city, brings people in, brings people to the stores, brings people to the restaurants that otherwise would be going out of business. We lost uh, 40 to 50 percent of the students and, and some of uh, the, in the, the high school and the middle school, and we need an opportunity for uh, new people to come and experience Malibu, look at the vacant lots, decide that they want to be here, and there's no facilities to host them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Norm Haney, Lynn Norton, Charles Stiegler, Marianne Riggins, Ryan Embry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot because I agree with Ann Payne, uh, Scott Diedrich, uh, Lucille Keller. That's a shock. <laughs> and I'm sure Walt as well. Um, Craig Hill, uh, Steve Uring, John Mazza. I agree with all of them. And I think that they um, had the right thing to say. I think commercial belongs in commercial. I know you are in a position to uh, find a compromise, and I'm sure that you will be able to do that. <clears throat> there, there are other alternatives where there's commercial in commercial, and those will be coming before you, hopefully, shortly. Um, with regard to, I wonder how many of you struggled when you bought your very first piece of property or your home. It's not easy had to go without in order to make your payments. Malibu did that when they bought the city hall. They did it again when they bought the three commercial properties. In the end, they will be basically uh, making their goals and objectives come true for their citizens with those properties. And who did that? You did it, and so did Riva. So now we're struggling a little bit, but in the end, we'll be very happy that we did it. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Next is Lynn Norton, Charles Stiegler, Marianne Riggins, Ryan Embry. Good evening. Um, I am supporting the idea that I would hope that you would go with the Santa Monica ordinance since it's already um, been litigated and uh, we don't need to go through that, even though I would actually ideally prefer more res restrictions than that, but this would give us something that we can start from there. We can reevaluate in a year what to do um, if, we, if we can do more. But like, I just wanted to paint a little picture because I know there's some extreme examples of what can happen and, and I think that you actually, it's very hard to regulate those because you regulate them after the fact, after the offense has already happened, after the person's night has already been ruined, after the kid's already seen something they shouldn't have seen, you know, then you regulate it. But I, I just thought about some things which are just kind of more subtle things of like what our neighborhood is like. And I live in a neighborhood where um, of a couple hundred people, I've, there's probably only like two or three degrees of separation between me and everyone in the neighborhood. So most of the people in the neighborhood, I either know them or I know someone who knows them, and it's, it's a very close neighborhood. And I just wrote down a few things of what it's like with my neighbors. So like when the fire was coming, I called my neighbors. I said, are you up? Are you packing? Have you called this other neighbor? Short-term rental visitors don't do that. Um, when a neighbor comes home from the hospital with their foot in the cast, the other neighbor comes over with a pot of soup and says, oh, you won't have to cook tonight. Tell me if you need a ride to the doctor's office. Short-term rental properties, they don't do that. Does that make sense? I mean, does that, <laughs> you know, a, a neighbor sees a little dog in the yard and they know the little dog's not supposed to be, I mean, out in the street, the little dog's not supposed to be out there because that's just not normal in our neighborhood because we have coyotes and stuff. And so they know, so they take the dog in and start making a couple phone calls so they figure out who is it that that dog belongs to and return the dog to their, to their owner. 
Um, neighbors, when you're sitting out and you're weeding your yard and the other neighbor comes by walking their dog, you start a conversation. You you have a history. You, you have a history. It's kind of like an extended family in our neighborhood. It's like that to me. Um, we have one neighbor who goes around bringing the trash out and in for all the older ladies who don't have husbands, and he just goes around and he does that even though he's getting up there. <laughs> Um, or if you're going out of town for the weekend, you know, you call your neighbor, can you look in after, you know, keep your eye on my house? You know, would you mind walking my dog? I mean, you just, I mean, I mean, those maybe are silly examples, but it's just that the more you have houses that are short-term rentals, like if, if you were thinking to move to Malibu and there was two houses that were just short-term rental houses, would you really consider buying that house in between those two houses to, to raise your family there, to have your kids there? I think it devalues it as a neighborhood a lot. And um, and I, I also think that it's it's just not as safe. And I just wanted to quote, let's see, uh, Mikey Pearson, who I feel like he's here somewhere, but I don't know where. <laughs> I thought I heard him before. Um, he said, you've got to have neighbors looking out for neighbors. This was in a Malibu Times article about a wave of home burglaries. You need neighbors looking out for neighbors. Thank and that's you. what you have when Thank you really you. have neighbors. OK. Charlie Stiegler, then Marianne Riggins and Ryan Embry. That's those are the three final speakers. Hello, hi Karen. Um, I am uh, Charlie Stiegler. Um, I am a proponent for short-term rental because I and my brother inherited a house. Um, it's uh, wonderful that we did. I, I would rather live in the house, to be honest with you, than have to rent it. Uh, I've lived here over 30 years. Um, I do live in Malibu. Uh, I did put out the fire, did save houses. Not a lot of people who do live in Malibu stayed around to do that. We didn't even have a lot of firemen that stayed or were in Point Doom at the time. Um, you know, we, we did rent the house out long term after the fire. I would just as soon rent it long term, to be honest with you. But uh, it, it doesn't make sense for us. Um, and uh, I, we, I don't, as I said, we don't, I don't live on the property. Uh, and, but I do live in Malibu nearby. So to put me, put us in a situation where you say renters, uh, owners have to be on the property, the house isn't designed to have more than uh, be rented to one family at a time, I don't think is fair. Uh, I think the main thing is, you know, that there's no complaints that we have on my phone. I have a noise uh, awareness. If it's uh, decibels go too loud after 10 o'clock, we have elderly gentlemen next door that we, um, and we have, you know, important people on the other side. Uh, uh, we make sure that uh, we take good care of the property. Uh, we respect the beach, and uh, we don't let people go down there uh, when we rent it. And um, there's, um, you know, we have to understand that it's that we need short-term rentals right now. Businesses are going out of business. With uh, uh, there's for many examples out of that. We don't want to see more. Uh, it's not the time, and uh, it's not the time to, to create laws that would greatly affect people like us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ann Riggins, Ryan Embry. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people rent their properties out, and some people rent them out for short-term times, and some people rent them out for long-term times. Um, I was about to start short-term rentals just before the Woolsey fire happened. Since then, I decided to go with the long-term. I didn't pick a family. I didn't pick anybody who's going to impact the schools. And that's one thing you've got to remember about rentals. It's not a guarantee that those homeowners or property owners are going to rent to people that have families or are going to be in the schools. Um, so that's one thing to consider. This doesn't guarantee if you ban short-term rentals that it's going to increase our school population. And if anybody knows me, they know I'm a huge school supporter. I volunteer and I do a lot for our local schools. So just keep that in mind. Um, 
Another thing I've heard a lot about are parties and complaints about bad behavior going on. That's not also a guarantee that if you don't have short-term rentals that those magically are gonna go away. Bad neighbors happen, whether you have them there for 30 days or six months or a year. I've had bad property owners next to me that we didn't get along and we had problems and we had conflicts. That's no guarantee if you have a short-term rental. The benefit of this, they're gone in maybe 24, 48, 72 hours. Um, another complaint that I heard, or the, the benefit of Santa Monica, I find that the most ironic between the supporters of the ban or limitations. Many of those same people look to Santa Monica and say, we don't wanna be like them. We're not Santa Monica, we're Malibu. We should have our own thing. So why are we trying to adopt something that works for Santa Monica? Let's do something that works for Malibu. I agree with a permitting process. Let's have some controls. Let's have some ability. Let's have some real fines. People that are a problem and are being bad renters or bad property owners, let's fine them. Let's, and let's have some significant fines. I mean. They're renting for thousands of dollars. We should do thousands of dollars of fines. Um, I have my other notes, sorry. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for considering this, and I hope that you find some type of balanced ways that allow property owners. Oh, there was one thing. It was the commercialization. We already allow firming, uh, filming and uh, photo permits on properties. We already allow long-term rentals. Those are both commercial things. So this is not a new instance or really anything different. And when, when we were adopting and we were having problems with the filming, we adopted rules. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Final speaker on this item, Ryan Embry. I find it very interesting that the proponents for short-term rentals seem to all talk about themselves and their revenue and how they never get complaints. Um, what your job is as council people is to maximize our quality of life, not the city's revenue. You're not a corporation to make money. But the maximization of income is the corporate model, and we've been hearing it kind of uh, from the sidelines all tonight on how do you replicate this model without a resident on site? How do you scale this by 10, 20, or 30 fold? Please don't compromise the quality of life in Malibu that we've all worked so hard and you've all worked so hard even before you were council members for the 20 odd years of Malibu's maturization, don't compromise us into addicts for this 10% or 12% of revenue. The projection analysis was flawed. It does not show you the projected expense for enforcement, and it does not quantify the lost property value for all of the non-short-term rentals and can't put a number on the quality of life when it goes down the toilet. The proponents are asking you for enforcement. Frankly, the enforcement that you should have been doing is to uphold the local coastal plan, which is the state law, which prohibits this use in this zone. So we've already compromised thus far. So we're watching very closely. What's very important to note is this comment about the film permits. I just can't let that slide. That was with a lot of angst. That got way out of control, and I've likened that to what's happened here and now. There's very strict limits on the number of days and amount that you can do filming at a, a residential property because it got out of control. It got to be very profitable to do. So we're in the same boat again. What is missing is the enforcement. You need to include private enforcement in the municipal law if there's any provision to allow this use in a residential zone. Private enforcement would allow the homeowners associations 
to go after and shut down and get a court order against these properties when things get out of hand. So if you really mean business, that should be included. I noticed that Fred Gaines has left the room. City of Calabasas has private enforcement in their no smoking law, which is going on 20 years now. It's in there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes public comments on item 5A. Is anyone in favor of a break before we go to council comments? No, okay, that's fine. Would anyone like to go first? Sure, I'll kick it off. Uh, you know, definitely the coolest comment of the night was, you know, Sharon Borowski and John Mazza agreeing. That's pretty cool. And that's actually, that's actually pretty interesting and it's noteworthy. It's noteworthy. And Norm Haney and Lucille Keller. When you get that, you know, those are some serious cultural divides, shall I say, within our tribes, community. Tribes, tribes. tribes, okay. Coming together on a thing. That's, uh, that's really, that's good. Um, I didn't say in my comments, but I was also at the League of California Cities earlier, last week I guess it was, and I went to a little symposium or seminar or whatever on short-term rentals. Trevor was one of the panelists. And there was also a woman from the city of Truckee, and uh, she kind of talked about the history of it in Truckee. And you know, Truckee is up there, it's a town there near Reno and Tahoe and stuff, and I think they have a lot of seasonal people that come up either during the ski season or during the summer and stuff. And then they looked at their pie diagram of, you know, they sort of got a handle on it after they would be going on for a while. And then they realized, well, it's a lot of money there that we, it's now a significant part of their budget. And I think for them, it was a big part of their pie. They had passed what I would describe as the event horizon of being addicted to the cash. In other words, it was like, a big part of their no turning back. We have yet to reach that. We're far from that. So when it comes to the financial aspect of it, it's an aspect. It's not the showstopper and it's not um, we're going to die without the money. So I just want everyone out there to know that I think for me, and I'm I'll let the other council members speak for themselves, the priority of the city is, although we are, we want to maintain our sterling credit rating, we want to pay our bills, and want to be in a good financial position, the priority for the council members is, of course, uh, upholding the mission and vision statement of the city of Malibu. That's why Malibu became a city, and maintaining the rural character of our uh, neighborhoods is paramount in that. Um, there's a value, you know, what happened, turn back the Wayback Machine to whatever it was, September of 2018, and this came up, and that's where we kind of put everything on hold. And I think I'm partially responsible for that because we read something in the code that said, hey, they're not, you know, bed and breakfasts aren't allowed in residential neighborhoods. Then the fire came. And so we essentially the whole thing got slid for a year. There's value sometimes in not taking action. And in this case, the value has come about in letting other cities take action and go through the brutalization of being taken to court and we'll see what survives and what doesn't. And we're like the little sucker fish on the big shark that kind of goes right in his wake. You know, we're drafting on those bigger organizations and we benefit from the fact that they have already going to bat and they worked out the kinks and some of them didn't work out so well for those cities and other ones it did work out and you know one of the ones that people keep mentioning here is is the Santa Monica one and there's uh, value in looking at what others have done we don't necessarily you know Marianne Riggin said hey this is we shouldn't be adopting Santa Monica this is Malibu we should be, we should be adopting something for Malibu well that's that's okay but sometimes you don't get necessarily points for originality. There's something to be said for plagiarism when it comes to surviving in court and especially surviving with the Coastal Commission. And that's, that's relatively intelligent, I think, actually, to look at those who've gone before and, uh, ooh, those guys didn't do so well in that minefield. But those guys over here, I think they found the path through the minefield. Let's follow those guys. So I think that as representatives of the people, we want to do things that are the right thing to do and, uh, but we 
also don't want to foolishly subject the, the city to um, risk. And we want to look at, just like we look at the fire and we look at preparing for a fire, we look at risk management and how do we want to manage the risk uh, as we move forward, especially in this potentially volatile issue. And there's a lot of value. And I appreciate all the hard work that's gone on from people who are neck deep in this subject and uh, very engaged in it, not only from our own city, but other places. So there's, there's a lot of value, I think, in looking at what other people have done. I'll be honest with you. I personally am more of a full band guy. I think it shouldn't be in the city at all. I think it goes against the um, uh, mission statement. I think it is commercialization of our natural and cultural resources. And, and I say it all the time, you know, we have 50 million visitors and I love all the visitors that come. I like them to come, but I, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to as, as much as we possibly can to protect those neighborhoods. Now, having said that, uh, that course of action probably will involve a little bit of risk. You know, we'll have the Coastal Commission like licking their chops, we'll have Airbnb pawing the ground and everybody wanting to take us to court. So I think there's, there is value in uh, seeking a middle ground compromise and that um, examining what Santa Monica has done, I think, strikes a good balance and um, it's not perfect, it's not what I want because I would like to whoosh, get rid of it all together. But you know, maybe I'm a little more hardcore than everybody else is. Uh, let, me re let me review a few things that I wrote down here. Um, who is it that said, uh, somebody was complaining about that. It was, Craig was saying, hey, you know, the financial guys, they didn't talk about zombies and they didn't talk about quality of life. They're financial guys, okay? We hired them to look at money. That's what they're supposed to do. It's like, hey, whoa, we missed your time. Not my turn to talk. That's what they're supposed to do, is they're supposed to look at the money aspect of it. We get paid the big bucks here to look at those bigger issues, like quality of life stuff. So we're not forsaking that, but remember, those are money guys. Um, let me ask you this, uh, Trevor. How does the, they keep talking about the Santa Monica thing, held up in court. What is the Coastal Commission's take on the whole Santa Monica thing? And would it be, how would they look at us, do you think, based on your experience, if we were to adopt something like that? The, the Santa Monica is different from us in a, a couple important ways. Number one, they don't have a local Im implementation plan and instead coastal development permits are issued by the Coastal Commission. And I spoke with um, Councilmember Wagner a little bit earlier about what he was looking into uh, with his questions earlier and what he was talking about was um, a amicus brief that was brought in about this issue. And the court actually, um, it dealt with a little bit in a preliminary injunction situation but that issue was whether you needed a CDP for an ordinance, which wouldn't apply in our situation. So it's not really, it's apples to oranges, it's because we have a local implementation plan. So if we do make a change in use, we would need to, if we're gonna change the Santa Monica's ordinance, we would probably need a local coastal program amendment to pair with the ordinance. So we actually, generally speaking, from what you're saying, have more authority when it comes to coastal zone issues than Santa Monica does. But we would also have to make a change that would have to be reviewed by the Coast Commission. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can I, just, um, can I interrupt real quick, Rick? Is, sure. While we're on opinions from our attorney, they have to bring that challenge to us. If it's not challenged, we could prevail. If, you, if we went through the zoning text amendment without doing a local coastal program amendment, it could be challenged by coastal or it could be challenged by another individual. True, so, but. Um, okay, that's a good point. We, we, we do have the obligation though, if it is a change of use that it is required by our LIP, LIP to go forward with an amendment, we should you know, do that if that's what we're looking to do. We're just uh, making a clarification in use. Well, we'll have to examine that stuff. Uh, I just want to comment also about the people who have, you know, family homes that go way back to, you know, 75 years. And in one case, you've got like 
nobody in the family is living there, but there's 25 people that are beneficiaries of it, and uh, I'm, you know I'm sympathetic to that. But if you're, but that's no longer a family home. That's no longer a member of the community. It's a little, a little golden goose that's that's that people are benefiting from. I'm very sympathetic to that, and I understand that. But maybe instead of it being a golden goose that lays an egg every week, you can still lay a big egg every year. So I hear you. But that home that was bought by grandma, you know, 75 years ago and who was probably a part of the neighborhood and running around bare feet like everybody used to do back then, that's no longer a home anymore and that we're not have, that's not a part of our community. And I think that um, some of the comments that Lynn Norton said about things that um, make up a neighborhood, are, they're small things, but they're really important things. They're really important things. And those golden goose houses for those people that are wonderful windfalls for them, they're no longer neighbors, they're no longer members of the community, and they're just things that are, I know they're valuable for those people, but they're just, maybe if we, if, you, if this gets eliminated, they're just gonna have to come up with a different paradigm, and, and I'm sympathetic to that, but um, I'm more interested in getting the place back to what it was like when grandma uh, bought it originally and actually lived here. Dan Sislow, I think he's left, but his Sweden comment, you know, that's, I think that it's really uh, illuminates sort of the extreme example, but it does happen. It does happen. And I think that adopting something like Santa Monica or even the one that, that we had looked at before gets rid of some of those things. So what I, I don't know if you can articulate this or maybe the staff can articulate this. What is the difference between the one that we looked at a year ago for us and the Santa Monica one. I think one of the big ones is the on-site requirement for an on-site person, correct? Is that the major one? Yeah, it's, it's completely limited to home sharing with somebody in the actual unit in Santa Monica. Okay, but you know, I'm looking at this petition that came up from uh, all the long time residents on Malibu Road and other places and they had a few other things with that, like allowing some uh, multifamily uh, rentals, you know, like one or two or whatever or that. Is that in Santa Monica's or is that something that we would add if we wanted to do that? That would be, I think, an addition. I don't think that's allowed in Santa Monica's ordinance. The, which part are we talking about? The, you know, where they have like a four unit thing and you can do one of them or if it's greater than six, I think it's 20 percent, something like that. I think that, you, that no matter which way you're doing, you do have to have this on-site person that we can, we can bring back further details about exactly how they're doing it. Okay, well, those are my thoughts. I don't want to hog the mic here, but I think I think the people have spoken, and I think what we need to do is. I'm going to have one more question for the lawyer. If if let's say we adopted some intermediary thing that's more restrictive than what we have now, which is kind of the wild west, and either it's the one we wanted last year or the Santa Monica one, and we try that for a few years, and then we say. This still stinks. We won't, I don't, we want to do an outright ban. Is that still a possibility? It'd be a possibility, but you would have the same situation you do now, the, the, trouble, the problem with going through with an LCP amendment to do a ban. You would face opposition from the Coastal Commission now. You'd probably face the same opposition from them. If you did it in the future, you might have um, more data that you, that you come together with. You put through something now that you may be able to use to support you know, arguments in terms of why you would need to have a, a greater restriction at that point. Okay, because you had said that thing, it's like, hey, you've taken actions that indicate that you tolerate it, you know, like you've gotten taxes and all that stuff, and does just because we did that doesn't mean we can't change our minds and, and not do it anymore, right? Just mean middle, maybe a little more challenging. No, we can make it, we can totally, absolutely it's established in the courts that we have the local police power in order to change what we would have to do here. We would just need to come up with something that would meet um, the requirements of the Coastal Act and, and meet um, comply with the Coastal Act and have the Coastal Commission find it so. Okay, one other thing I think is important is there has to be a transition period for us adopting something and then giving everybody who, you know, is operating under the current system a time to extricate themselves from their, it's not easy, it's not easy. Even those guys who from Sweden who own houses, they gotta figure out what they're gonna do with them. And uh, that's something that we need to consider. So 
I'm gravitating towards something, adopting something, maybe like the Santa Monica, maybe the whole thing that the these people from Santa, uh, the Malibu Road have suggested, because they've, they've got a few points there I want to read again, um, and have a transition period of, of either right before next summer or maybe after next summer or something like that. Hang on, hang on, we're still discussing this. And then, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes in a couple of years and if we want to reevaluate it, we can. But I want to hear what everybody else has to say. So I appreciate you guys letting me grab the mic first. Thank you, Rick. Who'd like to go next? I'll try it. I know we got Mikey in a three hours time difference. Hang in there, Pilgrim. Rick, I agree with you. The fish is called a remora. That's the, right, yeah, the little side guy on the shark. Where when you, you adopt something, as our brilliant counselor has told us, that it's a lot easier to fight that once you have another ruling. And then you have amicus briefs. So uh, that's a middle position for me. I'm all for banning this. But then I look at the financial reports, and I realize, hey, we will need some money for a rainy day. Um, I do have a question, though, about the gentleman that prepared the report and spoke to it. And um, you said quite often in the report that, you know, speculation, so you wouldn't go down that path. And I can respect that, because we really can't go that way. But if you have a chance, um, could you make it to the mic? and? You could clarify a few things for us. Sorry to get you out of your comfortable chair to your hot seat. My pleasure to be Thank here. Thank you. Um, so you spoke about the availability of funds in different formats. And one format that I think you left out, which I didn't see, and maybe you could address it, was about how we replace revenue if we take something away and we bring it back, how would we bring it back? And we do have a FEMA IOU for between six and nine million. I mean, we'll apply for nine and get six, and I get that leaves us in a deficit. You did point that out. I can't be perfect on the numbers, but I'm ballparking. So that, in essence, is a speculative position. But you took this position, and I accept that, and I say, OK, it's a 50-50. I didn't see in the report the position that Gavin Newsom gave us with San Diego Gas and Electric, SCE, and PG&E, because we filed with Barron and Bud for a replacement of the deficit between what FEMA awards us and what we're allowed to perceive in that rate payer repay, because that, that isn't really in there. The rate payer repay just got signed a few weeks ago. So could you address maybe speculatively that ratepayer repay will be part of our reward program after the Woolsey event is finally settled? Council member, I'm actually going to jump in and try and answer some of those questions. Um, first of all, on the FEMA reimbursement, the um, amount that we showed in FEMA is the amount that we've actually applied to FEMA um, and that they have agreed to reimburse us. What we're um, concerned on is the timing of that reimbursement. Um, in prior disasters, the uh, FEMA reimbursements have taken somewhere between five and 10 years. Um, we're hoping they start coming in faster on this disaster, but we wanted to factor that into um, everything that's going on right now. So we know that the um, funds that uh, the consultants showed in the report are the actual amount we will ultimately get. Um, in regards to your question regarding um, SCE, I'm going to actually ask the city attorney to speak to that because that's ongoing litigation. Um, and so that's why it wasn't included in the analysis. Sure. Uh, the litigation against SCE on behalf of the city, it's um, at this point, the city has put together significant damage reports, but we don't anticipate being made completely whole out of the litigation. So it's going to be an ongoing process. Um, there are discussions coming up with SCE, and hopefully we'll have some guidance in terms of what's going to be possible for the city. But at this point, I don't think we can make an estimate of, you know, um, what time of settlement we'll be getting out of that. And, and I also wanted to point out that um, the analysis that was done is a conservative analysis, and a forecast is exactly that. A financial forecast is something where you take the facts that you know and try to uh, 
put some um, estimates onto what things will be in the future. And anybody who's ever done any financial forecast knows um, that there's a lot of variables that can change in that course. So uh, what we did with the consultant is work to try and come up with what we felt was a conservative analysis that wasn't dire and wasn't super optimistic that was kind of right in the middle. So uh, we can always um, go back and recalculate the, the benefit of what the financial analyst did was that they provided us with an actual working model that um, we can as staff go in and put in new data and inputs as it changes. Okay, so I, I gather I've heard from both sides, the financial and the legal. So I'm here in the middle as a practical person and an applicator to my constituents who put me here on, at the dais. And so the financial part is part of the drive, and I get that. And the governor has said that the SCE, PG&E, San Diego, all of you people collecting will collect and be allowed to collect to compensate the municipalities and the people, myself is one, um, for their losses. So that process is three to five years. Uh, I think the judge just said that we will settle in the SCE lawsuit, we'll settle the fatalities first, and then we'll go for property damage awards after that. But once again, that's three to five years down the road, we don't know. But it's there. It's there. And I don't think that the need for us to worry about the revenue so far in advance should not include the fact that we are going to be rewarded, rewarded by the ratepayers. And I just would like that to be entered into the you know the conversation here is that we're looking down the road, and I get it what Reva said, she always be conservative. I get that. But being conservative also counts on the fact that the governor said the ratepayers are going to repay. So I'd like that to be entered into the conversation here. Is you that, just entered it. Yep, thank you. Um, so it appears to me that the middle ground is something like what Santa Monica has. And a number of people in here spoke about that and being responsible with the mom and pops. So there's a way to draft something here that won't incur a lot of challenge um, from the Coastal Commission. Uh, and I believe you can pull it off, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Mikey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, would you like to <coughs> make your comments? Uh, sure, okay. And uh, once again, I am sorry to be away. And I just want to start by thanking everybody for all the letters and, for, and thanking the speakers. I really appreciate all the thoughtful input on all sides and very entertained about some of the new good friends that were made at the at the uh, speaker's mic tonight, so uh, thank you to everyone on that. Um, I think the first, I have a lot of notes scattered around, so give me a second here. I think the first thing that was on my mind was what Rick asked. Uh, Trevor, are we like for like in Santa Monica? So I appreciate that answer. Um, having worked in Santa Monica for a long time, we aren't the same city. And uh, so that, to me, is an interesting one, and, and uh, we'll see what happens there. Um, so, yeah, anyhow, um, thanks for asking that question, Rick. I, I think where I'm going to start here is that my campaign platform that I ran on basically had to do with what I consider common sense regulation and safety for visitors to our town and was focused around STRs only being allowed by primary homeowners. Um, with some of the meetings I had and conversations I had preparing for this, one of the things that was said was that primary homeowner on its own is unenforceable, where that the that the home sharing is much more enforceable. I never really honestly felt I got a great answer to that, and I asked the question a number of times, because it seems to me the main issue with STRs probably has to do with enforcement. Um, so that, that point there has left me a little bit wondering um, over the petition, for example, 
and just primary homeowner. But the one thing that was said that really started to sink in and resonate is more the character of Malibu and more what kind of town we become. So um, once again, I appreciate everyone's input, but it's really helped help my mind in dealing with how, how do we move forward on this issue. I also agree with Rick. The family-owned home thing is, is, is difficult. Um, being somebody whose family's been in Malibu a long time, I've already been close to being in that same situation. I have not, but it, it, it is difficult after several generations. So I appreciate Rick's words on that and how hard it is. My question I have for Trevor is, if we craft an ordinance, is the fee we're allowed to charge for an STR permit, can you add the entire cost of enforcement into that fee? Are you talking about the amortizing, basically the code enforcement officer's cost into uh, what we would charge for fees? Yeah, let, let me reword that. So I know that we're only allowed to charge for permits, for fees on permits. We're only allowed to charge what it costs the city. Does including enforcement in that fee schedule, is, is that permissible? I, I think to an extent, depending on what, what we're putting there in terms of having a per, uh, person involved, um, if we're talking about hiring additional officers being part of that, we can probably amortize that across it. Um, if you're talking about, a, you're not talking about taking it, collecting costs of uh, enforcement against an individual, you're talking about the general permitting fee, right? All right. Okay. Anything else, Mikey? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, this connection is not wonderful. I apologize for that. I um, I do think enforcement is, is something we have to really. I, I am for regulating short-term rentals. I think enforcement's a really big part of it. So that part has to be really well thought through. I would say that. I do worry with the sort of Santa Monica model that it will also create its own form of, of cheating. I can see, you know, that sort of my crowd of people I know, um, people my age with families, typically often will rent their house for two weeks a year to go on vacation. Those kind of people I can see just, you know, would not be allowed under a Santa Monica ordinance because they typically rent the house. So I don't know how that actuates out in the community. But at this point, <clears throat> I think I am also heading towards a Santa Monica, the, the sort of the petition, I guess we call it, that formula. And I am curious to see what happens with it. I hope we don't end up stalled. But um, I see the merits of it, and that's where I sit at this moment. Thank you. Is that it? That is it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Skylar. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody who came and those who stayed and everybody watching and listening. Um, I really hope people have read the proposed ordinance. Um, there are a lot of safeguards written into it. Uh, I think it's broken down um, as it is with three types of permits and uh, different permit requirements depending on what they are. Uh, it gives us tools to deal with people like the one that I'm the most familiar with, the one uh, that is the neighbor of Joanne Gary and Joey Goodman. Nobody wants to live next to a property like that. I'm the first person to say that. Corporate owners for the sole purpose of short-term rental and making a profit are not welcome in this city as far as I'm concerned. 
Okay, that's not doing any of us any good. But we do have other situations besides primary residents um, and the Santa Monica home sharing model. We have multi-generation family trust owners. Um, and I don't know, but I think it's even possible that the initial owner was not a full-time primary resident. That property may have been originally bought as, as a weekend home, vacation home, summer home, something like that. Um, I really hope we can come to a conclusion tonight and not kick this can down the road again. Um, so I wanna ask Trevor a question. In the Santa Monica type of model, knowing that our cities are different, and I think they have something like 4,200 uh, hospitality accommodations, uh, hotels, youth hostels, motels, four, maybe five star, I don't know. We don't have that variety and we don't have that many. Um, if we were to do the home sharing type model, Trevor, um, you've already said, as far as you know, we would need a local coastal plan amendment. Yes? Yeah. What does that mean? What kind of time, what kind of process? Uh, I think Bonnie could talk better about, um, in terms of our planning calendar, how that would sort out. There would be um, a number of steps that we'd have to go through. Um, Ballpark-wise, I would, I would estimate uh, at least 12 months to, or longer, um, in part because of um, having just one by one. The council would need to initiate the ordinance, then it would uh, start at uh, the races, and then go to the planning commission, and um, we could combine the planning commission and city council hearings on that with um, the ordinance itself. So we have to initiate the local coastal program amendment first because we haven't done that before and then pair that with the ordinance as it goes through um, planning commission city council and then it would need to be um, submitted to the coastal commission for certification and that, pro that part of the process we don't have control over. Um, I'm not sure what their timeline would be for um, processing that amendment. And then um, depending on how they received the amendment in terms of um, whether they feel like it was consistent with the Coastal Act, they may um, send it back to the city with suggested modifications or I think there's only one instance where we didn't get suggested modifications back from the Coastal Commission and that was with our fire rebuild amendments, but they generally have um, modifications um, anytime we submit something. So we should expect um, comments from them to come back. Okay, thank you. Um, I do like this proposal for the fact that it delineates um, primary residents versus non-primary and multifamily. Um, and I wanna make sure everybody realizes a non-primary residence in resident in this proposal would be allowed to rent between April 1st and September 30th, not year round. Multifamily, the proposal here is for a maximum of two units. I think it's hard to say 10% or 20% because that may not work out to even one unit. Um, and the fact that in this proposal, a non-primary resident permit or a multifamily permit can be revoked or denied for two citations or violations instead of three. There are ways of, of further restricting the properties that are not occupied by full-time residents. And I think that's important. Um, and the effect of that is that you have to answer to your neighbors when you come home and there's been some bad situation going on during your rental. Of course, the bad situation could happen with a full-time occupant anyway, as in the case of someone learning how to play the violin 
or the drums next door to you, which I've had happen. So, um, Skyler, I'd like to hear your comments before I say any more. Okay. Um, well, I would like to make some sort of a motion that kind of goes in the direction of passing an ordinance, so I guess maybe a little bit similar to what's been referenced in Santa Monica, the home sharing stuff, and see where the vote is on that. Um, I know that there's a couple different provisions that are in here um, that have been commented on by people. Um, and one thing that's in here from before, and I was just curious to hear from the council members on this before I made that motion, was in regards to on-site wastewater treatment systems. If we know that rental properties oftentimes have a larger impact on their septic systems, do you guys want to require them to have on-site wastewater permits, operating permits or not? I'm curious to hear from the council specifically on that issue. I think it would be a wise move to make that as part of the ordinance. I'm, I'm aware uh, that this it's is in there. Mikey. I'm just I would be in favor of that. How people feel about that. Say it again, Mikey. Uh, I would be in favor of that. Sorry to talk over you. Yeah, I'd be in favor of it too. I think that, you know, with all of the turnover, et cetera, it's important and it is in ours. I mean, uh, Karen's kind of talking about looking at aspects of ours and I'm talking about, you know, the Santa Monica one. So I think we, as we move forward in this conversation, we've got to kind of clarify some things because our old one had non-primary use, non-primary residential use and, you know, I'm not in favor of that. But I'm, I am in favor of the on-site wastewater treatment. Do you want to provide direction if, if it's going towards a Santa, uh, a home sharing style, but there are parts of the other ordinances proposed that you'd be, you would want staff to explore integrating into a home sharing type ordinance? Yes, Trevor. Okay. So I don't know if in our packet here, there's direct note on the home sharing stuff. I don't think so. We had that, I think the item was brought when it came to the council before. Just let me know what page it's on. Maybe page 68. Is that the most recent, do you know, Bonnie? The, the um, last staff report is that we brought to city council. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, but there was a list of items that were going to be included into the permit or we could go through the actual proposed ordinance itself and you could it's on page 20 of the current staff report or 9 of 13 of the old staff there we go okay well yes we're going to require a permit we're going to require that that permit be given to the owner um, I don't know, I don't think you can make a clarification that the owner must be an individual as opposed to being a corporation. I think that legally you run into some challenges there. Is that correct, Trevor? Um, it d depends on how we're going to use it. Well, I think the primary residence thing is, is what we need to focus on. Yeah, so I... a primary resident only. Is that Well, I'm correct? saying that you can only give the permit to a primary resident. Okay, so we're, we're whether it's, I think we said before whether it's held as a corporation, but you would need to have an individual who is the would qualify as the primary resident in order to get that status. Correct. So I want to be uh, clear on that. Um, is it consensus on? Should we take consensus on these items? Sure. Mikey, did you hear that question? Uh, could you repeat it one more time, please? We're asking for consensus on the requirement that it, the person being issued the permit is a primary resident. Yes, yes, I thought that was part of it for sure, yes. I believe that is in per, it pertains to the septic question. Okay. Well, that, that pertains into giving the permit 
at, at all is going to be given to an individual who's a primary resident in Malibu. They're going to get a permit in order to operate an STR. The on-site wastewater requirement is going to be a requirement of the property no matter what, if they want to be eligible to have short-term rentals. So if you want to be eligible to have, even apply to have a permit to do short-term rental, you must have an on-site wastewater operating permit, which means your septic system must be in compliance, working, et cetera. Do you want to use the same definition that we uh, used uh, in the draft ordinance a year ago for primary residents? I don't think... I think that there's specific um, language that Trevor has as to what's been tested in the court as to what qualifies for primary residence. I think that that's the language that should be used. All right. I think we we looked at that when when that language was proposed in the in the draft ordinance. So we can look and see if it needs to be updated at all. Yes. Let's run it by what they used in Santa Monica and make sure that you know we're as close to that court tested lingo as we could be. May I ask, are you talking about uh, here at the top of page three? Claim the property as a primary residence for at least 185 days per year. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Tyler, is that what you mean? Okay. Um, so if we keep going down the list of items that are in our draft, um, I don't know exactly how to incorporate in the part of the ordinance, um, just in terms of the language of where the, the owner must be on site. Um, so you're saying for number two, rather than there's agent, we're talking about the, what page you guys own themselves? Uh, page uh, 20, right? So we'll, yeah. Can I ask another question? Um, are we um, talking about a, a rental as a home sharing would be that the owner is in the same unit um, as opposed to whether there's a guest house on the property with and the a primary resident lived in the main house? Could they rent the guest house out if they were in the primary residence? I think that's fine. Either. You have to say even the same room with the people. You know, we have to be on the same property. We could make this very interesting, folks. J just want to make sure we cover everything. Okay, so if we're moving along through that. Um... So there was consensus for uh, you'd want the contact information for the owner who's going to be on site and that also uh, not in the same building would be okay if they're on the same property, i.e., like guest house. What about in an apartment building? We're going to get there. Okay, we're not there. C yet. Could I ask one question about that? Do we have any idea how many current uh, short-term rental situations fall into that category? Which category, Mayor? Um, primary residence and the owner is on the same property at the time. Um, I think it's somewhere between uh, 5 and 10% of our total rentals based on the data that we're getting from host compliance right now. So, Okay, so that's a major change, just so we're all aware of that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, when you get an on-site wastewater treatment system permit, how long is that good for, Bonnie? going to reference the, I believe that was discussed in the September agenda report from last year. I think they're a two-year permit. I was just going to say that I have no issue with the STR permit being valid for two, two years, but I think that they should have dues annually. So I don't know if that makes it more confusing or not, but I just, I have no issue with that. How everybody else feels. Um, but if you're going to require them, I think, to have the um, on-site wastewater 
treatment system permitting, then that would make the most sense to me that those can kind of go along together in terms of a timeline. So you're saying there would be a renewal every two years? And yes, so a two-year renewal. In that situation, um, there were provisions in there about non-renewal, and so you'd have to rely on re revocation pro um, procedures. Yes. Councilmember Peak, the wastewater is an annual permit. No, uh, in the just found the information the the September report. It states that for a conventional wastewater system, the operating permit must be renewed every five years, while and the permit for an advanced system must be renewed every three years. I was wrong. Bonnie, does it have any reference to communal uh, treatment systems? For instance, in a, in a 10 or 20 home subdivision where they share a treatment system like Trancus or um, Malibu West, some of those areas? I don't think it got into that type of a system. It was focused on um, the more of a single family property. But those systems have operating permits. You have, if you have a multifamily right. property, those systems that you're referencing, Jeff Jefferson, all have operating permits. I understand, but then will the regulation have any bearing on, a, on one property that's inside that system? Yeah, if the system's not working, then you're not going to get a permit. Okay, but what if you're overusing it and you can't, you can't, Delineate who's contributing more, who's who's overusing it. Well, you can't but, you can't well, go inside the system because if it's a the master system's system. system's not working, then it's not going to get a permit. Then you're not going to be allowed to, to do this there. Moreover, if you're in a multifamily situation or multiple houses connected to a larger system and it's not working, they're not going to let you live there. That would be a question more for Bonnie, but if we had, if Malibu West system was failing, we wouldn't have 200 homes and people living in there. I know that, and it gets a permit from the county. We're aware of that, but we have a copy of the permit, and we would be notified if it was failing. Multifamily and condo systems require um, operating permits every two years, but I, I don't think that is the same thing as the... Um, I don't know if you call it package plan or whatever would um, serve Malibu West. Well, you could research that and get us whatever language yes. is. And I don't even know if, do they even allow short-term rentals in Malibu West? Mikey may know the answer to that. Uh, in Malibu West, they tried to ban short-term rentals, but there was a state law that disallowed HOAs from doing that. I don't know the details beyond yeah. that. So, Jeez. copy. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you're looking to have the permit run on the same basis as the OWTS permit? Yes. Is what you're looking at? Staff can look at options for doing that and whether that would be a renewal on that basis or maybe a interim every year you just need to pay the money to get your extra year renewal rather than a full uh, Correct. evaluation is what you're looking at yes. I think staff can take that and put together um, what would be guidance the most... in terms of the timing okay thank you but you're looking basically the idea is you don't want it to have everyone resubmit everything every year um, but travel on the same basis as long as OWTS is in place yes um, I think that the on-site parking requirement is wise um, I yeah, I think it's smart to have on-site parking. Uh, do the contact information thing still in the file? I mean, I don't. You, whether or not you want to give your contact information to your neighbors is, I think the that can. Does that become irrelevant? I think it becomes irrelevant because I think if we're going into a, a situation where if people have a few violations and their permits removed, they're going to probably want to be able to resolve anything with their neighbors. And that's, you know, and not, you know, hey, if you don't really don't get along with your neighbor, it's not. Yeah, exactly. So no distribution of the contact information is required? No. If the owner's required to be on site, then exactly. I think they know how to get a hold of them. Yes. I think that that would apply. 
I, I do want to just interject one thing. Um, if we're talking about a current um, short-term rental climate or environment of 5 to 10 percent falling into this description, then, you know, it's fine. We do just need to be thinking about the adjustments make, we would make in terms of reduced revenue. I, I think we understand that as a city, and I also think that some of the operators of these will modify their situation so that they can still do it, and it will, that number will actually increase. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we say that. Um, Does it have to be the property owner living on site, or can it be an agent of the property owner that lives on site? I think that a lot of people are going to want property owner, but I... I mean, it could be your son. Some people have a caretaker or someone who lives on the property full time. Yeah. That would they be, be another if, if it's a property owner or their host that's on site, I have no issue with that. But the person that gets the permit is a property owner, and that's their main residence. I think we've established that as for who gets the permit. The permit's issued to somebody where their primary residence is Malibu. So the primary right? resident is the person who has to Yeah, but site. if that person wants to designate their caretaker to be the person that deals with the tenant and they're not there then the whole time then that's I don't have an issue with that that also allows where we are into the situation where people want to um, you know lease or short-term rent their home and then they want to travel they can designate somebody to stay in the guest house or whatever else during that time that can be their host Michael you have something to say come to the mic I want that job they'll be gone all the time Skyler you're taking the teeth out of this thing uh, the petition uh, has a, uh, a provision there that was developed in New Orleans for this exact problem. So it's your primary residence where you live, your usual place of return for six months of the year. But you can designate a third party operator. So it's a, two, a dual permit system. So that when you can't be there, that operator is there 24 7. They live there. And it's the same uh, that would, we would apply to um, multifamily. So you would have to designate someone who is on site all the time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So it has to be either the property owner or their designated agent. Correct. On, on site. Correct. Okay. Yeah, okay. Where are we? Are we moving down to number three or up? Eight. Uh, yeah, we're down. Number eight. Uh, yes, number seven. Uh, yes, number eight. Yes, number eight. Okay. Yes, number Code eight. of conduct. Um, I mean, I would say yes to number nine. I, I don't know. I, I think that, like, somehow, like, in the permit, the, the permit should be granted in a way that says, you know, if you're giving a, a – the permits for a five bedroom house that you, you know, you just say it's for you know, maximum of 10 guests. I think that's what's designed out yeah. of this. Um, so that's, I would say yes to that. Um, and you're saying you'd want it uh, specified on the permit, you know, they'd submit whatever it is or? Yeah, I mean, that's a staff thing or okay. whatnot. Um, okay, staff to determine. I don't know how online, how they, if they, require the, the permit number to be displayed or ho however that works. Um, I don't know if how like, you know, your the platforms get the permit number or get the list of. If we're, if, if we're going to move the system, I would suggest doing similar to Santa Monica and yeah. San Francisco in terms of this, it, we would have a, an approved list that um, would require the, the platforms to only process transactions with uh, approved list okay. individuals. Um, I would say yes to number 11. Yes to number 11. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would say yes to number 12. I agree. All right, absolutely. And 13. Yes. Yeah, that's important. Yes. And 14. To number 14. So 
So in regards to multifamily, I think that it's fair to do um, I mean, I don't know if we want to do one unit up to a certain amount and then a percentage thereafter. Let's reference the petition these guys for them to see if that's one unit up sense. to five and then six or more is limited at 20%. It's an item 2D. Um, multifamily limited to one unit for any building up to five units. And if you have six or more, then it could be 20% is what they've said in their petition. Are you, the uh, the previous owners have proposed requiring them to produce long term leases for the other units, so you didn't have people that would have multiple units empty and say they're only running a one a, one unit out, and then really they're rotating it through. Do you like that requirement that this requires proof that the other units are rented on a long term basis to rent on a short term basis other parts other units? You know, I think that. People are in this zone where if they're knowingly giving us false documents that their permits, you know, entirely revoked. I don't, you know, I don't. If you think it, you know, Rick, if you we want to get copies of the leases, I just it just starts to be a paperwork. Yeah, I think it would be Yeah, it's, it would require a, a, I think an attestation. I think we require the actual leases. I can't remember. So, okay. Trevor, or Bonnie. Do you see that as an enforcement issue? Um, I think in the last, in the September version of the ordinance, we figured out some way to address that issue. I mean, it, it it's a little complicated, but it's. I think we asked for. Maybe we did. We have them at the property owner attest. Yeah, they just had to attest that the others were rented on a long term. Basis. Yeah. So it provides some backstop without having to get us into looking at people's leases and verifying it. And then if they violate their attestation, then it puts them in difficult spots. So then the difference is um, instead of, I think the previous ordinance had said uh, two units in the multifamily, this would change it to one in one unit is allowed for. Now, the previous ordinance banned short term rentals in multifamily containing three or more units. The Except the, for home sharing. The uh, September no. version of the ordinance, um, we're, this, what you we've been referencing here is is a, a little bit earlier version of the staff report from the September, but um, the September draft ordinance allowed a maximum of two units and a, a building with three or more units, regardless of whether it was a three unit building or a 20 unit building. The most you could do was two. And less than three, only one. No, it, it was, it just said two. Even if you had three, you three units, you could do up to two, no matter what the size of the building. On page 47 of the staff report, um, uh, it summarizes the changes that were made between July and September last year. And number three is a multifamily permit allows a maximum of two units to be rented on a multifamily property, but only if all other units have been rented on a long-term basis. Okay, so stick with uh, the multifamily proposal from the previous ordinance. Well, yep, I agree with that, yes. Speak, go. Please come to the mic. To the mic. the staff report, 50% of multifamily are already STRs. So what I'm proposing in the petition is to bring that down to 20%. So one per per multifamily under five and 20% above. And that takes care of SUPEC and it takes care of good landlords that are doing it and it gets rid of the hotels. He was asked to come That's to what the I'm mic. Saying. I've, we've, we've gone over this a hundred times. We've, we've had that Sue, four can you times. come up real quick? I, no. I have a question for you. What, what, where we're at is 50% right now. There's 500 apartments, and that's what we talked about in September, and that's what we talked about in July. So we want to bring that down to make some more apartments available, but it's an artificial cap at 20%, and that's Michael. reasonable for the, for the Coastal Commission. I hear you. Thank you. Uh, Sue? 
Yes. And some of the, the buildings or the, the apartments that you have, how many units are there in those? <clears throat> like what's the maximum number of units? Well, we have, we have two buildings with six each and we rent two as vacation rentals. Then we have a 12 unit building and we rent three. Okay, so it'd be a net difference of one if we went with what was proposed, but if we went with what Michael's talking about, you would get? One, one. You'd get one, one, 20 two. 20% of six is one. I got it, I got it. Thank yeah. you. He, he, he said to me before the hearing, don't worry, I have you covered. Support this, but uh, I said I have to read it carefully. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see, I see with going what we had talked about before of a maximum of two units is being. Okay. The, okay. on two, the, yeah. the two units uh, system from the previous ordinance. Yeah. yeah. From the multifamily. Okay. I'm good with that. Mikey. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't mind the 20% either. Um, but um, I'll go with consensus. Well, no, it's good. It brings it down. You know, it keeps it simple. Keeps well, the, it the other thing is, I don't, we don't have a lot of apartment buildings that have you know ten plus units. So we have more of the three unit buildings, four unit buildings than we do the twenty plus unit buildings, which I think that would be a very limited number. So. That seems fair to say. Okay. Two, as long as all the other rent units are running on long term. All right, what number are we on? 16. We're on 16. I'd say we can go with that. I Yeah, I agree with that. And 17? Yes, they, they go together. I'm fine with that. Yeah, sorry, one second. That's fine. 19's fine? Uh, I think that was 18. Yeah, additional 19. penalty, yeah. Yeah, 19's fine. I don't know if the fee structure should be higher or that's fair, Trevor. I would defer to whatever legal advice you guys would put into that. Which one are you looking at? 21. 21, the okay, fine, so $1,000 okay. a day. We could propose uh, a fine also that's proportionate to um, the rent charge for the unit, things like that. We can propose other options for that also. You mean like $1,000 a day or the daily rate, whichever is higher? We could do something along those lines. And we could pro staff can have a number of options for the fining. I don't think you need to settle on that today. I think that what Karen said is, Intelligent. It yes. we'll makes sense. That option. Okay. Thank you. Twenty-two. Yes. We, otherwise, we might be losing money. Can Just you legally that. do that? Yeah. Twenty-two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you're, you're bringing them out of your property. You're responsible for how your property is. Got it. Same as under our code. It's like getting your car to you pay yep. the fee. Yep. <sighs> and then 23. Yeah, 23. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what else we got to do? I think then the... Um, Mikey, do you have anything to add to any of those things we just went through? Not at this point, thank you. Okay. The, the motion would then be to um, direct staff to initiate an LCP amendment and zone text amendment um, along these lines. Um, also, with an examination of the, the Santa Monica ordinance um, and the aspects of that, and, the, and you're bringing the home sharing into it. And I don't, I don't know if we need to have this go to Zeracis. I'm fine with this going straight to planning. Unless you, Bonnie, you think that it needs to go to Zeracis. Uh, well, Zeracis is sitting right uh, up th here. That's my point. <laughs> we're, so, we're adding more and more time to this 
We can take it straight to planning if you if that's the council's preference, or if you'd like to have Zeresis. Zeresis typically um, takes public comment and things like that. So if you want to have that discussion in that forum, we can do that as well. I think it, I mean public comment can be heard at planning. That's fine with me. That'll take that's thank you. That'll take two to three months off of this. Do you want to discuss transition period? Is there consensus on going directly to the Planning Commission, Commissioner Pearson? I mean, sorry, uh, Council Should we take Pearson? a roll call vote on that part? I'm good with that. I'm good with that too. Okay. That was all. Me too. Yeah. All members. Um, so I think that the the what was the last issue that we had to deal with transition period. Yeah, the transition period. So I I think that the the challenge with just saying a flat out transition period right now has to do with us getting an LCP back from <coughs> um, the, the state and getting that approved and that could be anywhere from one to two years especially if we have revisions that need to go with that so I think it's probably wise for us to say that that this should come into effect you know within three to six months of an LCA LCPA being approved Okay, so the proposal uh, the, the ordinance would come into effect between six and twelve months after the three and six. So between three and six months after the LCP amendment comes through and have staff provide analysis about uh, where to recommend for the amortization period. Correct. So after the whole LCP amendment thing happens, then another three to six months. Yeah, because oh. I, don't, I don't think. Yeah. We're going to have like a, we don't have a, I can't say like, oh, this is going to happen in January of 2021 or something like that. So I think it's fair to, once we know that that's going to get approved, that'll allow our staff to one, finalize everything internally and to go to the public and say, you need to prepare, you know, these are the rules come in three to six months from now. And you got to remember if people are going to need to get their, on-site wastewater treatment system inspections and other things for properties that don't have that right now, that's going to take some time. Okay, uh, Reva, do you have something you want to add? Um, yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, one of the things that would be really helpful for staff is in this interim period to have some enforcement tools um, that we've discussed before because right now we don't have any way of addressing the bad actors. So I don't know if uh, council could consider um, something that wouldn't uh, necessarily require an LCPA that would just be perhaps a ZTA type of issue that would give us some sort of enforcement ability and I know that city attorney is looking at me with a puzzled look but I, I, it would be wonderful if I mean this takes us six months or nine months or 12 months we're still just living in the same problem scenario that we have right do, now Trevor do you think that we could propose and maybe pass something right now that says if you have two or more violations of noise complaints or anything like that in regards to SDRs that your permit is revoked well we don't have a a permit system in so we need to implement a permit system first is what would have to happen so if we're talking about putting in a permitting system that we would be enforcing in that's basically the same thing that we're talking about here you'd be putting in two systems you'd be putting in a new permit system and then at the same time you're processing a ZTA for the and a LCP amendment for the zoned uh, sorry for the LCP amendment with that other zone text amendment if you're looking about just adding resources or something that something could be done but in terms of adding to the code I mean, could you get any fines in place or anything? Can we enforce any of, like, is there any way for us to in, be not increase, but be very stern we, on, you know, could, hey, uh, you get a noise complaint. I don't know what like, the maximum. It might be useful. Maybe to Mike direct, could attest to what that is, but. It might be useful to direct staff to look at things that could be brought in on a more short-term basis to increase fines for nuisance type violations or things along those lines. A nuisance type violation triggers a full code enforcement you have uh, to create something the sheriffs can enforce yeah because if we don't get LEO on in this we're undermanned we're understaffed with code enforcement as it is you're asking us to kick this down the road a year year and a half we won't even be here Rick Skyler and myself unless Rick runs again we're not going to be here to to bring this to our constituents so okay, okay I have a question it might be for Michael do you know of any other cities or Trevor or anybody uh, who've uh, implemented an interim um, ordinance or, or something because everything does take so long? Yeah, um, I do not. You generally, uh, council passes a law 
and it goes into effect three to six months later, unless they have, like Los Angeles, uh, done a deal to partner enforcement with Airbnb, who then asked for extension, 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 uh, until the point where they say, we just can't comply. You're not suggesting that, I know. So, hmm? You're not suggesting that, right? No, I'm suggesting yeah. pass an ordinance and start enforcing it. But if we have to go for uh, to get a, a LIP cha a change or whatever, and it's going to take that long, it's like doing nothing. So Yeah, can know. we pass the ordinance, put it into effect in a shorter time frame while we're still getting the uh, official LCPA done in the background? Yes, that's why I asked that in the very beginning of Trevor. <laughs> uh, the, the ZTA would be contingent upon the LCP amendment being approved. So that's yes. So you, you would pass them together, but it doesn't come into effect until the LCP amendment is approved by the Coastal Commission. That's no. Yeah. But remember, the, remember what Airbnb said about the Coastal Commission, quasi. I mean, if we look at their formatting and the way they defend themselves as a profit margin and, and the way they operate, can't we start operating that way? I mean, there's gonna be skullduggery here unless we start protecting our residents. That's what it's coming down to. That's why we're here. That's why I asked you in the very beginning. We can do this and wait for the challenges. So in other words, you're saying just make our local ordinance uh, without the LCPA? You're going to add a lawsuit will take that long, as evidenced by what happened in Santa Monica, Los Angeles, Denver, Boston, uh, all, all those cities that have gone through this. It takes that long for them to come to the processing table as long as it, and it would take us that long to do the LCP. Trevor, can you comment on the risk level of that? I, I would recommend if we're moving to a system that's going to be it's going to be changing um, to a home share situation where we're talking about five to ten percent of the current um, rentals would currently qualify for that. That that would that we're going to run into issues with um, that requiring an LCP amendment if it's required to have an LCP amendment, we should go through with that and not just wait for us to be challenged in court. And, you know, we have an obligation to follow the laws of the state and of our LIP. We have an obligation to, you know, enforce that and to um, adhere to it. So we can provide more analysis on, you know, this particular um, proposal, you know, when this comes back to the Planning Commission, and it can be a decision that the council makes when it actually comes forward, once it's been um, fully put together, we can put together a full analysis for you, and there might be developments. We might have a ruling from Del Mar, we may hear more from Santa Barbara, we may have more information at our hands um, in that situation by the time it comes back for us to make a, so we initiate the LCP amendment here, and then it comes back to the council for the council to finally approve it. Trevor, um, I'm wondering if there, is it possible to begin um, the creation of the permit system without the implementation of the primary residency home sharing kind of aspect of it and so that it's sort of two-tiered so we do the administrative part and then we've got the ability to revoke permits and, and things I like mean, we, that and you could you could you could pair the rules later you're talking about pairing two ordinances you would put mm -hmm. you would put one into effect now a zta similar to the ordinance that was proposed yeah um and at the same time you also bring forward the other ZTA, which would take precedence once the LCP amendment is, is right. Uh, That's what I was suggesting. Approved. What could we do in the interim while the other one moves along? So, if it's the council's has interest in that, then you could put forward, you know, a ZTA similar to what was um, previously before this council, with the understanding that the that it would be superseded by the uh, Santa Monica style ordinance once the LCP amendment um, is certified. That sounds like a good idea to me. John, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, at a prior meeting, Christy said that uh, other than that, there was a question on the RR zones, but the, any commercial zone, it was already prohibited by the by our coastal LIP that, that short-term rentals are not allowed in commercial. So you can at least enforce our current law. And this is per Christy. Our current law is you can't have them. And there's a question on the residential. So you can at least cover multifamily. 
So that's the idea of, of what the other ordinance does is that it, 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 it specifies how it's prohibited in the multifamily because what we've relied on previously from the city is that a hotel or motel use is not allowed. And that's why it's-, it's Excuse me, could I ask whoever that is to silence their phone? Thank you. Trevor, please continue. So in, in terms of, it'll be difficult for us to enforce without, a, a, without having a zone text amendment on the books laying that out. It's gonna be difficult to go into court and prosecute somebody for doing something that we have been allowing historically. Now we're changing how we're enforcing that. That's sort of what we're asking to do if we're not actually putting a ZTA forward at the same time, which is what we'd be relying on for the extra enforcement. So we could do this two-pronged system where we bring forward the two ZTAs and the LCP amendment at the same time. You know, the ZTA actually would move you know, significantly faster than the LCP amendment. So then you would be able to enforce that um, in the interim once that goes through. And you would still want to have an amortization period for that. Council, so, anyone want to comment on that? So if we propose doing the ZTA, Bonnie, what's the timeline on that? For the new one or for the old one? Well, they would come forward together. So they would go forward. It's just the the new the Santa Monica style of a phase in period. Would it would need would be dependent upon the LCP amendment coming coming forward. Okay. Um, yeah, it will need a little time to um, kind of mash these two things together, and um, we could take it then straight to planning commission unless you want to reconsider having the races look at it, but. We could go straight well, the, to the, planning the commission. prior ordinance actually already went through the planning commission, so that could be brought up actually back on a much more rapid basis. If we're going to do something very similar to what was previously proposed, that could come back to the council to put in as an interim basis, and it could start to be enforced. And then in the meantime, the other ordinance proceeds through that would supersede it. Or that. I'm going to go that I feel like this is getting too complicated. We need to make it simple and stay with one thing. The one thing is to go to the planning and get an LCPA done. So that's where I'm at. And I, cause I just don't, I don't see us having the teeth and what we want to do in the short term. I just don't feel that it's there. Um, Skylar, I agree with you. I'd love to see this be simple and quick. Um, but I think without something in the meantime, we're going to be right where we are today or however long it takes. Reba, can you chime in, please? Or more? I, I mean, I understand the desire to keep it simple, and I'm sorry if I turned the uh, conversation sideways. I was just trying to see if there was any options that we could put in something in place, but it sounds pretty complicated, so I guess the, it would be up to the council of what you want to do if you want to just leave everything as is, and we'll... Uh, do our best to move forward with bringing the Santa Monica style ordinance and LCPA forward as quickly as possible. And if you don't, if you want something in the interim, then we can do that as well. So, sorry, I'm not. I'm giving you a non-answer. The interim is a is a balancing act, providing something for everybody in this room this evening and everybody that's watching. It shows that we're going to move forward with some type of effort. The effort may not be perfect, Skyler. It may not be perfect, Trevor, but we're doing something as a council. And I think that's what most of the population wants to hear, that we've done something. We won't even be here when this gets done. So I'd like to move forward with anything. Karen, you're right. Uh, let's, let's do something now. I, I really believe that's what we need, something. Okay, you got okay. something you want to chime um, in with? Yeah, just okay, and then I'd like to see if Mikey has something to say. Whether or not you have a first prong, the second prong you, you could pass contingent on getting the the, the, co the the amendment from Coastal, and that would build in your amortization period. So you could say, we've already got it, we're waiting for Coastal, then you wouldn't have to add the extra three, six months, whatever, on the back end, because you'd say it's, it's already built in. I, I, I just wonder, since we can't predict that date, how do we give people a, a timeline? But but just tell them what. <laughs> and I worry that three months is, is too short of a period anyhow. I mean, it has to be more like six, I would think. 
I, I tend to agree with Mikey, six months. I mean, people book things in advance and, and we need time to get ready as a city. I don't think three months is enough time, personally. Well, six months will get us before summer next year if we start now. And that's the peak period and we should have something in, in place well, as soon as possible. And if six months is what we can get an agreement on, then let's go for that. Okay, I, I don't think we have, can six months is fine from whatever an LCPA gets done. So if you guys want to go with doing a ZTA simultaneously that's like an old version of something and then come back with a new version, we can do that. I don't think we should be wasting staff's time on that. I think that we should press forward with the LCPA and know that this is going to be happening in a year and a half from now and send it to planning and move on from there. And I think that that's the most efficient way of moving this forward. And we must have the sheriffs enforce the rules that are on the books now when it comes to dealing with these in certain zones. If Mrs. Gary has to make another phone call, I mean, that's just like, it's, it's painful for her and we need to, you know, make sure that stuff is getting done about it. Skylar, I'm sorry, I, I disagree, Skylar. I disagree, Skylar. If the sheriffs could Propose enact something. and enforce the enforcement that they could right now, we wouldn't have the situation that we're in. They don't have anything right now. They have nothing. They don't have municipal code. Jefferson, I'm trying to give it to them by getting us an LCPA that has all this stuff that's outlined into it, in it. It's right. a year and a we half away, to. sir. A year and a half I away. don't have a way of doing it quicker. Okay, just for the record, Mikey, would you like to weigh in? Uh, I'm with uh, Jefferson and Karen on this one. I, I think we don't know how long the LCPA will take, you know, so I think we need to act now. Personally, I think it's the prudent thing to do. So with the motion then to bring back the LCPA, to initiate the LCP amendment and zone text amendment has been described the Santa Monica style um, modifications to the proposed ordinance, start that process for the interim, bring back the previous ZTA that's already been before the Planning Commission, bring that before the City Council to um, move forward with that, which was um, designed to bring enforcement to our current system and put that in place with the understanding it would be superseded once the new ordinance goes through. Is that the motion? I second. I say yes. Okay, okay. We, we have a, okay, wait, Trevor can't make the motion, so Jefferson? I have to stay awake. I make that motion. Okay, do we have a second? I will second. Okay, now we need a roll call vote. Councilmember Wagner? Yes. Councilmember, P Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Mullen? I'm going to abstain. I don't even sure what we're talking about. I'm sorry, was that a yes or no? Okay. Oh. I'm going to abstain on that one. And Councilmember Peak? Abstain. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. So, so to clarify, that's going to initiate the Santa Monica style LCPA and zone text amendment to start but it's also going to bring back a ZTA for the previously proposed. Oh, so that was the big vote on everything. Okay, well then. Let me, that, let me clarify that, my no, vote. I didn't I'm know what we were voting. Wait a minute. I'm, wait, I'm going to be wait, voting wait. yes for the LCPA yeah. portion, and I, oh, the ZTA portion I do not care for. No, I'm I afraid vote, we can't do I that. vote yes. Can, 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 let, can we, Kelsey, Kelsey can should we just it? clarify that yeah, why don't we for the record? That, let let me record. clarify the motion and then um, let's do a roll call vote. All right. So, uh, Council Member Wagner, I understand this to be your motion would be to initiate an LCP amendment and zone text amendment directly to the Planning Commission as um, with the Santa Monica style. Uh, modifications to the previous ordinance as discussed by consensus by the council and also to direct staff to bring back the previously proposed um, ZTA restricting short-term rentals to the council directly to um, be put in place now with the understanding it would be superseded when the new Santa Monica style ordinance is uh, processed that was the motion okay 
Do we need to go through the roll call again? Yes, and please. Okay. Thank you now that Kelsey, I please. Ma Mayor, for our, that was, uh, you second, that's the motion that you were seconding? Yes. Okay. Mayor, Wa uh, Council Member Wagner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Yes. Uh, Council Member Mullen. Yes. Council Member Peek. Yes to the LCPA and no to the ZTA. Make it a no, it's a no. It's, it's one motion, so you're saying no? Okay, that's a no. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, moving on with the agenda. Um, we have a one public speaker on item 2A who misunderstood the start time of the meeting, Joe DeMore. You win the most patient person of the evening award. <laughs> Mayor Farrah, can I make one point? It's about temporary signs. I just want to say one thing, make a correction to uh, what Mr. Mullen said. It's not a cash cow for the family. We have family members at the house about 200 days out of the year, and we rent it to pay the taxes so they can enjoy it. Thank you. And you had to do something tonight to keep the people from leaving. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for squeezing me and Mayor and the council members. Trevor, you got me here. So here we go. Anyway, yes, I wanted to, uh, I, I made a couple of notes here um, that might expedite things. Just forgot my passcode because I'm a little tired. Uh, yeah. It's only my birthday, I should know it. Well, I'd like to talk to you about the ongoing crisis that we're having in our community. Next week will mark the first anniversary of our Malibu fires. Um, as you all know, of course. I guess I was naive about the recovery time, and like my other fellow small business owners, we kept throwing money into our businesses to keep the doors open. But now it looks like there is no immediate end in sight, so I volunteered to speak on behalf of the other other guys in town to check out the possibilities of temporary signs. Now, I was told the other day by someone, well, everyone in Malibu knows who you are. And I said, that's true, but there aren't enough people in Malibu to support my business or any of the small businesses. We always counted on tourists and passerbyers. What I mean by passerbyers are people that are in LA that want to cut through PCH to go live in, where they live in Agora or Thousand Oaks or Calabasas or uh, further on, they pass through Malibu, and they don't know I'm there, and they don't know the other guys are there. But we were able to survive before because we had a full population in Malibu. We don't have that now. So what I'm asking for, and, and with help with the city, to get the city involved, um, you've heard of the, the saying, Boston strong, and everywhere there's been a problem. Well, we have a Malibu strong. My my. My proposal is there are, as you know, there are five major entries into Malibu. You know, from the west we have Oxnard, and from the south we have Santa Monica, I mean the east, Santa Monica and the Palisades, and then we have the three canyons. So what I was hoping is that there'd be a Malibu strong sign built on our property as they enter those five neighborhoods saying Malibu strong. As you pass through Malibu, please patronize our local merchants. And then we could have the same Malibu sign strong, Malibu strong sign on our sign, and then saying Demore's Pizza or whoever it is. By the way, I had three or four other people coming, but none of them live in Malibu, and they got stuck with they couldn't get in or out at the time because they all came around five o'clock. So what I'm hoping is that we could uh, people don't see us, you know, and uh, these are tough times and. Okay, it may look, I mean, I'm not expecting it to look like Las Vegas where there's a billboard all the way up and down the Pacific Coast Highway. That's what your shirt says. 
Well, this is my Vegas store, which, yeah, I, I, I just grabbed the shirt real fast and you ended up with my Vegas shirt. But, um, um, Joe, yeah. sorry, three minutes. I've been here three hours. I know. Let me I know, I know you're tired, but I've been here since five o'clock. All I'm asking for is that we participate together in a partnership with you people, the city, and the merchants. If not, I mean, if you think it's an eyesore to see signs, how about an eyesore to see all these vacant uh, locations? Because we're all going out of business. If I would, I, I've put every dime I have, my insurance money, everything I have to keep the doors open. And now there's no end in sight. You're looking at another two years. You've been slow with the permits, slow with the building. These people aren't coming back anytime soon. We're going to have a ghost town here. So I'm asking for, let's do it for a year and see what happens. But we've, we've got to have some outside signage uh, to catch these people passing through Malibu. That's my case. Okay, thank you. And thanks for your patience. Okay. When will I hear from you? Send us a drawing. Show us a drawing of what you're talking about. What am I talking about? Oh, oh, a, a drawing. Okay. Yeah. Joe, it would be best for you to send us like an email if you want to send the council an email. And all of our emails are on the city's website. Maybe okay. a, a rendering and, and more yeah, details like a about rendering what you're, what you're talking about. Uh, of the uh, Malibu Strong sign that you'd put on all five entrances to Malibu? Sure. Saying to patronize, I mean, you guys have Spend better Spend your to... money here. Give it I to mean, Joe. You know, you know what? First of all, um, without blowing my own horn, I'm, I'm a destination. But I'm, people come to I, I Millions we of love people. your pizza. No, but it's not a question of love. My people come to Malibu. They choose Malibu Beach because they want a slice of my pizza. There's very few destination places like that. If I go out of business, and then, you know, when these people uh, have a slice of my pizza, and, they, and then they go to the beach, and then they get hungry, and then they go eat at the fish place, and then they go shop at the country mart, you're going to lose those people. And it's not just me. There are other destination places that people look for. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to comment on that quickly. Uh, yeah, Joe, thanks, thanks for sharing that. I have been and remain very concerned with our local businesses, especially after Woolsey. And uh, it's a very interesting idea, and I echo the thoughts of uh, showing us what you think it looks like. So thank you very much for spending the time to share that message with us. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and it's I just for the had, good of the whole town. It's not I, just my good. Believe I just me. had three Demore slices the other day. They were great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, you can't eat enough slices to bail me out. But thank you. Was it okay, by the way? That was awesome. That's the problem with pizza. It's great. Yeah. Good night, guys. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Uh, we have got two more items. 7A, the Clean Power Alliance default selection. Council Member Peak. All right. Well, I'm hoping that we we approve the selection of 100% default here. And just if anybody has any questions about um, the CPA or anything, Ted, who is the executive of the CPA for all of the different cities in the county and everyone is here this evening. And he's been so patiently waiting because I told him to come late, which I meant 830 and now it's 930. So. If you guys have any questions about CPA or anything, right now is the time to ask him. He can answer anything better than I can. Yeah, well, we just heard from the local business about how things are tough. And uh, if is this going to cost the residents more money? That's what I want to know. So um, moving the default would um, move everyone up. Um, it would cost 9% more, but every account holder in the city of Malibu would remain with two options. They can stay at 50%, which is what they're at now, which is at par with SCE. They could also opt even farther down and save money, or they could opt out and return to SCE. So um, the move of moving your default um, does not remove the options of the individual account holder to um, save money or stay exactly where they're at now. So they would have to take 
like if, if we adopted this, everyone goes up to 100%, and if I'm like, hey, wait a minute, I want to be a 50% guy, I'd have to get in touch with you, SCE you, and say, eh, I'm a 50% guy. No, you, you would call our call center or go onto our website and make that election. You also have some folks right now who have already chosen to opt from 50% to 36% and opt down, and if if you change the default to move up, those people would, who've already done a voluntary election would remain exactly where they're at now. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. I would make a motion oh, first. Oh, we do have a public speaker, Ryan Ambry. And thank you very much, sir, for sticking around. I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, uh, my wife works in the city manager's office in the city of Santa Monica, and so I am well aware of long city council meetings. So um, tonight was my turn. Uh, I'm not sure how this um, is coming back again, but the council made all of these decisions previously, and I know it's very late, and this was an odd meeting to be convening at 4 p.m. today. So I would suggest that you not... Um, entertain any action on this item 7a which would change the rates that people are charged the city does get a 5% tax on what people are charged for their electricity so it's kind of like a self-dealing deal if you want to make more revenue on the tax you would concoct a scenario under this item 7a where either new people or People would end up having their electric rates jacked up without their consent just because nobody really knew that this was on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, council members? You can opt out, as was stated. Is that correct, sir? Yes, you can opt out. Just just for the record, I and your name again, once again. Just yes. My name is Ted Bardicki. I'm executive director, CEO of, of Clean Power Alliance. So, uh, yes, the option of opting out um, or opting down remains, um, regardless of what you decide about your default level. So the individual uh, surf shop owner can choose his options next month or whenever it's that, clarified. Th that's correct. Thank you. Is that easy to figure out, like when you get your bill, is there a number on there you call or something? Yeah, it's on, it's on the bill, it's on the website, you can do it online. Um, our call center also has an automatic, uh, you know, an IVR, so you don't even have to talk to somebody if you don't want to. Okay, thanks. Can we use that in our advertising? Yeah, yeah so um, one of the things that you'll note in the staff report is there's still a number of implementation um, details that need to be worked out. You all would be the first city to take your existing default at and and opt up so um we're we're excited to to that, that you're interested in doing that um but one of the things that we're we're putting together is sort of an implementation guide to this um and uh looking at doing a similar four notices to before the switch would take place and two after which was similar to what the enrollment um, happened during the enrollment. So four pieces of mail going out to every customer in, in Malibu, two prior and two after. Um, those are, it's one of a number of, of implementation things. So you would, you would have plenty of warning. And Ted, if you could also you. just notify the council that there's many other cities and jurisdictions within CPA that have already at 100%. Yeah, so, say, um, like, who those are. Yeah, so uh, of the 31 uh, member agencies that we have in, in, uh, in Clean Power Alliance, 10 are at 100% um, default. Those are uh, unincorporated Ventura County, uh, Ojai, City of Ventura, City of Oxnard, City of Thousand Oaks, uh, South Pasadena, Culver City, uh, uh, Rolling Hills Estates and Santa Monica are our 10. You would be the 11th. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I think uh, the opt out um, feature is important to note and um, your willingness to publicize that. Um, 
And Ryan, I realize most people were here for short-term rental and this falling after it in the agenda. We don't have a full house like we did a couple of hours ago, um, but everything here was legally noticed. Okay, so um, do we have a motion or do we, Mikey, anybody other council comments? I would make a motion to approve the selection of the 100% tier option for the CPA. I will second it. City. Okay, we have a second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Peak. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Mullen. No. Councilmember Wagner. Yes. Mayor Fair. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the final item. Uh, item 7B. Uh, this is my item. Um, so this is the full and fair funding of public schools. Um, should I read it? Okay. At the request of Mayor Fair, adopt resolution number 19-46 calling for full and fair funding of California schools and urging the state legislature to fund California public schools at the national average or higher by year 2020 and at a level that is equal to or above the average of the top 10 states nationally by 2025 and to maintain at a minimum this level of funding until otherwise noticed. There is no fiscal impact associated with the rec recommended action. We have to read the rest of it. That's good. Okay, thank you. I'll make a motion to support this resolution. I'll second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Mullen. I'm sorry, we have public comments. No, we this don't. Never mind. Excuse yes. me. Councilmember yes. Mullen. Yes. Councilmember Peak. Yes. Councilmember Wagner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson. Yes. Mayor Fair. Yes. Motion carries. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn in memory of Andy Cohen. Yes. Thank you, Skyler. I think we are all in concurrence with that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mikey.